I acknowledge the Ngunnawal and Ngambri peoples who are the traditional custodians of the Canberra area and pay respect to the elders past and present of all Australia's Indigenous peoples. Almighty God, we humbly beseech thee to vouchsafe thy blessing upon this parliament, direct and prosper our deliberations to the advancement of thy glory and the true welfare of the people of Australia. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive them that trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Lord, I have received messages from Her Excellency the Governor-General notifying assent to several bills. I do not propose to read the titles which will be recorded in the votes and proceedings. The Clerk. Government Business Order of the Day number 1, Clean Energy Bill 2011, resumption of debate on the second reading. Order pursuant to the resolution agreed to by the House on the 13th of September 2011, the question is that these bills be now read a second time. The member for Reid in continuation. Thank, thank you, Mr Speaker. These bills will support jobs and competitiveness and will provide $9.3 billion in help over the first three years of carbon pricing to safeguard jobs in high-polluting industries facing international competition. And this will ensure the Australian economy remains competitive in a world that is moving to reduce carbon pollution. Mr Speaker, there will be much more support for renewable energy, including investing $10 billion in renewable energy, low pollution and energy efficient technologies, and improvements in energy efficiency will help households save money on their bills and help our efforts to cut pollution. Exhaustive federal treasury modelling, Mr Speaker finds that the Australian economy will continue to grow strongly as we create a clean energy economy of the future by pricing carbon. Australia is working towards a legally binding international framework for cutting carbon pollution and tackling climate change. And in the lead-up to the Durban Climate Change Conference at the end of the year, Australia has proposed a range of actions that countries could take in the international negotiations to help build a legally binding climate change mitigation framework. These measures, Mr Speaker, build on the strong action countries around the world are already taking to reduce emissions of greenhouse gases. I now return to a suggestion by Climate Action Network Australia. Mr Speaker, our country is a mega-diverse country, biologically speaking, but the rates of species extinction here is amongst the highest in the world. As such, Australia has a particular responsibility to make necessary reductions in greenhouse gas pollution to stabilise the Earth's climate. The network is telling us that solutions to climate change are available for us today. And for each unit of power produced, green power projects employ more people than fossil fuelled power stations do. There are more economic benefits for regional communities in the industries preventing climate change than those causing it. Mr Speaker, these solutions will not be introduced without a determination by governments and the public to make major changes to the way we produce electricity, provide transport and use the land. These bills must be supported for the future of our country and our children. The question is that these bills be agreed to. The member for Mallee. Thank you, Speaker. I'm pleased to have an opportunity to put my thoughts on the record about these bills. These, this clean energy bill and accompanying bills being rammed through Parliament by this government defies all that Australians see as fair and honest. In addition, it simply doesn't make sense. In my view, this is not necessarily a debate about climate change itself we're having here, but how to, how to tackle and manage it. It's the way we tackle the emissions that are alleged to be the culprit that's in dispute here today in this parliament. My position on climate change is quite clear, always has been, and I've been putting forward resolutions before this place from as way back as the mid-90s, indicating my concern about the impacts of climate change. It was in the mid-90s I was expressing concern about the impacts of climate change, particularly in regard to precipitation and especially in my electorate, and have been proposing ameliorative measures for years. Scientifically based precipitation enhancement research 
and piping the inefficient Wimmera Mallee domestic water supply scheme are just to mention a couple of initiatives that I've promoted. And I think it's very sad that in indicating opposition to these bills that one is immediately labelled a climate change sceptic. This is simply not the case, and I reject the proposition if it's made about the member for Mallee. There are several positions about climate change. One is that the climate of this fragile planet has always been changing, yes. and there's plenty of evidence of that. And in some instances, this climate change has been quite dramatic, even cataclysmic. The second position is that, current, is that the current phase of change is caused by human activity, and is therefore, uh, it's therefore that we can have an impact on that if we change our ways, particularly our prolific consumption of energy. I believe that a realistic position is somewhere between these two propositions. Then there is debate about the scientific community about what is causing these changes, and this is where the debate gets quite much more controversial. Every day my office is bombarded with positions from both points of view about carbon. Thankfully, I have a Master of Science degree of my own and, and understand the scientific process and therefore the capacity to, to, have, uh, to make some sense of it all. Science requires that a proposition gets put, then a line of research undertaken to test the particular hypothesis. In, and in this set of circumstances, uh, this can be undertaken by computer mathematical modelling, which, which is uh, extremely difficult when you're dealing with the vagaries of the weather. The mathematical variables are considerably immense. In my own master's degree research, I undertook modelling, mathematical modelling, using a computer and had a lot of difficulty to get the boundary conditions which control the mathematics to, to give stable mathematical solutions. So it therefore does not alarm me that the results from this modelling inspire such vigorous discussion, even amongst scientists. However, I come down on the position of listening to the benefit of the doubt. I am convinced, however, that much more effort needs to be undertaken to understand what is happening precisely and whether carbon is the great bogey uh, that is made out to be. In the meantime, I accept the need to address the changing of our ways. However, regardless of the merit or otherwise of the arguments for carbon abatement, the issue of a new tax has to be put before the electorate in a democracy like we have so rich in Australia. This is my first response, and I am committed to the concept that it was immoral for the Prime Minister to engage in prevarication during the last election with her statement, and quote, well quoted, there, is, there will be no carbon tax under a government I lead, end of quote, and then to turn around and introduce this legislation. This is of great concern to my constituents, and it's not a very good fine leadership example for future generations. So much so and so well quoted is this that, that people in my electorate now have for their mobile phone uh, ringing tone that message, there will be no carbon tax under a government I lead. And it appalls me that this kind of behaviour reflects badly on all of us in this place. That the, gov that the public have got to the point where they can't trust us to be persons of our word. Now, I remember when John Howard made his comment during the 1996 election about the coalition's intentions on introducing a GST. He used the term never, ever, and how the other side taunted him over that. It's true, though, that he did change his mind in the national interest believing that to move to a broad-based consumption tax which gave opportunity for growth income for governments was a badly needed area of reform. The difference with John Howard is the difference. He had the courage to put it to the Australian people at Thank an you. election. Yep. And I remember that campaign. I remember it. all the hard work I had to engage myself supporting such an initiative to explain it to the Australian people. A mandate was sought and the mandate was achieved. This is the exact opposite to what this government has done. These bills should be deferred till 
that kind of process is engaged that the Australian people can, can be involved. Australia has made great advances in emissions reduction and there is widespread concern that this legislation will actually slow down our progress in making our environmental footprint much smaller. The world has a good default position on emissions, particularly over the last 30 years, uh, that's seen more effective waste management, the removal of CFCs, greater efficiency in power generation, motor vehicles and white goods with compulsory energy ratings, and it, it is working and uh, great gains have been made. In my own electorate now, the prospect of the largest photovoltaic solar power station in the world, uh, and I'm continually impressed with my farmers with examples of their adaption of satellite technology and no-till practices that have reduced fuel consumption and chemical use. Some have gone further, even boosting soil carbon using their engine emissions. And there are also plans by local government to utilise pyrolysis technology in waste management in my electorate to produce biofuels and biochar. The technology works and it's short-sighted to make an assumption that all Australians are environmental vandals and need to be driven to change. What must be understood also is that Australian farmers are price takers and unable to pass on the costs associated with the carbon tax, and I note there's no compensation proposed, so I'm concerned about the position of my primary producers. This legislation with associated financial and social engineering will kill important industries and change the very way Australians live there and work. Food, power, fuel, transport will all cost more because this tax will be embedded right through our national economy. And it's, this is deliberate, a market-driven mechanism to change the way we behave, we're told. Yet most of these bills before us today deal more with compensation. In her speech to the bills, the Prime Minister said about 40 per cent of the revenue raised by carbon pricing will go to assisting emissions intensive trade exposed industries. However, she also said the bulk of the, the funds being raised will be used to fund tax cuts, pension increases and higher family payments. On one hand, the government argues it needs a market driven mechanism to, to drive us all to change deliberately to put up the, the price of electricity, in fact. Then on the other hand, most of this legislation is about compensation, which removes that very mechanism. I submit that a new tax will make it harder for the Australian economy and the Australian people to bring about change. Reducing emissions requires investment, not a tax, that is to be redistrib redistributed as a soap to the Australian populace in a bid to sell what is becoming the greatest con job in our history. Indeed, I have seen no guarantee the promised household compensation will continue beyond 2015-16 in line with the expected increase in the carbon price. And I've seen no guarantee, even from the government's own modelling, that carbon emissions uh, will reduce the, with, the, with this tax. By the government's own document, Emissions are actually going to increase from 578 million tonnes to 621 million tonnes by 2020. So why are we doing this? The government's ambition for wealth redistribution will in fact negate the merit of any market-driven emission reduction scheme that may have looked to be a good idea in the first instance. The Prime Minister also made reference to the judgment of history. History will in fact judge this carbon tax as a huge impost on our Australian economy at the very time which is not needed, and more so when we have to export our hard-earned cash to buy carbon credits from possibly some dodgy overseas seller. As an Australian, I'm embarrassed that such a Heath Robertson bit of legislation, not guaranteed to have a positive outcome, could be devised and rammed through the parliament. Even the Parliament's own committee that reviewed the legislation chose to ignore an immense amount of evidence and submissions that people faithfully wrote uh, opposed to the introduction of the tax, either its timing or the very principle of the tax itself. I believe it's been pushed through the chamber here by enthusiastic dreamers out of touch with the reality who think at the end of the day they will be judged as heroes. The contrary will be in the fact. 
And my contention is they, that this, this legislation will leave a legacy that will plunge the nation into economic lethargy for many years to come. Let's be practical in our approach to this challenging topic and not dreamers. We need to ensure the Australian economy can continue to grow whilst, challenging, whilst tackling these challenging issues. What happened to that innovative, practical and thoughtful place this parliament used to be? Somebody said, follow this government's money trial and you'll find a government that cannot run a business. Hey, hey. High taxes do not create jobs and, in fact, the roll-on effect will be that wages will take a massive hit as unemployment rises and there is less industry capacity to pay as manufacturing in particular goes offshore. I'm also yet to learn what these thousands of green jobs might entail that we hear so much about. Earlier in this debate, the opposition leader question, uh, questioned government modelling that suggested carbon tax was going to create green jobs. He, to he told of the Victorian government modelling by Deloitte Access Economics, which showed 23,000 jobs would be lost by 2015 as a result of the carbon tax. Also, New South Wales Treasury modelling by the former New South Wales Labor government indicated 31,000 jobs would be lost by 2030 due to the tax. Another study found Queensland's gross state product will drop by 2.76 per cent by 2020. Another uh, uh, statistics equally terrifying. The opposition leader also drew Parliament's attention to a United Kingdom study released in March this year that found for every, every renewable energy job 3.7 existing jobs were lost. The, the same in Spain, or similar in Spain and other European countries. So it's clearly clear that Australia will be exporting jobs as this carbon tax hits the bottom line of our manufacturing and farming communities because our commodities and manufactured goods will become uh, more expensive, imports will be cheaper. It's already tough with this high Australian dollar. We've seen that with companies like Blue Steel. We've seen the struggle the Australian primary producers uh, endure. Frozen peas coming from overseas in our supermarkets. A carbon tax on top will uh, lead to even more hardships. And I would urge the government members here with this debate today, put this legislation off, defer it, and put it to the Australian people. Have the courage, if, if you're right, the government members, if they're right, Deputy Speaker, they put it, have the confidence to put it to the Australian people and have a, a forthright discussion about it. Australians at the moment feel uh, very frustrated that their appeals are not being heard, they've been blockaded from having their say, an election and seeking a mandate, as the coalition parties did with the GST back in 1998, Put it to the Australian people and seek a mandate. If, you, if, if the government members are so convinced it's right, uh, my, my conviction is that Australians don't need to be driven and bludgeoned into activity and action on this. Uh, geothermal is gaining momentum uh, to compensate for the lack of security that wind and solar provide, and we, we understand that, and Australians demand a very secure power system. Uh, Give the Australian people the opportunity. They, they will respond. They are responding. And I say put this Order. legislation off until Order. after the election. The Honourable time has expired. The question is that these bills be read a second time. The Minister for Infrastructure and Transport. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Well, after decades of debate, the time for talking is over. The science is in. It's now time to get this critical reform in place. Other nations are already acting. They know that in a competitive, globalised 21st century world, successful economies will be those that adapt early to a carbon-constrained future. Labor is not prepared to ignore the threat, ignore the science and ignore the economists. We cannot say it is someone else's problem. We all share the one planet. We are all citizens of the world. It would simply not be fair to leave it to our children and grandchildren to deal with the consequences of our inaction. Because if we do nothing, dangerous climate change will impact on this and future generations. As Minister for Transport, I feel a particular responsibility. Here in Australia, transport accounts for around 15 per cent of total greenhouse emissions, 
a little lower than the global average of around 18 per cent. The vast bulk of this is from road transport and light vehicles, responsible for around 87 per cent of emissions. That is why the government is taking action to reduce greenhouse emissions from our vehicles. But we are doing this in a measured and in a fair way. Under the government's climate change plan, businesses which use vehicles of less than 4.5 tonnes, such as cars, utes and light commercial vehicles, will be permanently excluded from paying the carbon price when they fill up at the Bowser. This means that the carbon price will have no direct impact on the fuel bills of many small and larger businesses – the couriers, taxi drivers, tradesmen, hire car companies and minibus operators. The government is also excluding the family car and ute. Families in the regions don't have a bus or a train station down the road, like families in capital cities often do. Similarly, tradies can't replace the work yet easily, so light vehicles will be permanently excluded from the carbon price. Looking at rail and maritime sectors, the carbon price will have only a modest impact. To offset the effect of any rises, nine out of ten households will receive assistance. This means more than four million households will receive assistance via tax cuts for any increased prices they may pay. Importantly, we are increasing the income tax-free threshold from $6,200 to $18,000, taking a million Australians out of the tax system. Important economic reform. In the case of heavy vehicles, operators will have a two-year transitional period to reconfigure their fleets and renegotiate contracts with customers. From 1 July 2014, a carbon price will apply to the fuel used by trucks over 4.5 tonnes. The government has already stated that the agriculture, fish, fishery and forestry industries will be permanently excluded. Trucks powered by CNG, LNG, LPG or biofuels will also be permanently excluded. Once in place in 2014, the carbon price will have only a marginal impact on fuel bills. In fact, it will be tiny compared with the fluctuations we see regularly at the Bowser from variations in world oil prices. The Bureau of Infrastructure, Transport and Regional Economics has calculated that the extra cost of driving a B-double from Sydney to Melbourne under the carbon price at today's diesel prices will be around $35 or seven cents a litre. Let's look now at how a carbon price will affect air travel. From day one, that is July next year, an effective carbon price will apply to the fuel used by domestic airlines. To maintain the competitiveness of Australian carriers, it won't apply to the fuel they use when flying internationally, at least until there's a global carbon price. We're also allowing large liquid fuel users, such as airlines, to voluntarily opt in in 2013. This is because a carbon market already operates in the EU and our international carriers may want the ability to trade across markets. It's worth repeating, a market for the price of carbon already exists and Australian companies competing internationally want the ability to trade across markets. The carbon price will have only a small impact on domestic airfares, less than many of the extra fees air airlines already charge. For example, it's expected to add about $2 to the cost of a seat on a flight between Sydney and Melbourne and around $1 on a flight between Sydney and Armidale. Any increase would occur against a backdrop where flying today is five times more affordable than it was two decades ago, as a result of the earlier labour reforms, such as the deregulation of the domestic aviation market. Once fully implemented in 2014, the carbon price will have little impact on the cost of the daily commute. The expected rise is only one half of one per cent, significantly under the eight per cent that was added by John Howard's GST. The figures done by the New South Wales Treasury and attempted to be distorted <laughs> by the New South Wales government highlight, highlight the reality that the cost increase will be minimal. We are doing much more. We are also working to reduce the sector's footprint through smart regulations and by empowering consumers. 
Already, the government is introducing the first ever mandatory CO2 emission standards for all new cars and light commercial vehicles sold in Australia. We are working with local manufacturers to set the emission levels, and these will apply from 2015. This will be a big saving for motorists through better fuel efficiency. We are also requiring that all new cars in Australia will display fuel consumption labels, spelling out their emissions and fuel consumption in both city and highway conditions. Coupled with our Green Vehicle Guide, consumers will be able to make more informed choices about the environmental performance of the car they buy. We're investing in new technologies to better manage the flow of traffic along some of our busiest roads. By using this so-called smart motorways technology, we can substantially reduce congestion and carbon emissions while making our roads safer and smoother for motorists. And we are restoring national leadership when it comes to the growth of our major cities. After all, that is where three in four Australians live. Our recently published national urban policy, Our Cities, Our Future, supports locating new jobs and future employment precincts closer to where people live, thereby minimising the daily commute. In addition to that, we are investing and have committed more to urban public transport projects since our election in 2007 than was invested by every government combined from Federation right up to 2007. We have committed to major public transport projects in every mainland capital city in the land. In addition to that, we are investing in innovative projects such as the Gold Coast Light Rail project. Labor has long recognised the risk of climate change to future generations and to the nature's, nation's well-being. Indeed, the first official act of the Labor government was to ratify the Kyoto Protocol in 2007. Personally, this was a proud moment. I campaigned long and hard for Australia to ratify the Kyoto Protocol. When I was Shadow Minister for the Environment and Heritage, I introduced a private member's bill in an effort to get the then Prime Minister John Howard to take action. In 2006, I worked with Kim Beasley on Federal Labor's policy paper entitled Protecting Australia from the Threat of Climate Change. This was Labor's blueprint for tackling climate change. It is worth remembering some of the practical measures in that blueprint. A commitment to ratify the Kyoto Protocol, a commitment to 60 per cent cuts to Australia's year 2000 level of greenhouse emissions by 2050, ensuring Australia realise the economic benefits of sustainable industry by supporting carbon-friendly technologies and emissions trading, a commitment to sustainability by increasing and extending the renewable energy target to 20 by 2020 the development of commercial solar, wind and geothermal techn energy technologies by Australian research, including a commitment to rebuild the CSIRO, the establishment of a National Sustainability Council to monitor the performance of the entire country against agreed sustainability targets, the similarity of the Beasley blueprint and what is now contained in the bills before the House is striking. Unlike those opposite, Labor has always been committed to practical, real and fair action on climate change. The Liberal Party, after 12 years of inaction, of course did say at some stage that they would act and went to the 2007 election supporting a price on carbon through an emissions trading scheme. We, however, had acted and had committed to action well before then. On 14 February 2005, while introducing my private member's bill that would ratify the Kyoto Protocol, I stated, we must start working actively on climate change because it is an issue affecting Australia's future prosperity. Six years ago, I stood in this place and argued that we needed a planned approach to shift Australia towards a modern clean energy economy, that the potential for innovation and therefore business investment and growth would be immense. In six years, nothing has changed except the urgency of the need to act. We all know that the sooner we act, the cheaper it will be. The sooner we act, the quicker we can move to a clean energy economy. The sooner we act, the more advantage we will gain over our international competitors. Those opposite simply want to delay 
and today are moving an extraordinary position before the parliament, once again seeking to delay action on this legislation. The fact is that Australian companies and our economy will be disadvantaged if we exclude ourselves from carbon markets and the growing market in renewable energy technology. Just as science and technology have given us the tools to measure and understand environmental problems, they also help us to solve them. The potential for innovation, scientific discovery and hence business investment growth is immense. With the right policy framework, the very act of addressing our challenges can unleash new commercial forces and unimagined opportunities. New jobs, new technologies, new markets. Think of the potential economic benefits and jobs for this nation. If we don't act, our businesses and the national economy will be simply left behind. What is extraordinary is that those opposite are not just climate sceptics, they have become market sceptics in their opposition to market-based mechanisms to provide solutions to the challenges of the future. The opposition puts at risk more than just our future economic prosperity. By pretending the world is not taking action, by pretending that climate change is not real, by ignoring the science, the opposition risks the future health of Australia. The fact is that there is only one planet and we need to, to respect that planet. We must not be condemned by history as the generation that knew what the issues were yeah, but yeah. chose to do nothing about it. The time for words is over. Now is the time for action and delivery. That is what the Gillard government is doing with these bills, and I commend the bills to the House. I yeah, thank yeah. the Leader of the House. Pursuant to the resolution agreed to by the House on the 13th of September 2011, the question is that these bills be now read a second time. I now give the call to the Honourable Member for Flynn. Uh, thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. On behalf of the people of Flynn, I must stand here today and absolutely Literally reject the carbon tax legislation. Uh, we all know there is climate change. You just have to ask the dinosaurs about that. Uh, but my electorate, uh, which I've said before, is home to two aluminium refineries, one aluminium smelter, Australia's largest cement works, three coal-fired power stations, 11 coal mines, and an emerging allergy industry. Coupled with that, we have small and medium businesses that rely on this industry to survive. My electorate of Flynn is ground zero as far as the carbon tax is concerned. If you go to the people in my electorate, nine out of ten people hotly oppose a carbon tax. One out of ten are yet to make up their minds. There's only one person I know in my electorate who is in favour of a carbon tax. I uh, ran into a, Rol a miner from Ralston a couple of months ago and he told me that no one in the Ralston coal mine was in favour of a carbon tax. Now, Mr Speaker, make no mistake, the uh, policies of Gillard and the Brown government will cost Order, order. The Honourable Member for Flynn will refer to the Prime Minister by her title. Yes, sorry, Mr. Speaker. Yeah, the Prime Minister um, and uh, the leader of the uh, Greens uh, policy will cost the Queensland, uh, Central Queensland I I uh, area, thousands of jobs if this uh, carbon tax comes to fruition. Uh, for example, the aluminium uh, giant Alcoa in Victoria, I know I'm, I'm just jumping to Victoria for a moment, uh, it faces closure and job losses. And they put that down to um, high, in cost, high input cost, uh, Australian high dollar, and a carbon tax. Now, it also cost that industry $40 million. Now, the same can be said for the aluminium smelters in my town. For instance, the Russian company, Russell, who have a 20 per cent share in Queensland Alumina, 
have said all sorts of uh, nasty things about this carbon tax to the point of they will not invest another dollar in Australia until this matter is clarified and it'll have to be if it is clarified it'll have to be a lot different from what is proposed with this carbon tax. I can quote you some examples from the, um, the Courier Mail on the 23rd of the 9th and I read and I quote the world's largest aluminium company Russell has launched a scathing attack on the Gillard government on its carbon tax and emission scheme saying it puts Queensland projects at risk. In a submission to the federal government, Russell said clean energy legislation package, the carbon tax and the emission trading scheme was a threat to the viability of the Russians group major investment in Australia. And I go on. The Weekend Australian on the 24th of the 9th, 2011. American aluminium giant Alcoa warns the Victorian government etc. etc. In another article in the Australian Financial Review on the 11th of 7th 2011, Ruskell, who owns 20% of Queensland Aluma, one of the largest aluminium refineries, expressed concern over the number of free permits it was to be allocated. Ruskell Australian Chairman John Hanneran said the refinery would re receive permits for 75% of its mission for the first year. For this year, at Queensland Illumina, it will cost us around $30 million, Mr Hannigan said. So you can see the investors are very dubious about investing in Australia and particularly in the aluminium and cement industry in my area. There were six, there were six uh, black coal mines could place could uh, close prematurely and 21,000 mining related jobs could be lost as a result of a carbon tax. That is according to new data just released in the last couple of days by the industry. I need not re to remind the House that Indonesia started in its coal industry in 1980. In 2006 it overtook Australia as the biggest exporters of coal. Africa, another hot spot for uh, uh, for um, projects and you may be surprised to know that there are 600 Australian companies, based Australian companies, already in Africa investigating projects in the min mineral resource area. There's 225 projects already underway in Africa. And Mongolia, it wasn't only Ganges Khan coming out of uh, Mongolia, um, there's huge deposits of black coal high quality coal that are feeding China as, as I talk uh, today and uh, it's been uh, done by another Australian company, Leighton's, Leighton's are over there carting the coal from Mongolia to China. It's no different in central Queensland, no difference at all. These jobs are at risk. The government wants us to believe that workers will lose their jobs as a result of the business closures. We'll be able to transition to new, cleaner, greener energies like assembling windmills, solar panels and the like. Well, Mr Deputy Speaker, that defies logic. China has become the world's largest manufacturer of wind turbines, solar panels and are also the leaders in the development of carbon sequestration technology. Whilst the Prime Minister and the Senator, Bob Brown, have argued that China can do green, example, can do green examples, should be the inspiration for Australians and the rest of the world. It shouldn't be noted that China has taken over from the USA as the biggest emitter of carbon dioxide. It is an act of national economic suicide to destroy our ability to generate low-cost energy. Wind and solar energy can never provide electric power at a cost to the consumer that we as Australians can afford and be competitive with the rest of the world. Our large fleet of cars, trucks, trains, ships, dozers and aircrafts are not going to run on sunbeams and sea breezes, Mr. Mr Deputy Speaker. Just think about that for a moment. You'll need a, long, pretty, a pretty long extension cord to, to uh, pull that one off. 
and about the workers in the industries that will lose their high paid jobs. At the moment, oil and gas industries are paying workers very well indeed. Some are getting in excess of $150,000 a year. They work hard and long hours for this money, but they still get it. They also have a very good national superannuation fund, which is paid by the employers. How are they going to cop working in the government transitions to jobs erecting wind turbines and solar panels, which have been manufactured in China? How will a family used to earning $150,000 a year manage on, say, $50,000 a year? The government and, and those opposite just love to redistribute wealth and bring everyone down to the same common denominator. China has closed hundreds of inefficient coal-fired power stations over the last decade, but what they have not said is that for, in the last few years, for every powerhouse they've closed down, They've opened up two new ones to replace that whole one. Wind power now accounts for less than 1% of China's energy, while solar institutes one hundredth of 1% of the country's energy use. Why can't the people opposite me here in the House today see that China has outsmarted us again with clever propaganda and marketing? There is no evidence that carbon dioxide in the in the atmosphere controls the climate. Mr Tim Flannery has stated there will be no change to our climate inside a thousand years. It is false to claim that Australia lags the world in waging war on carbon. Kyoto Protocol is dead and Copenhagen produced nothing. Only Western Europe and New Zealand are moving on with this on the suicidal path path, but they are doing it at a much slower pace. Our current and future energy needs depend solely on coal and gas, the very thing that Senator Brown's Green extremists want to take to want to tax to death. If uh, you guys over the, the side see workers' opportunity to burst the balloon. Why do you want to bust something that's good? Why, why do you want to replace or break something that's not broken? It is ridiculous. Why do you want to hurt the people who you profess to represent, the worker? I'm here to represent the workers in central Queensland. The, on the government's own treasury modelling, there's a word you guys like to frequently use, show that inflation impact will be 10 per cent higher in regional areas. I am in a regional area and the 10 per cent uh, higher cost is quite evident when people are starting to do their modelling at this very important time. I want to go back and talk about a couple of things they've been saying in the debate. They say the introduction of the carbon tax is in the national interest. How can it that be when the thousands of workers will lose their jobs? I've already seen 1,500 workers lose their jobs in the Australian steel industry, or about to lose those 1,500 jobs. There were ones, there were ones in everyone's mind six weeks ago, but it's just fallen by the wayside now. What will happen to their jobs? Nobody talks about that anymore. Nobody cares. Oh yes, that's the right. There's going to be tr transitioning, retraining, and repositioning. To where? That's what I'd like to know. Where are these? But these these are real people we're talking about, and they were real jobs that were lost. They're not fakes, and they're not fake jobs that they're going to re re relocate it to. It is real job loss, and that is what I'm concerned. We just can't talk about compensation. Where's the compensation going to come from eventually? Um, this government has stuffed up the live cattle exports. Uh, they, they had the hide to tell the graziers to go to Centrelink. Are we going to tell everyone to go to Centrelink for compensation once they lose their jobs? I don't think so, because the taxpayers of Australia won't be able to afford the pay Centrelink to pay the people who are not working. Uh, the councils 
in my area. I have six councils in, in the electorate of Flynn, and they are all going to have higher cost in the, on the councils who pay for the lighting in the streets, the, the waste dumps, and also water charges. To pump water around the electorate from um, Shire to Shire, it does cost a lot of money. A lot of electricity is used to pump water. Mr Speaker, this will add drastically to the bottom line and, of course, the ratepayer of the shires will have to pay for these extra costs. So I wonder was that factored into the uh, $9.80 a week uh, to ex extra uh, for our residents. Um, our jobs in Queensland, in a, in a, in a thriving economy, uh, a resource uh, boom, uh, we see the employment of uh, Queenslanders are going up. We're now above the national average. I think it's about 6.3 per cent uh, is our unemployment rate and going up. Uh, yesterday, the jobs on marketed had increased also. So we have problems everywhere we look. We cannot afford to um, have our jobs disappear offshore. We have, can't allow our Australian jobs and the people they employ they are highly qualified in a lot of cases, and we cannot afford to lose them to overseas companies. Uh, those third world countries and um, other more um, bigger countries, such as China, are looking at Australia now to take our qualified people over to their countries and work their coal mines, iron ore and steelworks. Mr Speaker, I totally oppose this bill for more reasons than one. Uh, if um, it goes through, uh, we will rescind it when we get into power, if we get into power. But it's the damage it's going to do in the meantime. And uh, I just hope that the independents and the crossbenchers realise this when they come to vote on the matter. Thank you. I thank the honourable member for Flynn. The question before the chair is that these bills be now read a second time. I now call the honourable the Minister for Trade. Thank you, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker. Uh, this is an historic week uh, in which we are debating a vital economic and environmental reform, uh, the government's policy to uh, limit carbon emissions into the atmosphere. My own association with this issue goes back uh, to before 1989, and indeed in 1989 the Hawke government released a statement titled Our Country, Our Future. That statement included uh, expressions of concern and commitment to address the problem of global warming. Uh, and it was one of the very first statements uh, that was made, and certainly the first by an Australian government. And I was proud to have been associated with the preparation of that document. Then, uh, in the lead up to the 1990 federal election, I was uh, asked by the Prime Minister uh, to make recommendations uh, as to the expenditure of a modest amount of money. Uh, my recollection was that it was $30 million, but in today's terms that would be a significant amount of money, and uh, I had recommended the establishment of a national greenhouse office. So uh, my own interest and concern with this issue dates back uh, more than 20 years. I come to this debate now uh, in 2011 as both an economist and the Australian Trade Minister. Uh, the Labor Party in government has a proud tradition of not waiting uh, for other countries to implement economic reforms before we do so ourselves in our great country, Australia. I refer to uh, the policy to implement comprehensive insurance, health insurance for all Australians, originally in the form of Medibank and then subsequently in the form of Medicare, Medibank being uh, created by the Whitlam government the coalition government uh, between 1975 and 1983 then uh, uh, announcing seven different health policies in seven years, and it took a Labor government to re-embrace reform in the form 
of Medicare. I refer to national superannuation, which was opposed root and branch by the coalition in opposition. Uh, it was uh, to destroy the Australian economy, if you were to believe uh, the coalition, that business could not form, afford it. It was a bad reform. It was a bad idea and should never be implemented. And indeed, the coalition voted strongly against uh, a national superannuation guarantee. Today, we have uh, around $1.3 trillion uh, in funds under management, a great savings effort on behalf of our country as a result of those reforms. And it was, Mr Speaker, again, an example of a reform that was implemented by a Labor government without waiting to see what other countries did in respect of national savings through national superannuation. It was a Labor government uh, that uh, recognised the wonderful opportunities of the Asian century, going back to Gough Whitlam, uh, who recognised formally the People's Republic of China as one of his first acts uh, in government in 1972, and then to Bob Hawke, who foresaw in a visionary way the Asian century and set about fashioning an open competitive economy, again uh, very much uh, against the wishes of uh, many in the community, many in the business community and many in the coalition, though I do acknowledge that then opposition leader John Howard did lend bipartisan support to a substantial part of that program. But it actually took Labor to do the hard work in creating an open competitive economy through floating of the currency, something the coalition never did, through liberalising the financial services sector, which the coalition never did but was always going to do, and then through liberalising product markets and in the labour market creating uh, enterprise bargaining as the central organising principle. Now, Mr Speaker, this takes us to today's debate. And today's debate is based on an argument about science. I've been following uh, the debate uh, through the scientific community for years, and yes, there are alternative views, and I was interested in those alternative views. But those alternative views have not succeeded in overcoming the compelling argument based on science for action on climate change. And I have addressed those issues, approached those issues with open eyes and an open mind. And I have come to the conclusion that we cannot wait, that we need to act on climate change because it would be highly irresponsible not to do so and highly damaging to Australia's national interest not to do so. Mr Speaker, uh, if the scientific evidence that has been assembled has been uh, uh, summarised by the opposition leader, then it says a great deal, uh, all of it adverse, about the science. Because the opposition leader said in July of this year, very recently, see, one of the things that people haven't quite twigged to is that carbon dioxide is invisible, it's weightless <coughs> and it's odourless. Now, this wasn't just one of those off-the-cuff remarks that the uh, opposition leader says he makes from time to time and should not be regarded as gospel truth because he repeated it in the same month uh, more than a fortnight later when he said, I mean, uh, this uh, is a draconian new police force chasing an invisible, odourless, weightless, tasteless substance. Now, Mr Speaker, it beggars belief that the leader of the opposition, who says he uh, is a Rhodes Scholar and has an economics degree from Sydney University, has committed to reducing by 140 million tonnes a substance that he describes as weightless. This is the most ridiculous proposition that I think has ever been put to the Australian parliament, that the coalition, led by the opposition leader, has come to the view, after this entire scientific debate, that carbon dioxide is weightless, and yet the coalition is uh, committed to reducing the incidence of this weightless substance in the atmosphere by 140 million tonnes by 2020. Go figure. Now, Mr Speaker, the coalition's plan uh, says that this is consistent with its target of reducing carbon emissions by 5 per cent on uh, and on 2000 levels by 2020. This is a bipartisan target, that is a 5 per cent reduction on 20, 2000 levels by 2020. Yet, uh, on the day that the opposition leader affirmed 
the 5 per cent bipartisan reduction target. He also described it as crazy. He described it as crazy. And this tells you really about the true motivation of the opposition leader. He doesn't care about the future of this country. What he actually cares Order. about is his will own political interest. Um, the Honourable Member for Fadden, presumably Deputy Speaker, on point of order. with the greatest respect, the Minister can't actually infer a motive upon the Leader of the Opposition. It would uh, be against standing orders. The, uh, there is uh, no point of order, but I would um, advise the Minister to be very careful. Uh, Mr Speaker, we now uh, need to address this question then. Is Australia a first mover? Now, and on the various reforms that I have described, Australia was a first mover and has benefited greatly from doing so. Uh, the then Prime Minister of Australia, uh, John Howard, embraced, embraced the notion of Australia being a first mover in this very area, in reducing carbon emissions into the atmosphere. Indeed, he described the benefits of Australia being for a first mover. Now, coalition speakers in this debate will say that, uh, uh, that Australia, in fact, is a first mover. In fact, that is untrue. Australia is not a first mover. Around 89 countries accounting for more than 80 per cent of global emissions and more than 90 per cent of the global economy have pledged to reduce or limit their carbon pollution by 2020. And around 32 countries and a number of US states already have emissions trading schemes in place. Those countries include the country of uh, New Zealand, led by a Conservative Prime Minister, and of course the uh, country of the, uh, the United Kingdom, also led by a Conservative Prime Minister. So, so much for the desire to reduce carbon emissions into the atmosphere being some extreme left conspiracy, you would hardly describe the former Prime Minister of Australia, Mr Howard, the Prime Minister of the United Kingdom, Mr Cameron, or the Prime Minister of New Zealand, Mr Keyes, as an extreme leftist. They are conservatives uh, and they supported very much introducing a scheme to reduce carbon emissions, indeed uh, an emissions trading scheme. In, uh, China has been identified as a country uh, that purportedly is doing nothing about reducing emissions. In fact, it is introducing an emissions trading scheme in some of its larger cities, including Beijing and Shanghai, and is reported to be preparing a nationwide emissions trading scheme for 2015. It has also the world's largest installed renewable energy uh, electricity generation capacity. Mr. Speaker, um, the coalition contributors to this debate and in question time have asked questions of, of this government along the lines that uh, reports uh, uh, have claimed that for every uh, green job created, uh, three traditional jobs have been lost. And would this not be the case in terms of the um, uh, emissions trading scheme that the government is determined to implement? Well, Mr Speaker, what that actually betrays to the Australian people through the parliament is a belief that renewable energy should not be supported, that we should not be creating jobs through uh, wind energy, through solar energy, through wave energy or through geothermal energy. We should remain totally committed to coal and to uh, LNG as energy sources well into the future, and that any embrace, any embrace of renewable energy will cost three jobs for every job created. Now, there is, Mr Speaker, an important role for LNG and coal in a low emissions future. LNG is regarded as the transition fuel to a lower emissions future, to a clean energy future, and we've got loads of it, Mr Speaker. And businesses are voting with their wallets in investing in LNG in an environment where they know that a price will be put on carbon. So to coal production. We hear that the, that the destruction of the coal industry is at night. Well, Mr Speaker, why is it that one of the first commercial decisions made after the announcement of uh, uh, the emissions trading scheme was that uh, Peabody, a major coal producer in the world, I think the largest in the world, made a takeover bid for MacArthur Coal amounting to $4.5 billion. Why is it that there is a massive pipeline of coal production uh, coming through and coal investment, Mr Speaker? And that is because there is a future, there is a future for LNG and coal 
in a low emissions economy, but of course coal will need to reduce its emissions intensity. Mr Speaker, there's a debate of course about the two plans. If you believe that Mr Abbott has any interest whatsoever in reducing carbon emissions, and I doubt that seriously because he has said that the science of climate change is absolute crap, and he has declared that uh, carbon dioxide is weightless and, and odourless and tasteless and therefore completely harmless, Mr Speaker. But if just for a moment we were to believe that Mr Abbott, the, uh, sorry, the, the leader, leader, the leader, leader of, the of the opposition, opposition no. the leader of the opposition has any commitment to reducing emissions, then we need to examine uh, the government's emissions trading scheme uh, juxtaposed against the direct action plan. Here's the irony, Mr Speaker, but not a great irony in my experience, and that is that Labor is embracing a market-based solution to reducing emissions, where the coalition is in fact embracing a centrally planned solution to the coalition. This wouldn't be the first time, and I've already referred to the creation of the open competitive economy, which was a market-based approach to policy by the previous Labor government. But, Mr Speaker, the direct action plan would be a very expensive way of going about reducing emissions by 5 per cent. Um, the cost, indeed, uh, per household is set to soar if the coalition were to be elected and if Mr Abbott were to carry through on his commitment to that 5 per cent, sorry, uh, that 5 per cent reduction, then the cost per household would go from $720 to $1,300 because the opposition leader has ruled out linking any scheme in Australia to the purchase of permits uh, through low uh, cost solutions overseas. Now, in rescinding uh, the emissions trading scheme, if, if the opposition leader were to become prime minister, he would be announcing a trebling of the tax-free threshold, uh, uh, the uh, rescinding of the trebling of the tax-free threshold. He would be increasing taxes and reducing uh, pensions, Mr. Speaker. The fact is that the compensation package is more than adequate for most Australians. For most Australians, the average uh, uh, increase in the cost of living is $9.90 per week, and the compensation is $10.10 per week. This is a very important reform. It carries with it tax reform. It is based on science. It's based on a commitment to Australia's future. It's based on a commitment to our economic future. And as trade minister and economist, I am absolutely absolutely delighted to be able to recommend these bills to the House. I thank the Minister. The question is that these bills be now read a second time. I give the call to the Honourable Member for Ryan. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Mr Speaker, the Coalition opposes this Clean Energy Bill 2011 and related legislation on numerous grounds. We do not support a carbon tax because it is a bad policy for the Australian people. It is a bad policy for the economy and, more significantly, it does not help the environment. It is premised on a lie, a deception that reeks of arrogance. The Prime Minister knew that a carbon tax was deeply unpopular with the Australian population, so she quite deliberately lied her way uh, to the order, election. Order. The Hon. Member for Ryan uh, will withdraw. Uh with the Australian, so she quite deliberately deceived her way to the election. Order. The Hon. Member for uh, Ryan is aware uh, that under the standing orders uh, she's not able to make that sort of reflection Deception. on the Prime Minister. The Honourable Member for Ryan will withdraw. Withdraw that, Mr Speaker. Uh, but who can forget the adamant there will be no carbon tax under the government I lead, aided and abetted <coughs> by the equally indignant Member for Lilly? Perhaps the Prime Minister's statement could be explained away, as her coalition with the Greens is so influential over this government's policy agenda it is arguable that the Prime Minister is only the virtual leader. However, on 20 August, the day before the election, the Prime Minister categorically stated, I rule out a carbon tax. Mr Speaker, there is no room for doubt in that statement, yet here we are debating legislation to introduce a carbon tax. The government can dress it up as a price on carbon and call it a clean energy bill, but when it is a fee levied per tonne of carbon emitted, it is a carbon tax and subsequently a tax that will drive up the cost of almost everything that is made or transported in Australia. Mr Speaker, not only is it yet another tax, it is a bad tax. It is as simple as that. Taxes affect prices and prices change behaviour. But this tax is different from a consumption tax like the GST which, I remind the House, was taken to an election and won a true mandate before it was introduced by the Howard government. 
This tax is different as it is a tax on producers, which drives up their costs. As I said before, changes in price changes behaviour. But with a tax on production rather than consumption, the effects are multiplied. The producers' costs rise, so they change their behaviour by reducing their costs, by cutting services or laying off staff. No one wins. Alternatively, they could shut up shop, unable to afford these increased costs, which means no services and no jobs. Definitely no winners there. Or, of course, they can pass their increased costs onto the consumer and raise prices. Consumers react to the changing costs by changing their behaviour as well. But consumers must still buy food, must still buy power. So their cost of living increases dramatically much more than any so-called compensation package will cover. The government's own modelling shows that under this tax there will be an immediate 10 per cent increase in electricity prices and a 9 per cent rise in gas bills. Food costs will increase due to the electricity price rise and the increased transportation cost. Be in no doubt, basic necessities for life will cost more. So if families cannot say through not buying necessities, they will buy less less entertainment, less clothing and spend less in the already struggling retail sector. The Prime Minister says that this carbon tax, with all of the so-called tax reform compensation package, will cost Australians just a couple of dollars a week, if anything. But, Mr Speaker, that is on top of the just a couple of dollars a week caused by the previous 18 new taxes introduced since 2007. And just a couple of dollars a week, just one cup of coffee just one magazine by every customer is a big cost to small business. Across the road from my office is a coffee shop. Talk to them about the effects of 200 or more customers buying just one less cup of coffee a week. Ask a news agency next door how his customers buying one less magazine a week affects their margin. The Prime Minister only has to open any newspaper to see how hard the retail sector is being hit at the moment. The IMF has downgraded Australia's economic forecast to below budget and Treasury predictions. Yet despite the glaring evidence, the Labor Greens coalition has decided that now is the time to bring in another tax, yet another cost rise for consumers, which means yet another blow for retailers. Mr Speaker, back in 2008, the then Prime Minister Rudd used the justification that a slowdown in consumer spending would slash jobs to hand out $900 cheques to anyone and everyone, dead or alive. Yet while the retail sector is already slowing, it is already struggling, this Labor government now wants to introduce yet another deterrent to spending in the form of a tax that will affect the bottom line of all Australians and make them adjust their spending accordingly. Mr Speaker, it is a bad tax being introduced by a bad government. There will be less money to save for investment making it even more difficult to save to buy your first house. Mr Speaker, the multiplier effects of a tax on production give no certainty except that costs will increase and that uncertainty is crippling the business industry already. Everyone, be they small business or big business, is feeling the pinch. Mr Speaker, so far I have only discussed the immediate domestic issues and impacts. Further, the genuine fears of the market as to the uncertainties of the European and US economies impact on Australia as well. This carbon tax also relies heavily on the establishment of an effective international market. There is no evidence of such a system in working order at present, yet this government believes that it is indeed time to introduce this scheme. Mr Speaker, the World Bank has reported that the international market for carbon credits has collapsed and further has expressed doubt about the ongoing viability of a global market. In 2005, after the Kyoto Protocol was adopted, this market generated about $25 billion in the lead-up to 2009. However, last year that market collapsed to just $1.5 billion. And keeping in mind that the Kyoto Protocol expires next year, there is little reason to believe that we will see a regeneration of this market in the near future. Significantly, the US withdrew from the Kyoto Protocol back in 2001 and has indicated that it will not commit to a replacement treaty. Russia, Canada and Japan have also all recently stated that they will not recommit to the protocol after its expiration. This is a clear indication that much doubt surrounds whether other countries will adopt emissions trading, and if so, it is further unclear as to what sectors will be included. 
Australia is the only nation introducing an economy-wide carbon tax. We need to be very cautious about legislating a default forward emissions cap for the electricity sector in particular and creating new property rights. Without certainty of what will happen internationally in the future, the government should be more careful about what arrangements it is putting in place that will be difficult to unravel should Australia have to align itself with an international scheme. Mr Speaker, the absence of a global market for carbon credits is enough to cast doubt on the viability of the government's scheme before any further research into the risks such as a market runs. Carbon credit fraud has been described as the white-collar crime of the future by Deloitte Access Economics, and the Wall Street Journal, after the systemic corruption of the European Union emissions trading scheme was exposed, defined the situation as, quote, not a functioning scheme at all, but a political smokescreen to enable European politicians to claim green credentials while avoiding difficult decisions on reducing emissions. Mr Speaker, I think there is little doubt that this is what is happening in Australia today. If the government was truly trying to save our environment, they would be more concerned about how much this carbon tax will actually reduce emissions. The fact is, Mr Speaker, that it won't reduce them at all. To reduce emissions by 5 per cent of the year 2000 figures, we should be reducing emissions to 530 million tonnes. However, according to the government's own document, we are actually increasing from a current emission of 578 million tonnes to 621 million tonnes by 2020. So this carbon tax is literally all economic pain for no environmental gain. And make no mistake, it will bring significant economic pain. The Bly government recently commissioned a report from Deloitte Access Economics regarding the carbon tax impact on my home state of Queensland. Keep in mind that this is a report commissioned by a state Labor government, a Labor state premier, who is also the Labor Party's immediate past national president. Mr Speaker, in addition to what I have discussed above, this report found that Queensland's gross state product would be 2.76 per cent lower by 2020 and 4.11 per cent lower by 2050 with a carbon tax compared to without one. Mr Speaker, this is substantial and significant. It is a 5 per cent reduction in Queensland's gross state product under a carbon tax and will result in predicted 21,000 jobs lost in Queensland alone. On top of this, the Queensland Treasury has estimated a loss in economic value of the state's generation companies of $640 million, which undoubtedly will be passed on to consumers. This $640 million in Queensland pales in comparison to the $40 billion cost the National Generators Forum estimates the generation sector will incur across the country. However, as in Queensland, it is likely that nearly all of this cost will be passed on to consumers. Part of this high cost is due to the starting price of $23 per tonne being far higher than carbon prices elsewhere in the world and has put Australia considerably ahead of other countries. Now, the Prime Minister may think that this will cause other world leaders to make a change. However, most world leaders will take into account the standard of living of their residents and the strength of their economy, not what Australia legislates. Without a carbon tax, the Productivity Commission puts Australia in, quote, the middle of the pack with regard to tackling climate change. So by waiting for international action for the sake of our economy and particularly our manufacturers, we are by no means dragging our feet. It is a matter of plain common sense. Furthermore, the system requires generators to buy carbon permits well in advance, sometimes for electricity that will be covered by future contracts years in advance. Mr Speaker, this does nothing but further increase the cost of electricity in this country, a cost that will simply be passed on to consumers, further driving up prices. The Prime Minister may believe she is leading the world with this carbon tax, but real leadership on this issue can and should start at home. The Brisbane City Council is a prime example of government leading by example and taking real action. I was proud to be a member of Campbell Newman's Cabinet, which delivered record spending on green outcomes, in one term alone planting 2.2 million trees, purchasing 500 new clean buses, offsetting the whole of the Council's fleet, starting the City Glider bus service, purchasing new city cats and spending more than $100 million on new bikeways. Brisbane City Council is the largest purchaser of green power in Australia and half of its energy supply is from renewable sources. This Labor federal government, in contrast, uses just 5.8 per cent greenhouse-friendly electricity in its buildings, 
according to its own energy use report. Furthermore, non-defence Australian government energy consumption over 2008-2009 was 6,237,496 gigajoules, which equates to 1,178,440 1 tonnes of carbon emissions, which is in fact a 1.91 per cent increase from 2007-08 and a 9.94 per cent long-term increase from the period beginning 1999-2000. Mr Speaker, perhaps the government should be looking to its own backyard and bureaucracy before demonising the 500 big polluters and trying to ignore the effects its tax has as those companies pass on the tax to consumers. Mr Speaker, this is a bad tax, plain and simple. It is not going to solve any of the environmental challenges confronting us. It is a tax on producers who will have to absorb increased costs, so it will result in decreased services lost jobs and high prices. There is just no way around that. The government knows this. There would be no need to provide compensation if it had not inflicted irreparable damage in the first place. Mr Speaker, the Australian people do not want this tax. The Prime Minister has no mandate to introduce this tax, and without taking it to an election, the Prime Minister and her Labor Greens government is treating the Australian people with arrogant contempt. I thank the honourable member for Ryan. The question before the chair is that these bills be now read a second time. The call is now given to the honourable minister for school education, early childhood and youth. I thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I welcome the opportunity to speak on these clean energy bills and related bills in the House. I've long cared deeply about our planet and our country. In all the environment campaigns that I've been involved in or a part of, whether it was supporting the protection of our tropical and temperate rainforests, whether it was looking for better ways of protecting and conserving our coastal environments, uh, whether it was making sure that the spoiled waterways of our country were rehabilitated so that they could be productive, uh, whether it was looking carefully and clearly at how we might best protect those areas of Australia which have got high levels of biodiversity, in all of these campaigns uh, that I've been involved in, there's none uh, that is so important, nor is there any environment issue that is as important as tackling dangerous climate change. I came into this parliament committed to representing the people of Kingsford Smith and to campaigning and being part of a government that will take decisions on the issues that count. And taking action on dangerous climate change is the most important issue that we can take action on both now and for the future. And Mr Deputy Speaker, I devoted uh, a portion of my first speech in this House to this issue and made the observation that the bills for failing to deal with dangerous climate change will fall on this generation and increasingly on future generations unless we are resolute in taking action on climate change. I worked in opposition as the Shadow Minister for Climate Change, Environment and Heritage, and now in the government with my Labor colleagues to get Australia on the path to a low emissions, clean energy future, the only kind of future that this country can conceivably have. It is a long, it is a sometimes difficult, but it is a necessary path. And Mr Speaker, noting the fact that scientific awareness of climate change and its impacts have existed for some time and that it now become the province of even military security analysts who identify dangerous climate change as a future risk to nations and that there were now few who weren't aware of the scale or the nature of these risks uh, that we understand on this side of the House and in this political party that the right response, the right ethical response and the right political response is to act now. And I'm proud that we are able to see this legislation introduced into the House by the Prime Minister. And I commend uh, the minister responsible uh, and those contributions that have been made by my colleagues on this side of the House. The fact is that the Gillard Labor government is delivering a comprehensive clean energy suite of bills which gets us going, provides both hope and substance that action on dangerous climate change is possible and is doing it in a way that is sensible 
and sets this country up for the future. We've made a start. That's the most important thing, Mr Deputy Speaker, a positive and a good start, and nothing should hold this country back now. Nothing, that is, except for the willful and deliberate obstruction by the Leader of the Opposition and by the Opposition in general. And I'll return to that uh, in a moment. Uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, the fact is that in Australia we are literally at a crucial turning point in our history. As one commentator recently observed, and I quote, these bills represent a great triumph of the parliament, an attempt to deal with the greatest crisis facing our world today. And it's important to recognise the times that we are in. On September 12 of this year, we saw newspaper reports confirming that the Arctic was melting at near record levels. Ice coverage, it was reported, was at a, and I quote, new historic minimum. A week or two earlier, we had reports on the likely long-term and potentially irreversible damage to coral reefs, which are particularly vulnerable to changes in sea temperature, uh, in water quality, uh, particularly vulnerable to climate change. But the fact was, Mr Deputy Speaker, this was an entire ecosystem, not a species or a number of species, but an entire ecosystem now vulnerable to human impacts including the impacts from dangerous climate change. It's very important for us to realise that it was only a day later that we read of the newspaper reports about the Arctic melting at near record levels that the Prime Minister introduced this legislation into the parliament. It's important to restate that the policy of this government is based on the best available scientific knowledge, knowledge that is shared by the great majority of climate scientists by our own CSIRO, by a number of our eminent scientists, including Nobel laureates and others. It's knowledge of a rapidly warming world, atmospheric levels of CO2 rising from 280 parts per million in the industrial era to almost 388 parts per million now, the highest levels that we've seen for eras of time. And that is why Sir David Lang, the first chief scientific adviser to the British Prime Minister, uh, the ch chief scientific adviser, I beg your pardon, to the British Prime Minister, and a dozen other eminent scientists have all written to Prime Minister Gillard, congratulating her for the government's actions. And it's why our own chief scientist uh, has similarly spoken of the need to recognise that the science, the science behind the need to take action on tackling climate change is legitimate science. And Mr Deputy Speaker, people in the future will look back and be absolutely aghast and incredulous that the statements of our scientists, the majority consensus statements of our climate scientists, have been ignored or belittled by both those in the opposition and by the opposition leader himself. Um, it is one of the, the, the great tragedies of our time that this debate has been so distorted, so perverted and so polluted by those opposite. Uh, and the fact is, I think, Mr Speaker, that the coalition's policy on climate change uh, and the debate that it's engendered literally represents a new low point in Australian political debate. It's been reckless, it's been toxic and it's been cynical. And the Leader of the Opposition and his Shadow Minister, the member for Flinders, uh, bear considerable weight of responsibility for the potential path that they now have this country on. Uh, the member for Flinders, I noticed, said on September 20, I've designed the system I want, and went on to say and guarantee it will reduce emissions as planned by 2020. Well, I have to say this to the member for Flinders, he's living in a fool's world a fool's world where the sort of short-term Pyrrhic victories uh, in manipulating the public debate that he may notch up count for nothing, count for nothing against the significant public policy failure of the position that he's put to this parliament. The fact is that the opposition's policy will not result in the cuts that have been targeted by the opposition, and a number uh, of analysts have shown that quite clearly. It is simply $10.5 billion worth of grants over 10 years if enacted and will go nowhere near to dealing with the reduction in greenhouse gas emissions 
that we actually need. Mr Deputy Speaker, there are two important economic principles that underpin the government's approach on this issue. The first is that a price on carbon <coughs> represents the least cost and most economically efficient way of reducing emissions. And the second, of course, is that we still, fortunately in this country, are facing the prospects of an economy that will continue to grow. So the situation that we face is a very simple one. Thomas Friedman, uh, a well-known uh, writer and columnist, put it very, very clearly. There's only one effective, sustainable way to produce green jobs, and that is a focused, durable, long-term price signal that raises the price of dirty fuels and then creates a sustained consumer demand for a sustained private sector investment in renewables. And that's exactly what this government wants to do. This is the logic of applying a carbon price to the largest polluting countries. This is the logic of making sure that the Australian public, particularly those likely to be affected by any price impacts, are compensated. This is the logic of getting the architecture of a price on carbon pollution in place and then beginning to drive the significant reforms in a clean energy economy that will ensure employment, ensure the new threshold of research, ensure the new energies of the future can start here in Australia when they need to. To do anything else, Mr Speaker, is both economically and environmentally reckless, and yet that's the position of the opposition. Mr Speaker, uh, there are two features or three features uh, of this legislation I want to remark on briefly. Uh, the first is the significant level of investment into clean energy itself an investment of some $10 billion. This will be important investment to the many businesses, the many entrepreneurs, the many innovators in Australia who recognise with absolute crystal clarity uh, that that's, this is the way of the future. Uh, additionally, uh, the $1 billion that's been uh, applied importantly to uh, biodiversity investment. There's absolutely no question that we remain utterly dependent on the provision of healthy, natural resources, the environment, to sustain our way of life. That is what underpins the way of life that we experience in this country. Uh, and that investment as well is particularly important. And finally, Mr Speaker, more transparency uh, with the Independent Climate Change Authority, uh, who will provide the opportunity for the independent uh, observation, maintenance and advice uh, around these climate change actions. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Deputy Speaker, I must um, conclude my remarks by saying that uh, I have never witnessed uh, in the period of time that I've taken an active interest in politics, and certainly in the period of time since I've been in the parliament, more irrational and reckless statements on an issue of such consequence as I have from both the Leader of the Opposition and members of the Opposition when it comes to debating this issue of climate change. Uh, we've had the member for Tangy saying, I do not accept the premise of anthropogenic climate change. I do not accept we are causing significant global warming, and I reject the findings of the IPCC and its local scientific affiliates. We've had enormous succour given uh, to those who've taken not only a sceptical view, but a downright intellectually dishonest view of the science behind climate change. Uh, we've had um, people like uh, my shadow here in, in the House, uh, the shadow opposition uh, member, the leader of opposition business in the House, saying, I support the direct action plan of the coalition to address climate change. It's a no regrets policy. What that means is that even if you do not believe that climate change is happening, even if you do not believe the government should take action on climate change because it is a hologram, these are still good policies. Well, Mr Deputy Speaker, uh, these particular statements by these two members and statements by uh, the Leader of the Opposition as well, uh, that he's far from convinced that humans are causing imminent climate catastrophe, uh, that there's no link between uh, emissions and, and temperatures, uh, that he believes that the world's warming, warming might, might actually have stopped, that he can't see the dangers for our children. Uh, if there's a four-degree temperature rise or a one-metre sea level rise. These are reckless, scientifically inaccurate, destructive statements by the Leader of the Opposition 
and by other members of the opposition who are intent on only one thing, and that is confusing and perverting the public debate when, in actual fact, the need, the necessity and the responsibility to act has never been greater. Mr Deputy Speaker, uh, ultimately, though, uh, the actions of the Leader of the Opposition represent something else as well, and that is a loss of faith in the vision and the capacity of Australian people. That's Mr Abbott's greatest deficiency uh, in this debate. That Lord is Lord that Opposition he has no faith in the Australian people to actually take up the challenge to recognise that not only our future now, but the future of our kids is literally dependent on our capacity to act, and that the new jobs, the new research, the fields of endeavour, all of those things that we as a nation have the capacity to do and that our past history tells us that we can do, all of those things, all of those possibilities, all of that promise is reduced to nothing in, in the Leader of the Opposition's cynical and destructive campaign. The fact is, Mr Deputy Speaker, I believe that there is cause for optimism in the face of the significant challenges that climate change presents. I think that we can be the best of people by facing up to those challenges and by mounting the historic effort that will be necessary to make sure that we do see temperatures stabilise, that we do see our environment protected in the future. That is a commitment that this government has. I commend those bills to the House as I commend the efforts and activities of all Australians, particularly young Australians, who care so much about this issue and who recognise how important it is to act. The honourable minister's time has expired. The question is that these bills be now read a second time. I now call the honourable member for Dawson. Well, thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. I rise in this place today, this a monument to democracy, to eulogise the freedom, the voice, and the self-determination that the Australian people once had. The introduction of this carbon tax, the biggest, widest, ugliest and most pointless tax on carbon dioxide emissions in the world, marks the end of democracy in this country as we know it. Because make no mistake, democracy died on August 21, 2010. And while we see countries in the Middle East overthrowing dictatorships and establishing their own democracies, here in Australia we have a government overthrowing democracy to install a policy dictatorship, a carbon tax that the people do not want, that nobody voted for, that the Prime Minister herself said she would not implement, and now we're told they're going to implement it in a way that they reckon can never be undone. Well, too bad that they're incompetent and it can be undone, but it's still policy dictatorship. With apologies to Don McLean, Mr Deputy Speaker, the day this deal was done with the Greens, was another day democracy died. Democracy died for one reason alone. So that the Prime Minister, who knifed her then leader, the member for Griffith, in the back to gain the throne, can hold on to power for just that little bit longer. And then once again, in February, it would give Don McLean cause to shiver. The bad news was on the doorstep, where the menagerie of Greens independents and whatnot hijacked the Prime Minister's courtyard. It was the very same carbon tax that they announced that the Prime Minister said would never happen under a government. She ruled it out. There will be no carbon tax under the government I lead, she assured this country, just six days before the last federal election. And they, the Labor members opposite, who are all elected on that same promise, have the gumption to belittle, ridicule and abuse the Australian people for feeling betrayed. But this is not just a bad policy dreamt up by a bad government mid-term. It is a policy specifically that was taken off the table. It was ruled out in a desperate bid to steal a narrow election victory. But it couldn't quite steal that victory, Mr Deputy Speaker. To again use the words of Don McLean, the courtroom was adjourned and no verdict was returned. The whole country was about to be singing bye-bye democracy. In trying to justify the grubby deal done with the Greens to hold on to power, the Prime Minister tells us that circumstances changed and she would have us believe her hand was forced on this carbon tax. Well, no, Prime Minister, no one was forced to do the exact opposite of what they promised to do, and it's very simple. She could have just said no. She could have just said no 
I will not betray the Australian people. She could have said, no, I will not undermine the democratic process. She could have said, no, I will not introduce the worst tax that this country has ever seen. She could have said, no, that people voted for me because I promised I wouldn't. I wouldn't introduce this tax and I owe it to them to keep my word. The Prime Minister had the choice to keep her unequivocal promise, but she chose to throw that out the window so that she wouldn't go down in history as the Prime Minister who knifed her leader for the sake of two months in the job. The Prime Minister was right back in February when she insisted that a plan should not be called the carbon tax. She's absolutely right. It should be called a prime ministerial tax because that's what it really is. It's not a price on carbon. It's a price the Australian people will be paying for the Prime Minister to keep her job. Every single person in this country will be paying a prime ministerial tax. Every single person. And this unholy Labor Greens alliance can distort the facts and cherry pick the data all they like. No other country in the world, no other country, will have an all pervasive economy sapping carbon tax or prime ministerial tax. And it's going to be more pervasive than we've been led to believe. All the talk we've heard about a 5 per cent reduction target is actually nowhere to be seen in these bills. In these bills, the, only qualified, uh, the unqualified target, I should say, is 80 per cent by 2050, unqualified. It doesn't matter what the rest of the world is doing. 80 per cent is the target. We're being asked to commit to an 80 per cent reduction, and that means when the carbon tax becomes an emissions trading scheme, permits will be scarcer and the price will be much higher much sooner. And as we start the rapid ascent up the price ladder, this carbon tax, this prime ministerial tax, will also increase the cost of freight, and right now, will, next year, it's going to increase the cost of electricity. And given that freight and or electricity is an input cost on every single good and every single service that you can buy in this country, that means we'll be paying the carbon tax every time we pull out the wallet, every time we write a check, every time we swipe a card. In regional Australia, we're going to be paying even more because freight increases with distance from capital cities. And the member for New England can say, as he has in this chamber, that these bills have nothing to do with fuel and heavy vehicles. But the entire carbon tax package does. We know that diesel will go up in two years' time under this government. He knows that diesel will go up in two years' time under this government. And he can do something about it by voting against these bills. We've also had the member for New England in here, along with members of the Labor Party, wringing their hands and saying, the sky is falling, the seas are going to rise, the Arctic's going to melt, we're all going to drown. Well, I ask these members but one question. If the sea is going to rise like they suggest, how is this carbon tax going to stop it? How is this tax on carbon dioxide emissions going to hold back the tide? How is it going to help the reef? How is it going to stop the Arctic from melting? This tax has absolutely nothing to do with the environment. The reality is it is all about wealth redistribution. But in the process of taxing higher incomes and compensating lower incomes, supposedly, the collateral damage, I'm sad to say, will be felt most of all in my electorate of Dawson. The Deloitte modelling undertaken by the Queensland government showed that of all the states, Queensland would be the hardest hit, and of all the regions in Queensland, the Mackay region would be the hardest hit. So you can't imagine the good people of the Mackay region, ranging from Bowen through the Whitsundays to Mackay and out in the hinterland coal towns, you can't imagine them jumping up and down with glee at the prospect of this carbon tax, and they're not. I recently issued an electorate-wide survey that we've had so far as of today. 4,423 votes returned. Uh, the results are still flowing in at a rate of 900 to 1,000 a day, and uh, so that should be up to 6,000 by the end of the week. But right now, in my survey of my electorate, out of 4,423 votes returned, we've had a whopping total of 242 people for the carbon tax, 4,181 against. 
a 94.53 per cent rate saying no, no to this government's carbon tax. And they say no because they already pay the astronomical amounts for rates and rent. They pay, already pay exorbitant amounts for everyday items and everyday services. They pay between 20 and 50 per cent more just for a cup of coffee than those opposite pay in this place, whether or not they have well-paid mining jobs. And most of them, a large majority of them, don't have those well-paid mining jobs. They are ordinary people doing ordinary jobs with extraordinary high bills and extraordinary high living costs. And this government wants to rob them just that little bit more with this carbon tax. Well, the electorate of Dawson has three economic pillars. They are mining, sugar and small crops and tourism. These are all export industries. They are all going to pay a carbon tax under this regime, competing on the world market against industries in other nations who won't be burdened with such grossly unfair impediments to their competitiveness. Most of the secondary industries across the electorate, such as engineering and small business, are directly or indirectly dependent on these three economic pillars. 87 per cent of our region's sugar crop is sold on the world market in competition with countries that aren't subject to this bad tax. Mackay Cane Growers Chairman Paul Skembry commented that the tax would be like and I quote, an extra lead weight in the saddlebags of the sugar industry. When confronted with this, the Treasurer responded by saying how rosy things are in North Queensland because of the mining industry. Well, I've got news for the Treasurer. Things for the sugar industry are not going to be rosy at all. That's because sugar farmers are price takers. They do not get to pass on the added costs of the carbon tax. According to cane growers, the sugar industry is staring down the barrel of an $81 million slug to the industry under this carbon tax. That, re that represents a reduction in net farm income of 3.4 per cent per annum. For many farmers, that's going to be the difference between food on the table and losing the farm. And I note that times are particularly tough in the sugar industry for uh, the same reasons, a uh, high Australian dollar and a series of natural disasters. And I also note that in the tourism industry in North Queensland, we're in a desperate state with the high Aussie dollar and natural disasters. The Whit Sundays, a world-class tourist destination that I'm very proud to have in my electorate, is dependent on international tourism, especially with places like Hayman, Hamilton Island and the Club Med Lindemann Island. Tourism businesses in the Whit Sundays are already on the edge and they're rightly concerned. The tur Tourism and Transport Forum report predicted a carbon tax would reduce inbound international visitor revenues by around $457 million, while driving $266 million of domestic tourism offshore. So if we're being told that everything in North Queensland is going to be rosy because of the mining industry, well, let's have a look at mining. The Minerals Council of Australia estimates the minerals industry will face costs of $25 billion between 2012 and 2020 under this carbon tax package. They also note the decision to include the emissions from coal mines is unique, with these emissions exempted under the EU's emissions trading scheme. Nowhere on the planet nowhere, is there an electorate-wide carbon tax of such magnitude as what this government is determined to slug Australians with. The Labor government's determination to lead the world falls pretty flat in North Queensland. As one of my constituents recently said to me, we don't want a government that leads the world, we just want a government that can lead the country. The Australian Coal Association recently commissioned economic consultants to examine the impact of the tax and they found that conservative estimates of employment foregone in 2020-21 from applying emissions pricing to current coal mines would be around 4,700 in coal mines and around 14,100 throughout the entire economy. So it's not looking so rosy now, is it? But what really irritates North Queensland is, is the contempt with which their concerns were dismissed. When the Chairman of Tourism, Chairman of Tourism at Sunday asked the Minister for Regional Australia, when he came to Mackay on his little tour, what the government was going to do about the tourism industry being slugged with higher costs, the Minister said, well, tourism's in the doldrums anyway. Tourism's in the doldrums anyway. The fact that a minister used the Regional Development Australia body to set up a political forum in Mackay and all throughout regional Australia to promote this tax was not enough. He, had the he used the opportunity 
tell locals how great his tax was going to be, and then he went and, re went and wrote in the Australian and told this place how the regions love this tax. Well, wrong, wrong, wrong. If he cared to really know what locals think of the tax, well, it's simple, Simon. He should have just asked the pieman, because he can tell you it's not fair. The Senate Select Committee on the Scrutiny of New Taxes did just that. They asked the pieman during a hearing in Mackay. They interviewed Peter Grant, owner of Bushman's Bread, chairman of the Regional Policy Council for the Chamber of Commerce and Industry, and he also makes one of the best pies that you'll taste in Mackay. The pieman could have told simple Simon that the carbon tax would hurt business. He reported that an extra five cents for a loaf of bread under the carbon tax would have to be absorbed by his business, as he could increase his price, as he couldn't increase his prices when competing with Coles and Woolworths. He reported that many of his members were fabricators, and they were concerned that some of their work would go offshore and components just brought in. Our people will become assemblers rather than fabricators, he said. So, in summary, the government's modelling is based on an Australian-wide economy, but the engine rooms of the economy. The regions are the ones that will be slugged the most under this proposal. The carbon tax will slug every facet of industry in the electorate of Dawson, and it won't stop there. It will slug every facet of the community and our way of life. I've got the Air Anzac Memorial Club that's got an electricity bill from a Energy Action or a, or, a, or a prediction of what they'll be. Electricity costs up $16,000 a year, directly attributable to the carbon tax. I've got a concerned general manager of that club saying that that's going to cause tremendous problems. Uh, you know, we've got 600,000 not-for-profit organisations across this country in similar positions. The tax won't work for them. The tax won't work for families. The tax won't work for the regions. It won't work for business. It won't work for the environment. And this government should stand up and pay heed to what the Prime Minister said. There will be no carbon tax under the government she leads. Vote it down. Order. The question is that these bills be now read a second time. I call the Parliamentary Secretary for Trade. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. And I'm very pleased to be speaking on the Clean Energy and Related Bills 2011. And of course, uh, these bills will give effect to, to our plan, to our plan to move our economy to a clean energy future. And of course, what they're designed to do, they're designed to ensure Australia's economic and also Australia's environmental future. Now, Mr Deputy Speaker, the issue of climate change is one of major concern in my electorate, and that's not just from the perspective of the need to act for the nation and the world's future, but also from the very local perspective of protecting our very unique, our very special coastal areas and our very unique and special pristine landscapes that we have on the north coast. But uh, without a doubt, many people in my electorate are very concerned about taking action on climate change. It's been an issue that they have uh, consistently raised with me over the years. And of course, Mr Deputy Speaker, the need to act is urgent. It is very urgent because the fact is uh, the rest of the world is acting. So particularly in light of that fact that the rest of the world is acting, that's why it's uh, absolutely urgent that Australia acts. And Mr Deputy Speaker, the advice from the world scientific community is very straightforward. It is very, very straightforward. Global temperatures are rising and the cause is carbon pollution. In Australia and around the globe, uh, 2001 to 2010 was the warmest decade on record. And in Australia, each decade since the 1940s has been warmer than the last. And uh, what is now beyond any reasonable doubt is that human activities are the causes for the changes that we are witnessing in the global climate. And what we have to accept, what we must all accept, is that Australia will be greatly affected by any change in rising temperatures, and we will be affected both environmentally and economically. And increased carbon pollution in the atmosphere is putting the world's environment at a very serious risk. It's been estimated that average global temperatures may increase by up to 6.4 degrees Celsius above 1990 temperatures by 2100. And it's been estimated that sea levels may rise by between 0.5 and 1 metre by 2100 above 2000 levels. And also the acidity of the world's oceans may increase significantly. And if I look at a, uh, a very local incident, we had some very severe and uh, uh, very harsh coastal erosion at a, a seaside town called Kingscliff in my electorate of Richmond. Uh, the erosion was very severe and many locals 
put forward their concerns about the fact we need to act on climate change. When we see issues like this impacting our community, impacting our villages, it highlighted for everyone, I think, the real and very uh, immediate danger that um, climate change does pose. And we can only imagine how much worse problems like this could become if we do nothing, if we do not act. We can, it is quite frightening to think uh, the extent of it. And of course, the effects of increased temperatures are likely to change the frequency and severity of cyclones, storms, floods and other extreme weather events. We can also expect that rainfall patterns around the world will change, making some places drier and indeed other places wetter. Studies indicate that warming of more than two degrees Celsius will overwhelm the capacity of many of our natural ecosystems to adapt. And with that level of warming, for instance, the survival of the Great Barrier Reef would be in jeopardy as higher ocean temperatures and acidity levels cause major changes to coral reefs. And we look at delicate ecosystems, for example, some on the north coast, like those around Mount Warning and the Nightcap National Park, and right across the Green Cauldron, remembering this is one of Australia's national landscapes. They will be placed under even further stress should average temperatures rise as predicted. And rising temperatures will not just damage our environment, it will have a massive negative effect on our economic prosperity as well. And the longer we are delayed by the, by the climate change deniers in tackling the problem, the more it will cost us and the uh, worse the impacts will be upon our economy. These include the economic costs that come from floods, droughts, heat waves and other extreme weather events. And climate change will lead to sea level rises that can damage coastal property and infrastructure. We know that our nation is predominantly a coastal society. About 85 per cent of the population lives near the coast. It's been estimated that coastal assets valued at more than $226 billion are at risk of damage from inundation and erosion by 2100. If we look at a mile electric around the north coast and also just over the border into southeast Queensland, uh, how vital these coastals are. And of course, one of our main industries is tourism, and we need to act uh, to protect those areas because this really is uh, the backbone of both the north coast and southeast Queensland, and the, the beautiful landscapes and beaches that we have there, we do need to act to preserve them and ensure the future of tourism in those areas. Mr Deputy Speaker, we uh, also must look at one of Australia's most important economic sectors, agriculture. And it's been estimated the effects of climate change on agricultural production in the Murray-Darling Basin could decline by up to 92 per cent by 2100 as a result of longer and more frequent droughts from unmitigated climate change. And with the Murray-Darling Basin accounting for a large share of Australia's farm production, this could undermine our capacity to grow and produce our own food. Now, I'm very pleased to be speaking on uh, these bills because the Gillard government's Clean Energy Future Plan will cut 160 million tonnes of pollution from our atmosphere by the year 2020. This is the equivalent of removing 45 million cars from our roads. The Clean Energy Future Plan will introduce a carbon price into Australia's economy. It will put a price tag on every tonne of carbon pollution released into the atmosphere by the country's biggest polluters. The carbon pricing mechanism will apply directly to around 500 of the biggest polluters in Australia. And indeed, a price on carbon is the most effective, efficient and economic way to tackle climate change. And every dollar raised will go to support jobs, households and to invest in clean energy and climate change programs. Of course, to help meet the cost passed uh, through by some businesses, the Gillard government will ensure that Australian households will be compensated with tax cuts, higher family payments and increases in pensions and benefits. If I look at my electorate of Richmond, more than 51,000 people will receive household assistance through increases in their income support and family assistance payments, and even more will then benefit from tax cuts. In fact, nine out of ten households will receive assistance through tax cuts, extra payments or both. On average, households will see uh, costs increases, I say on average, of $9.90 a week, while the average assistance will be $10.10 a week. Overall, estimates are that prices will rise by less than 1 per cent. And just to go into detail of some of this household assistance, it, uh, it means up to $338 extra per year for single pensioners and self-funded retirees, and up to $510 per year for pensioner couples combined. It means up to $110 per child for a family that receives family tax benefit A, up to $69 extra for families that receive family tax benefit part B and up to $218 extra per year for single income support recipients and uh, $390 per year for couples combined uh, for those on allowances, and up to $234 per year for single parents in addition to the increased family payments that they receive. 
And of course, a very important part of this package is the uh, tax reforms. And the tax reforms being introduced as part of the package will increase the tax-free threshold from $6,000 to $18,200 from uh, 1st of July 2012. And this is a very important reform. It means that over a million Australians will no longer need to lodge a tax return. It will make a, a huge difference to many Australians. From day one of the carbon price on 1 July 2012, every taxpayer with income below 80000 will receive a tax cut, with most getting at least $300 a year. These tax cuts will be permanent and they will increase. On, um, in July 2015, a second round of tax cuts will apply as well. So these tax reforms are a very, very important element of this overall package. And the government's plan includes a range of measures to support jobs in manufacturing industries as they make the transition to a clean energy future. The government's $1.2 billion clean uh, technology program will help improve energy efficiency in manufacturing and support research and development in low pollution technologies. So we're not just supporting uh, jobs in manufacturing, we're also investing in those very important jobs of the future, particularly in those areas of renewable energy. We know how important it is economically that we have that major investment in those very important areas. And of course, in contrast to the Gillard government's positive clean energy plan, we see uh, all we see from the, uh, the Leader of the Opposition is just a negative and dishonest scare campaign when it comes to the issue of climate change. We know that he said before he thinks that climate change is absolute crap. He's made that comment uh, previously. And what he wants to do is let those 500 biggest polluters off the hook, and instead he wants to slug householders to pay polluters. And the fact is the Leader of the Opposition cannot be trusted with either our economy or our environment. We also know that uh, the opposition that they've said they'll take back the compensation from the hands of householders. Only a couple of weeks ago, we had the shadow treasurer confirming that. He said he'll be taking back that compensation. Well, I'd like to come and talk to him to tell those more than 50,000 people uh, in my electorate that he's going to take away their pension increases. He's going to take away their increases in family payments. But that's exactly what they uh, what they intend doing, and that will have a very severe impact on uh, on many people within uh, my electorate. Mr Deputy Speaker, I'd like to ask the members of the opposition here today to consider the words of the Prime Minister when she introduced the bill to the House. The Prime Minister asked the members of the opposition to consider, are they on the right side of history? Well, placing a price on carbon is the right thing to do. It is the right thing to do. We must, as a nation, take these actions now to ensure that we begin our journey to a clean energy future. It's a future that will ensure our economic prosperity, a future that protects our environment and protects our environment environmental uh, surrounds, it's very, very important that we do both. And indeed, it is these clean energy bills that will do that in terms of uh, ensuring our economic prosperity is, uh, is, is there for the future and that we're preserving our environment for future generations. Mr Deputy Speaker, I commend the bills to the House. Order. The question is that these bills be now read a second time. I call the member for Solomon. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. The introduction of this clean energy bill and associated bills and the potential long-term ramifications should these bills become legislation are deep, divisive and possibly the most damaging in terms of issues I've ever witnessed in the public domain. In fact, the words deep and divisive fail to adequately paint the true picture of potential impact and voter sentiment being felt in the broader community and indeed in, the electorate, in my electorate of Solomon. The Prime Minister, as we heard prior to the last federal election, said, and I quote, there will be no carbon tax under the government I lead. These words remain deeply etched in the minds of most Australians, including schoolchildren. Yes, the current leader of this great nation stood before all Australians and categorically ruled out a carbon tax. Yet, one year on, here we sit, the 43rd parliament, the new paradigm, divided and engaged in bitter debate on this issue an issue which has the capacity to unseat a government. From my own electorate, people from all walks of life, all sectors of the community, all socio-economic circumstances and of all political persuasions tell me that this new tax is nothing more than a money grab by an inept government and that it won't do anything to help the environment. The general consensus is that this tax has nothing to do with sustainability and the longer term cleaner and greener environment. Mr Deputy Speaker, sustainability is a question that many of my constituents have pondered and have, and have candidly discussed with me. 
they have said, how can we talk about sustainability with the implementation of a carbon tax? It just doesn't make sense. A tax that the voting public will be paying for. A tax that the Gillard Labor government claims is designed to apply an impost to only 500 of the country's biggest polluters. The Gillard Labor government says that it understands that there may be some disadvantages as a result of the carbon tax. So to offset the minimal cost implications as provided by the government's modelling, a compensation package will be implemented to assist Australia's lowest paid. I suggest that this is a tax amassed in economic pain and not about environmental gain. The government's own figures indicate that this tax will immediately put the price of electricity up by 10 per cent and a 9 per cent increase in gas bills and leave a $4.3 billion hole in the budget. Now, in the Northern Territory, prices for most everyday items, including electricity and gas, are higher than in most other places in, the, in Australia. Couple these costs with higher transport costs, higher costs of living and higher housing affordability in the Northern Territory. The Northern Territory is already doing it tough. Yet, the Gillard Labor government says that it understands there may be some, some costs passed on to consumers as a result of this tax. Despite the Prime Minister's assurances, Territorians remain unconvinced that, that they will not be worse off. I've had thousands and thousands of my constituents voice their concerns against the carbon tax. Now I'm listening to them, and that's the message that I'm giving this House, that my electorate is saying no carbon tax. The Leader of the Opposition has made this House aware that this government has a history of, of price rises, with a 51 per cent average increase in power prices a 30 per cent average increase in gas prices, a 46 per cent average increase in water prices, a 24 per cent average increase in education costs and a 20 per cent average increase in health costs. These increases are before the impact is felt from the introduction of a carbon tax. These prices will continue to increase and we know that any price increase will further deepen the already tight budgets of most Australians. Now, I know that in the Northern Territory we will feel the pain of every single, uh, every single pain, uh, price increase. Mr Deputy Speaker, my constituents tell me of their concerns and their, their financial pain. And I've already indicated that my, in my electorate there is a strong feeling of resentment towards the Gillard Labor government introducing the carbon tax. Small local businesses underpin most communities, and this is no different within my electorate. Now, my background is in business. I understand the economics and, this, and the sweat, tears and effort needed to maintain and grow a business. I understand the impact rising costs have on a business. Now, a number of business owners within my electorate tell me that they are struggling. Margins are falling while costs are rising. There's no doubt small businesses are a good barometer for local communities in terms of how strong the economy is. Mr Deputy Speaker, when I hear local business owners saying that the predicted increases, uh, increased cost for, for electricity and gas under the carbon tax will impact on them significantly, when small operators say they are not sure that they will remain viable and still remain in business, or that they will need, have to downsize or let some staff go, I feel their hurt, I feel their anguish and I feel their anger. I echo the words of my colleagues and say to this, to this government, now is not the time to add additional burden on businesses. Now is not the time to add additional burden on families. And now is not the time to add, a sovereign risk, uh, add to sovereign risk as issues associated with Australia. Mr Deputy Speaker, the basis behind the introduction of these bills is for the government to address global environmental concerns by reducing carbon emissions. A key element of the government's policy propels Australia towards reaching a 5 per cent reduction in greenhouse, gas, uh, in greenhouse gas emissions by 2020. But this is not through a mechanism of environmental sustainability, but by an internationally linked scheme for the purchase of offshore permits. <coughs> Excuse me. The Prime Minister has said this is going to be an internationally linked scheme, and so it should be. Now, as the Deputy Leader of the Opposition has already outlined, the World Bank reports reported recently that the international market in carbon credits has suffered a debilitating collapse and expressed doubts about the ongoing viability of global markets. Trading in credits, which commenced following 
the adoption of the Kyoto Pro Protocol in 2005. $25 billion was generated over the, over the years 2005 to 2009. However, figures for last year indicate a collapse of $1.5 billion. And why? Due to the concerns about the ongoing commitment of nations, of nations post the Kyoto expiry in 2012. Internationally, concerns are being raised about the potential for corruption and crime in respect of dealing in carbon credits. Instances of fraud as evidence within the European Union are already a real concern. With an estimated $57 billion of taxpayer funds, as proposed by the Gillard Labor government in its carbon tax policy, is being sent offshore to purchase and secure carbon offsets to enable the government to reach its target of 80 per cent emissions reduction by 2050. Australia, from a global perspective in many respects, is viewed as a responsible corporate citizen in the global community. Yet, as a nation, Mr Deputy Speaker, this government wants to be the first to introduce an economy-wide carbon tax or emission trading scheme, a scheme that has the potential to disadvantage and disrupt the competitive position of Australia in terms of its export market, a scheme that has the potential for business to trade offshore with countries with inferior emission standards. Without the support of similar economy-wide carbon tax schemes across multiple countries, including the big, big polluters such as the United States, India and China, Australia is giving away an enormous competitive advantage to overseas manufacturing. In a time when there is uncertainty in the global economy, at a time when, the most, uh, when most countries are focused on the business of their own local economic development, at a time when countries are trying to maintain, if not improve, the standard of living for themselves, our current Labor government seems determined to reduce our standard of livings through the implementation of this carbon tax. The government's Clean Energy Future Plan has four key elements putting a price on carbon pollution, promoting innovation and investment in renewable energy, and improving efficiency energy, and creating opportunities in the land sector to cut pollution. The fact is, according to the government's own statements, carbon emissions for Australia will continue to impact on the climate and will increase from 578 million tonnes to 621 million tonnes between 2012 and 2020. The government, proposed, or the government promised and proposed that every cent of the monies collected by this tax would go to households. This government already has a credibility issue, and now we learn that although it promised 100 per cent of, of the collection to households, it's now gone down to 50 per cent. You just can't believe anything this government says. The true worth of any compensation to be put under this carbon tax remains to some extent shrouded in a mist of uncertainty. Modelling across the country by a number of state, state governments, including the Labor government of Queensland, shows considerable economic impacts associated with the introduction of this carbon tax. Now, the Northern Territory, will, unfortunately, will showcase the impact of this new tax. Why? Because of remoteness. Not the most distant from Canberra, my electorate, however, is one of the most remote in terms of population and demographics. Every access, to, to, every access or exit to the electorate of Solomon is via transport, not just a hop, skip, jump or a drive down the road, but thousands of kilometres from any, any state or major centre. Our lifeline relies on transport. Any impost on the preparation, manufacture, production, packaging, cooling, heating and transporting of goods will be impacted by this carbon tax. As I've already said, we in the Territory already pay extra for transport costs. It looks like we're going to be paying more. The government will have us believe that the impact of this new tax will be minimal. In fact, the compensation package will provide equality for those most needy. But if you happen to be a pensioner, self-funded retiree, small business operator or, many, or one of the many other Australians struggling to make ends meet, you, and you live in remote Australia, your government won't let you down. They'll tax you down. How on earth does the government expect the average Australian to quantify the cost of a carbon tax when Blind Freddy can see a carbon tax is meant to hurt? If it doesn't, how does it change behaviour? How does the cost of, of trading carbon credits address the impact of climate change in Kakadu or the Great Barrier Reef? I'd like to share with the House an example of how this tax affects a local aviation business in my electorate, Air North, an award-winning territory-grown business that commenced operations in 1978 as an air charter service across the Territory. By 1993, Air North expansion had continued to encompass the entire Northern Territory from Uluru to Darwin. Air North is now a major aviation operation operator in Northern Australia, with 156 scheduled departures weekly, servicing 14 destinations and carrying in excess of 250,000 passengers annually. It employs more than 180 staff in Darwin. 
A good news story for the Territory, right? A solid but small company providing essential services to the top end of Australia. Well, unfortunately, with the looming of the carbon tax, the company is concerned, or shall I say alarmed, at the impost that the proposed carbon tax will have upon it. The executive chairman of Air North, Mr Michael Bridge, shared with me some of his company's concerns and the projected impact that this tax will have on their business and growth plans. Mr Speaker, or Mr Deputy Speaker, I urge you and the other members of this House to listen to these figures. In 2011-2012, Air North budgets to use 15.5 million litres of aviation fuel. In 2012-2013, they plan to use 16.5 million litres of aviation fuel. 2013-2014, it will increase to 21 million litres of aviation fuel. And in 2014-2015, it will increase to an estimated 25 million litres of aviation fuel. Now, based solely on the usage of fuel and direct, the direct effect that a carbon tax will have on Air North in the 2012-2013 financial year will be an additional tax of $986,700. In 2013-2014, it will be $1.3 million. And in 2014-2015, the company will have to pay an additional tax of $1.65 million. Yep, $1.65 million. Now, if this company is to remain prosperous and provide the services that it's required by its consumers, the company will have no choice but to pass these additional costs on to the consumers. In addition to the issues of the significant increase to, in tax, Mr Bridge also highlighted to me that the Gillard Labor government had publicly stated that the ta they are taxing Australia's biggest 500 polluters. Now, Air North would not even be close to being rated as one of the 500 big polluters, but as outlined here today, they are to be taxed anyway. This is because the Gillard Labor government has applied the carbon tax to the aviation industry through the aviation fuel levy. This, doesn't, doesn't, this means that it doesn't matter how big or how small your aviation business is because the tax will be applied regardless. Air North are not the only aviation company that will be affected as this will be applied equally to other territory aviation companies including Hardy Aviation, Chart Air, Pearl Aviation, right down to the small operators in private aircrafts. They will all be paying the tax. Now, Mr Deputy Speaker, need I say more? This tax is unjust and, as I have, said, have clearly demonstrated here today, the tax will hurt all Australians. This carbon tax will not be um, fair as it will be significantly greater for small businesses and people living in the remoter areas of Australia. Now, I've been consulting with my constituents in Solomon and they are very clear. They don't want a carbon tax. In actual fact, the Northern Territory Legislative Assembly actually passed a motion to have a moratorium on the implementation of a carbon tax delayed for 50 years. This action reflects the view of Territorians, and they don't want a carbon tax. Now, I wonder if Minister Snowden, the member for Lingiari, will stand alongside me and not support the carbon tax, stand up for Territorians and not support the carbon tax. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Order. The question is that these bills be now read a second time. I call the Honourable the Parliamentary Secretary for Pacific Island Affairs. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker. I rise to speak in support of the Clean Energy Bill and other related bills, which form a scheme of legislation to put a price on carbon emissions within our economy via a market mechanism. We'll do this by issuing permits to those companies who emit more than 25,000 tonnes of CO2 every year, and that equates to about the 500 largest carbon emitters in our economy. Uh, the price of these permits will, in the first year, be $23 a tonne, and in years two and three will increase by about 2.5 per cent. And thereafter, the price of those permits will float and they will become tradable. It is predicted that this will give rise to an increase of prices within our economy, which will equate to about $10 a household, uh, or just under $10 per household. Half the money, Mr Deputy Speaker, which is raised through the selling of these permits will go to low- and middle-income households to enable them to deal with that uh, increase in prices. And that will be done by tripling the tax-free threshold, by giving rise to tax cuts, by increasing the family benefit scheme, uh, by increasing benefits. And in this way, 400,000 Australians will get 120 per cent 
of that $10 increase. That is to say they will be better off at the end of this. At least two-thirds of Australians will get the full uh, amount of the price increase provided to them through the tax cuts and the pension increases. 90 per cent of Australians will, provide, will get some form of compensation. In this way, Mr Deputy Speaker, it is important to understand that the carbon price will be funding tax cuts and pension increases for ordinary Australians. It's also important to understand that a half of the money that will be raised will go to assist those industries, particularly trade-exposed emissions-intensive industries, so as to secure those jobs at those uh, companies. Uh, and that is a very important element of this um, scheme. While there are many companies who will have an ability to pass on costs associated with the carbon price, there will be some who are in a difficult situation within the economy, and so they are being provided with assistance. In my electorate uh, of Carayo, uh, both Shell and Alcoa, for example, Mr Deputy Speaker, will be shielded from the carbon price to the extent of almost 95 per cent of the permits that they will be required to, uh, to purchase. That is a very big win for the people of Geelong and for the economy of Geelong. And can I say that I've spoken in depth with the companies uh, within my electorate uh, who are faced with uh, paying the carbon price. And I want to thank them for the constructive way in which they have worked with me and with the government in working through this package. Uh, and I do believe that the package, as it's now established, uh, minimises the effect that will occur on those businesses. And I think that that is their view as well. Uh, it, economy wide, we are talking about a relatively small change to the economy relative, for example, to the impact of the GST. This is, crudely speaking, going to see about an increase of 1 per cent in prices in our economy with a, with a corresponding package which will compensate people for that 1 per cent. That compares to near 10 per cent. Uh, each way, uh, which applied to the, the GST. Mr Deputy Speaker, my electorate uh, of Carayo, in my view, is very much on the front line of this debate. In what is the most carbon-intensive economy in the developed world, Geelong is perhaps the most carbon-intensive city within Australia. We have an aluminium smelter, we have an oil refinery, we have a car plant, we have cement works, we have other manufacturing. And so any, pro any uh, suggestion or proposition to place a price on carbon is obviously met with intense interest in the electorate of Corot. At the same time, of course, we are a seaside city. Much of that industry is located on the coast. And we also have uh, a vibrant tourism industry focused on the Great Ocean Road to the southwest of Geelong, which is a tourist attraction uh, based on the current configuration of our coastline. And so any talk about a rise in sea levels will directly affect Geelong. And indeed, being in southeast Australia, a part of the world which is predicted to see less rainfall uh, as a result of increasing global temperatures, we are also a, a part of the world which is water stressed. And so on both sides of the debate, uh, this is an issue which is felt very intensely within the electorate of Corral. And I think you can see that by the way in which the Geelong Advertiser has, and I think very fairly, covered this issue. Uh, I have been involved in holding many forums uh, of businesses uh, who will be affected by the carbon price, of people who work for those companies and indeed for groups that are very keen to see uh, this country act to meet the challenge of climate change. And what I take from that is not a sense that people want to plunge their head into the sand, but quite the opposite, a sense that people want to see this challenge met and that we meet it and that we do it right, and that in placing a pricing on carbon, uh, we do so in a way which gets it right. And Mr Deputy Speaker, I very much believe that the package of bills which has been put before uh, this parliament today does that. The starting point in that debate, uh, in this debate, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, is about uh, the whole question of climate change, and it does amaze me that there is a, still a debate in this country about whether or not climate change is real, and yet we very much see comments from the other side of this parliament, which time and again make it clear that there are people on the other side of the parliament, indeed a large number, who frankly believe that climate change is not real. Uh, the member for Gilmore referred to the IPCC findings, for example, as being, quote, very dubious scientific assumptions. Mr Deputy Speaker, the member for Hume said, and I 
quote, the argument that a reduction in carbon dioxide will somehow prevent future drought or even increase rainfall is entirely spurious. And we know what the Leader of the Opposition says about this debate in his private moments. I will not say private moments. Uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, the science of this, in my view, is pretty simple. We are experiencing unprecedented levels of carbon dioxide in our atmosphere. Ice core samples, which are the most reliable way of uh, seeing the levels of carbon dioxide in past times, take our timeline back about 800,000 years. And in that time, uh, the uh, levels of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere have been accurately recorded between 180 to 300 parts per million. In 1830, before the Industrial Revolution, it was 280 parts per million. Now, Mr Deputy Speaker, that figure is at 390 parts per million. That is an uncontested fact. There is not a scientist on the planet who contests that proposition. That's the first point. The second point is this. The there is a number of scientists who say, well, if there is such a fundamental change in our atmosphere going on, what will this mean? And so many, many scientists have attempted to model this fact, the fact of the high levels of CO2 within our atmosphere. And the vast preponderance of scientists who have modelled this have come up with the conclusion that, that, that this will result in a change to our climate, which will see temperatures go up and, as a result, sea levels go up. Now, that the vast preponderance of scientists have that view is also an uncontested fact. There are some scientists, a small minority, who model this in a different way, but the vast majority model it to, with, uh, with predictions of an increase in temperature. That's the second point. And the third point is this. We are starting to see right now uh, results in our climate which are consistent with the vast preponderance of those models. We have just lived through the hottest decade that's ever been recorded um, since records have been in place on this planet. Um, and so we have those things, an, un, uh, an unprecedented fact, which is uncontested, a series of modelling, the preponderance of which predicts that, that temperatures will rise as a result of that fact, and we are now seeing, uh, and it, we are now experiencing and witnessing temperatures rising. Now, does that mean that we are certainly going to see climate change? It doesn't. It might be that the, other the, the small minority of people modelling this problem may be right. Uh, is, it, is it right that we can definitely say that Hurricane Katrina or the Queensland floods were a consequence of climate change? Well, of course, we can't say that about either of those particular events. And because of that, this is fertile ground for people to go out and reject the science. But in doing so, they don't ask what is the fundamental question, which is this. Is there a sufficient risk right now uh, that, given uh, the science and given this uncontested uh, change in our atmosphere, that it will give rise to climate change and all the catastrophic consequences which uh, are predicted to arise for that for our children and our grandchildren. And the question clearly to that, the answer clearly to that question is that there is sufficient risk uh, such that we should be acting as public policy makers. And in truth, we've been able to answer that question, that fundamental question with certainty for more than a decade. This is the precautionary principle. And to not see that now is to act in a way which is to willfully plunge one's head into the sand. And can I say that history will condemn those people who plunge their head into the sand and don't deal with this issue as it's required to be dealt with now. Uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, in, again in my uh, lecture of cry, uh, the very large companies um, who will be bearing, in a sense, uh, the, the full impact or will be bearing the issues of the, climate, the, the price on carbon um, absolutely understand uh, the issue that's going on here. Uh, Shell, uh, the Shell company says, and I quote, uh, that Shell shares the widespread concern that the emission of greenhouse gases such as CO2 from human activities is contributing to global climate change. Alcoa says, and I quote, Alcoa supports an economy-wide response to the challenge of climate change. And Ford says, and I quote, at Ford we acknowledge the science of climate change. Um, there is no doubt uh, that from the point of view of those companies, they understand the risk that is at hand. Mr Deputy Speaker, the global challenge is often articulated on this issue as trying to lock in a climate uh, change increase of two degrees or less, which involves stabilising uh, CO2 within our atmosphere at 450 uh, parts per million, uh, which the CSIRO says involve, will involve halving uh, CO2 emissions by 2050. This itself 
is expected to see very significant changes within our lifetime. Uh, Two billion people exposed to water shortages. 30 per cent of the plant and animal species on the planet are put at risk of uh, extinction. And so what we are doing today is partly about playing our global part uh, in meeting that global challenge. But we do understand in the government that our emissions compared to those of the rest of the world are relatively small. Uh, and there is a bigger reason now for us to move uh, via the, these, this legislation. And that is because the rest of the world is moving and we cannot afford to be left behind. 32 countries have walked down the path of, uh, of dealing with climate change through an emissions trading scheme or some other form of abatement policy. Ten US states. California will be starting an emissions trading scheme at the beginning of this year, but most importantly, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, China who uh, will be cutting their emissions per GDP by 40 to 45 per cent by 2020 on 2005 levels. They will be ensuring that 15 per cent of their energy needs by 2020 will be through non-fossil fuels. They're increasing uh, their forestation. They have the largest renewable electric electricity generation capacity in the world. 13 districts in China are trialling low-carbon plans, including looking at emissions trading schemes. And, Mr Deputy Speaker, where China goes, the rest of the world will follow. That is, of course, good news from the point of view of dealing with this global challenge, but in a world where having a CO2-dependent economy uh, exists, we have an economy uh, which is the most uh, carbon-dependent in the developed world, which will be particularly exposed to that, and so we cannot afford to be left behind uh, with such an economy. To do so puts at risk future jobs and future industry, and to have any concern for those demands that we act now. How we act is the easiest question in this debate. Uh, the most important social phenomena which has existed over the last 200 years, and that is the power of the market, must be harnessed uh, in the most efficient and least costly way to deliver this change. This putting a price on carbon will encourage new industries and new solutions. Uh, we don't say whether it's gas, whether it's solar, whether it's wind, uh, because we're not about picking winners. Uh, but if the incentives are right within the economy, and this package will ensure that they are, we know that companies will put their best and brightest to work so that they get these right solutions. We know a market mechanism is the best. Malcolm Turnbull understands that a market mechanism is the best. Greg Hunt wrote theses about a market mechanism being the best way to deal with this issue. And Mr Deputy Speaker, walking down the path of a direct action policy is not a serious contribution uh, to this debate. Um, we know that this is a policy uh, which, in the words of uh, Ross Garno, would have some rationale if we wanted to pretend to take action against climate change uh, but not do much. Uh, and that's exactly what we are seeing in relation to the direct action plan. Um, Mr Deputy Speaker, Abraham Lincoln. Um, once said, we cannot escape history. We of this Congress and this administration will be remembered in spite of ourselves. No personal significance or insignificance can spare one or another of us. The fiery trial through which we pass will light us down in honour or dishonour to the latest generation. Mr Deputy Speaker, more than any other debate and more than any other vote which we have seen in this place will be scrutinised and remembered by history. And it will condemn those who vote against this. It will particularly condemn those who know in their hearts this is the right way to go but do not vote uh, in accordance with their beliefs. Order. The question is that these bills be now read a second time. I call the member for Gray. Th thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. I rise to address the Clean Energy Bill 2011 and related bills. Mr. Speaker, the government has no mandate for these bills. In fact, it has, no, it has a mandate to oppose the bills. Of the 150 members in this place, 149 took the same policy to the last election, and that is not to implement a carbon tax. And I ask you, Mr. Speaker, would we be having this debate? If Prime Minister Gillard had said on August 16 last year that my government will introduce a carbon tax instead of there will be no carbon tax under a government that I lead, or if on 20 August she had said I rule in a carbon tax instead of I rule out a carbon tax, would Australia now be facing a new tax of no less than $8.5 billion per annum on the biggest employers of the nation? If the Treasurer Wayne Swan had said on 15 August we will move towards a carbon tax instead of, well, certainly, what we reject is this hysterical allegation somehow that we are moving toward a carbon tax. We certainly reject that. 
Now, Mr Deputy Speaker, would, would Julia Gillard be here as Prime Minister of Australia? And the answers are no, no and no. No, we would not be having this debate. No, we would not be facing an $8.5 billion tax. And no, Julia Gillard would not be the Prime Minister if she and her ministers had told the truth that they, they would simply not be the Government of Australia. The Prime Minister says she had no choice. The tax was a price of the deal with the Greens because the tax was part of the deal to deliver government, the cost of government. Well, no one held a gun at her head, Mr Speaker, and could anyone seriously contemplate a parliament where the Greens were ever going to support the coalition? Is it really fair, Mr Deputy Speaker, for the Prime Minister to blame the Greens? Surely now we are seeing the real Julia. Or perhaps again, Mr Deputy Speaker, it's not. Because, of course, this was the same person who, as Deputy Prime Minister, advised the then Prime Minister and, in all likelihood, the next Prime Minister of Australia, Kevin Rudd, to abandon the ETS. <laughs> who would know what she really thinks? Surely, Mr Deputy Speaker, this issue and the cont contor contortions on migration are two of the issues on which Julia Gillard asked the Australian public to judge her by. And if she wants to be properly judged, she should lay the deal, the new deal, the government's completely reversed position on the table and ask the Australian public for a mandate, because she certainly doesn't have a mandate for the course that she has chosen on either issue. Madam Deputy Speaker, we are advised repeatedly that Australia is being left behind on the climate change, on the issue of climate change. The rest of the world is moving on, but is it really? We could be forgiven for thinking Australia is an in international pariah, the worst emitter per capita in the world. Madam Deputy Speaker, that claim is simply not true. According to the US Department of Energy, Australia is in fact number 11 in the world. In fact, Australia is about equivalent to similar resource-rich economies and, importantly, our direct competitors, the US and Canada. And let me tell you, there is no chance either nation, either competitor, will introduce a similar economy-wide carbon tax as ours any time soon. Or let me tell you, Madam Deputy Speaker, in the US, if the US and Canada do not, then neither will anyone else. In fact, the only economy in the world that has done anything significant in this space is the EU, and we should take a closer look at what the Europeans have done. For while it is true they have an ETS and have managed to cap emissions, all is not what it seems and, in fact, bears a little closer examination. Firstly, the European ETS is largely a tax on electricity. Eighty per cent of the manufactured covered by the scheme are eligible for 100 per cent compensation up to 2020. And certainly the French president is not having anything of a tax on his industries that the rest of the world does not face. When he says a carbon tax threatens our jobs and it would be absurd to tax French companies while giving an edge to those polluting countries. The great promoters of European action in this country neglect to tell us that at the same time as Europe has capped emissions, their import importation of embedded emissions has risen by 30 per cent. That means the CO2 emitted for European consumption, manufactured goods and raw materials has occurred in another country, mostly China, and where there are no restrictions on emissions. Effectively, they have transported their emissions to nations where they will not be counted. In fact, Madam Deputy Speaker, to clarify this situation further, Australia, which is at the 11th highest emitter per capita in the world, emits a full 18 per cent of our total CO2 on behalf of other countries. The emissions are embedded in our imports and our exports. Excuse me. If we export these products to a country like Britain, it makes their balance sheet look good and ours look bad. If these emissions are removed from Australia's CO2 accounts, we are in fact about number 30 in the world's list of carbon sinners. Not bad for a country which has the greatest tyranny of distance in the world. Now, Madam Deputy Speaker, I would like to turn to some specific industries and the likely impacts on the communities um, they support my electorate of grey. Now, what, while much has been said about the cost of living implications of the carbon tax on Australians, and quite rightly, my strongest concerns with the tax have been carbon leakage and the effects on exporting and importing competing businesses that have no power within the marketplace to pass on their costs. In particular, I have been concerned about the impact on two major employers in my electorate, One Steel and Wyala and Nearstar and Port Pirie. Let's first take the example of One Steel. 
and it is pertinent the government has recognised there is a serious problem with the steel industry and offered a 300 million steel transformation package over four years. One thing I often say about the carbon tax is that it is pointless unless it changes behaviour, and the government has shown with the parameters of this tax that it has no understanding of this premise. In the case of one steel, surely the object of the tax is to place external costs on the business so it switches to a process which emits less CO2, to make current high emission technology more expensive so, to lower, emission, so lower emission technologies can compete. Now, that only makes sense if there are alternative technologies, but in the case of steel, 80 per cent of the CO2 emissions are unavoidable. They come from the actions of using coke to convert iron to steel and, regardless of the cost, cannot be avoided. High taxes on steel cannot change CO2 efficiency. And in fact, if we want to reduce Australia's emissions from steel, the only way of making a significant difference is to close the industry down and send it offshore. That won't cut the world's emissions, but it will reduce Australia's emissions, which of course is less than pointless for the environment, but it will meet the government's aims. Madam Deputy Speaker, the steel assistance package does nothing more than cushion the impact of the tax to compensate for the tax. However, it will not facilitate industry to significantly alter behaviour for the reasons that I have just outlined. Four years of assistance. Then what? Nothing but a rising carbon price, $29 a tonne by 2015 and $37 in 2020. This is a policy to get us past the next election, not a policy that will ensure we have a steel industry in Australia. Or even most importantly, it is not a policy which will reduce the amount of CO2 emitted in the world as adverse to Australia. Madam Deputy Speaker, considering the government assumes $300 million will be enough compensation for one steel and blue scope to keep making steel for the next four years, to compensate for the hundreds of millions of dollars that will be extracted from the industry, can we assume that as the tax rises to 60 per cent by the year 2020, um, that the industry will need a $480 million package? Now, of course, after refusing to debate the bill separately, the government is now opportunistically splitting off just one, just one, the steel industry assistance package, presumably to try and embarrass me uh, and has already known me in the media. Now, Madam Deputy Speaker, the great Muhammad Ali had an in-ring tactic called rope-a-dope. Well, Madam Deputy Speaker, I'm no dope and I'm not for roping. If the Greens Labor Party bills are lethal to the steel industry, then they are responsible to see a package is passed in full. If they cannot, they should abandon the bills. The bills, I might add, that only 28 per cent of Australians support. 28 per cent. And as the member for Wyala, I cannot support a bill in isolation because it is only a stopgap. It will not achieve the structural change and it will provide only short-term benefit. Should I support just the steel industry package, then I would be judged as the member who assisted in installing a tax which will continue to ramp up costs on the steel and the lead and zinc industries until the pain is too great to bear. Make no mistake, Madam Deputy Speaker, we are debating this tax because it was the price of the deal with the Greens. Well, in that case, let them be responsible for the full effects of the tax or support the crumbs off the table approach that may allow the steel industry to struggle along for the next few years before being completely killed off. Which brings me to Nearstar. Nearstar has two plants in Australia, one in Port Pirie my electorate, the other in Hobart in the electorate of Denison. Madam Deputy Speaker, the two plants are interdependent. In 1997, in order to comply with international anti-dumping at sea conventions, Nearstar's previous owners invested $70 million to stop sea dumping of waste from the Hobart plant instead, of electing, to repro instead electing to reprocess in Port Pirie. The waste has very low mineral concentrations for all intents and purposes is nearly worthless. If Port Perry operation does not exist, then neither can Hobart, and there are no other practical alternatives for dealing with this waste. Now, the Hobart plant is a zinc processing plant, and because it sits in the highest intensity band of emissions, it will be granted 95 per cent credits. In comparison, Port Perry is a multi-metal smelter, but predominantly lead and zinc. The zinc component will attract the same 95 per cent credits under the government tax. However, the lead part of the business will receive only 60 per cent credits. 
and explicitly the government chooses to break down a fully integrated multi-processing plant into separate entities for taxing purposes. The tax will cost Neostar in excess of $10 million in the first year, rising to $16 million by 2020 and more beyond that should they still be in business. Similarly to steel, there is virtually no means by which Neostar can alter the process to emit less CO2. They have no way of passing their cost increases on, for they are price takers in the world market. The tax can only be described as a tax to raise money. It cannot be classed as a tax to alter behaviour, and surely that should be its purpose, Madam Deputy Speaker. What isn't widely known, Madam Deputy Speaker, is that the Port Perry plant is in, age, major need, uh, in aid, need of a major refurbishment. Within the next five years, Neostar, the world's biggest seat producer and a company based in Switzerland, with four other smelters around the world, must choose to reinvest in Port Perry or the plant will close. The cost of refurbishment will be in excess of $400 million. Under the laws proposed by the government, it is impossible to believe the company would choose to invest that amount of money in Australia. It simply will not happen. So without better compensation package, it's almost certain Neostar will elect to remove itself from Port Perry, and that means Hobart too, and will be a casualty of the carbon tax that the Prime Minister promised us we would never have. Further than that, I recently saw figures showing that a tonne of zinc refined in China is likely um, to consume double the energy used here in Australia. Mr. Uh, Madam Deputy Speaker, I'm con I am concerned um, also about the Alinta power operations at Port Augusta uh, that will also be affected, but I'm just unsure what the tax will mean for them. Certainly the South Australian uh, will have a total, there is a chance of a, a, a developing an unstable electricity grid if the base load uh, generators are removed. And I think it highly likely that the government, state or federal, will have to pay Alinta to stay online for, or subsidise gas replacements. I'm concerned that we haven't properly assessed the impact of the expanding renewable energy sector in the state, and courtesy of wind generation, uh, South Australian uh, consumers may well face some difficult circumstances in the medium future, but I'll take an opportunity to inform the House on that issue at a later date. In the wider sense, the economic backbone of my electorate, agricultural, fishing, aquaculture, mining, the overseas competing tourism industry, all face embedded costs of the carbon tax and will have no ability to, to pass on. While agriculture is directly exempt, um, that is only for the time being. By 2014, uh, heavy transport will be facing the full cost. Madam Deputy Speaker, I wish the government members would acquaint themselves with a map of Australia. Our heavy transport is a tax on our weakness. A heavy transport tax is a tax on our weakness. Everything in regional Australia and its regions, which are the generators of primary wealth in this nation, face a freight barrier the rest of the world will never understand. Fishermen will pay more for fuel, they will pay more to refrigerate their catch. Farmers will pay more for their freight, fertiliser and chemical. Miners will pay more for fuel, electricity and transport. Tourism face more airfares and untaxed competition from overseas. None of them will get any compensation from the government. None of them can pass on the costs. All of them will pay for the government lollies for the masses. All of them are abandoned by this government, which has betrayed its electoral commitments and will not seek a mandate for the biggest reversal of policy this country has ever seen. Madam Deputy Speaker, all sides of politics agree we need to reduce our CO2 output. However, there is a better way than installing a tax that Australians were promised they would not have, and despite the government's best efforts, the public definitely the do not want. Has expired. The question is that these bills be now read a second time. I call the member for Melbourne Port. Thank you very much, sir. Acting Deputy Speaker. Acting Deputy Speaker, we have a responsibility to ensure that generations uh, after us um, don't inherit the problems of today. A carbon price, in my view, is an effective method uh, to transit our economy from a high-emitting uh, economy to a low-emitting one. We'd like to be remembered as leaving Australia to our children better than uh, the country that we uh, received or the economy we uh, inherited. When we were asked to act, we can say when we leave this place we didn't falter, but instead rose above the bitter, vitriolic, indeed I would argue conspiracy um, raising point scoring that has been part of uh, uh, this debate. We've, uh, many people um, in this debate 
act in good faith and, as on most issues, uh, are voting on the future of the country in, uh, in that spirit. That is why the introduction of the Clean Energy Bill and implementing a carbon price is essential. The Clean Energy Bill will ensure that the 500 largest polluters in Australia pay for emitting carbon, not households. Costs will be passed on uh, to consumers will be offset by compensation. In my own electorate of Melbourne Port, surrounded by Port Phillip Bay, 14,500 pensioners will receive an extra $338 per year if they're single and up to $510 for couples combined. 2,300 self-funded retirees will receive an extra $338 per year if they're single and up to $510 for couples. 3,000 job seekers in Melbourne Ports will get $218 extra per year for singles and $390 for couples. 700 single parents in Melbourne Ports will get an extra $289 per year and 2,100 students uh, will get up to $117 extra per year. This is the compensation. The government is also providing tax cuts that will increase the tax-free threshold from uh, this is most significant, uh, Deputy Speaker, from six to eighteen thousand on first of July two thousand and twelve to nineteen thousand four hundred on the first of July two thousand and fifteen. The tax cuts from the increase in the threshold will be gradually offset so that those with taxable incomes under eighty thousand a year get a cut that counters their higher energy prices, while those earning about eighty thousand will have no, no change to their tax bills. Overall, the carbon price will see prices rise by less than one per cent. Now, of course, the modelling says that uh, indeed uh, that there will be an increase in the number of jobs by 2013 and further in 2020. Of course, with international economic circumstances, we can't necessarily uh, predict exactly where the Australian economy will be going. But uh, certainly, um, the economic evidence that I've seen uh, suggests that uh, under these, these new arrangements, the clean energy legislation, that there will be new jobs created, uh, as many that might uh, be jeopardised. Our 9.2 billion jobs and competitiveness program will shield heavy industry sectors like steelmaking, aluminium production, glass and paper uh, from the carbon price uh, to support jobs in Australia. Uh, the $300 million steel transformation plan will provide extra assistance for steelmakers. And I note, uh, Deputy Speaker, it's even supported by uh, Mr Warburton on late line last night, who said that uh, the industry associations, uh, despite his opposition to this legislation, do support that steel transformation plan. On top of that, there is an, uh, an $800 million clean technology investment program, which provides grants for manufacturers to invest in energy saving equipment and low pollution technologies. And there is also a special $150 million for the food processing sector. Those opposite would have uh, us believe that Australia will be increasing the cost of living by hundreds of dollars each for each uh, Australian. We're not. Any costs, as I said, will be offset by compensation, compensation which those opposite claim they'll take off pensioners after the legislation has passed from low-income earners, from students, from the average Australian who uh, low-income Australian who will um, benefit from the new, uh, higher and very important uh, tax-free threshold. The carbon price will not only apply to agricultural emissions, emissions from cars and light commercial vehicles, off-road agricultural, forestry and fishery uses. Uh, when Malcolm Turnbull rose in support of the ETS last year, he said the reason he backed the ETS and the Liberals had proposed it under John Howard, remember, was because, quote, we as Liberals believe in the superior efficiency of the free market to set a price on carbon. Ironic. Uh, the opposition is opposed to the free market, and uh, for all of them raging about us being socialists, etc., we are the ones who are supporting it. We still have a bipartisan uh, medium term target for reducing our emissions uh, between 5 and 16 per cent on the 2000 uh, levels by 2020. So I ask if there's bipartisan support for the level of reduction, then surely those opposite uh, ought to be willing to support initiatives to reduce our emissions. Uh, but the opposition is now opposed to uh, taking part in the process to tackle climate change. This wasn't always the case, and I believe many within the opposition still believe a price on carbon and carbon emission tradings is the uh, best course to take. The Shadow, Minister, <coughs> the Shadow Treasurer, uh, the member for North Sydney, uh, admitted in May last year in the Sydney Morning Herald that it was inevitable that Australia would have a price on carbon. Quote, inevitably we'll have a price on carbon. 
will have to. The member for Warringah, the Leader of the Opposition, once supported a tax on carbon. We have all seen the footage of the interview where the Leader of the Opposition gave, uh, gave to Sky News in 2009, but his words are worth remembering. In the interview, the member for Warringah said this, quote, If you want to put a price on carbon, why not simply do it with a simple tax? Why not ask electricity consumers to pay more? Then at the end of the year you can take your invoices to the tax office and get a rebate. It would be burdensome, said uh, Warringah. All taxes are burdensome, but it would certainly raise the price of carbon without increasing in any way the overall tax burden. It's clear that uh, Mr Abbott, the Leader of the Opposition, will say or do anything, change his position on climate change over and over again, just like he has on uh, the uh, uh, issue of uh, offshore migration, uh, whatever it takes to get himself into the lodge. Under the Coalition's plan, they will tax people, not polluters. The member for Warringah's direct action plan would hit every Australian household with a $720 a year charge. Business costs would rise. Living costs would rise. The Liberal plan costs families $720 a year, doesn't protect or create jobs and, most importantly, won't work. There's no evidence that the Liberal plan will achieve its carbon reduction goals. Now, I'm in favour of tree planting, Deputy Speaker, but the amount of uh, uh, tree planting uh, some people have said it's the size of Tasmania that would have to be done to uh, uh, put into effect uh, the opposition's plan are clearly uh, beyond the realms of possibility. Um, the vitriol that this debate has uh, engendered, uh, Deputy Speaker, the conspiracies that have been flying around about scientists uh, have added to a climate of fear in Australia. And I particularly disassociate myself from the incredible acrimony with which um, people in academy, uh, our great scientists, have been, uh, uh, with which they have been faced. Uh, the member for uh, Wentworth's words are poignant. And these are words I would appeal to those opposite to heed. He said, but first let me say straight up that the question of whether or not what extent human activity is causing global warming is not a matter of ideology, let alone uh, or of belief. The, the matter is simply one of risk management. It is more not a question of left versus right. Indeed, it was Margaret Thatcher who, uh, more than any other, 20 years ago called for immediate action to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. If Margaret Thatcher took uh, climate change seriously, uh, the member for Wentworth argued and believed we should uh, take action to reduce global greenhouse emissions, then taking action and supporting and accepting the science can hardly be the mark of incipient Bolshevism. Uh, Deputy Speaker, I've been very influenced by the presentations of uh, a range of uh, scientists that have uh, come to this House to explain to us the uh, impact of uh, global warming. Um, the CSIRO, our scientists, indeed those of us who argue uh, for, for this legislation, are not part of some green conspiracy to con the Australian people into taking action on climate change. Carbon tr emissions trading, after all, was the policy of the Liberal Prime Minister John Howard. The Conservative government in the United Kingdom, led by Prime Minister David Cameron, has announced that the UK will be implementing policies to reduce emissions in Britain. The Conservative Prime Minister of New Zealand, John Key, is committed to continuing New Zealand's carbon emissions trading scheme. These are not green parties, green political parties. They are responsible economic conservatives who believe that a carbon emissions trading scheme and a price on carbon is the best way to move from a high emitting economy to a low emitting economy. It's uh, the same policy essentially that uh, the government, uh, the Australian Labor Party supports. Even China, um, who, um, is a, whose economy is so rapidly expanding and uh, where there are many dubious um, uh, pollution uh, effects um, that we can quite clearly see if you visit there or you, you uh, observe what happened during the Beijing Olympics, um, has announced they're going to introduce uh, carbon emissions trading schemes in six of its provinces. Uh, <coughs> this is one of the great uh, economic reforms this country has seen since uh, the Hawke-Keating years. This policy is not about short-term political point scoring or an election. It's about uh, acting for future generations. This reform will ensure job security in steel, mining, manufacturing, farming and small business, and new jobs in renewable, in, in, uh, renewable industries. 
Deputy Speaker, the uh, Clean Energy Bill gives us the capacity to unlock the full potential of the Australian people's brain power. For entrepreneurs, philanthropists, investors and new technology, these bills offer Australia a way forward into the future. After all, the effect of a market mechanism is designed uh, to ensure that people will use all of their creativity, all of their economic creativity, that the opposition goes on about so much as part of the, the natural order of capitalism to lower their carbon emissions uh, and therefore uh, face uh, uh, less of the effect of uh, uh, the carbon price. Uh, as Robert Kennedy said in a speech in 1967, if we fail to dare, if we do not try, the next generation will harvest the fruit of our indifference, a world we did not want, a world we did not choose, a world we could, have, we could make better. The question is that these bills be now read a second time. I call the member for McPherson. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. I rise to speak on the Clean Energy Bill 2011 and related bills. And I speak on behalf of the many constituents and residents of McPherson on the southern Gold Coast, who have been largely ignored by the Prime Minister and the Labor government. I was elected by the people of McPherson to represent them in this place, and I am here to voice their concerns along with the concerns of other Australians who never expected to be in the position we are in today, where we are debating the introduction of a carbon tax a tax that Labor and the Prime Minister promised would never be introduced by a Gillard government. The Australian people are now left to watch on as the Gillard-Brown government attempts to pass one of the most controversial policy changes while excluding and dismissing their views. The biggest issue that families on the southern Gold Coast are facing right now is the rising cost of living. Since 2007, right across Australia, Electricity prices have increased by an average of 51 per cent. In the first nine months of the Gillard government, families have been paying, on average, 5 per cent more for groceries at the supermarket and around 13 per cent more for water and wastewater services. Electricity, food and water are not the only essential items that have seen an increase during this period. Fuel, health costs, rent and mortgages have also cost local families more, stretching budgets to the limit. What families need right now is a break from price increases, not a new tax that will potentially push them over the edge. The Gillard-Brown government's proposed carbon tax is going to flow down from the mysterious top 500 polluters and into the pockets of consumers. The affected businesses are unlikely to absorb these costs they will be forced to increase their prices or reduce their own costs by reducing their wages bill through job cuts or by reducing hours of work. Every time you turn on your TV, your air conditioning, boil the jug or go to the shops, you'll be paying more. Labor talks about compensation, but we all know that compensation is only paid to those who have been injured or suffered a loss in the first place. We also know that compensation will not keep pace with increases in the future. The $23 a tonne price is not fixed. It will go up and is already forecast to reach over $350 a tonne in 2050. This is the last thing the people of McPherson need. They have suffered three and a half years of price hikes under the Labor government and around 95 per cent of the local people I have spoken with since the announcement of this tax oppose its introduction. Our local tourism and construction industries are at risk under the proposed tax. The Gold Coast has long been an affordable domestic holiday destination for Australians. With an increase in the ticket price of a domestic airfare, Australians will be penalised for holidaying at home while those wishing to travel overseas will be exempted. The Australian Tourism and Export Council believe the impact of a price on carbon is another hit to tourism businesses, already facing the significant impacts of the high Australian dollar and the declining number of domestic tourists. They are concerned that thousands of small and medium-sized businesses who operate on tiny margins will close down. 
The local community on the Gold Coast relies on the tourism industry's survival because without it, thousands of jobs and associated livelihoods will disappear. The construction industry is facing a similar fate, with costs set to increase under the proposed tax. According to a survey issued by the Master Builders Association, the Gold Coast is the toughest place to operate in Queensland. Unfortunately, under the proposed carbon tax, things will become more difficult for this industry. The Master Builders Association has said the introduction of the carbon tax will raise the cost of new homes and renovations, worsening housing affordability and crippling confidence. The MBA estimate that construction costs for a typical 200 square metre slab on ground home will increase from between $7,000 to $9,000 based on the carbon price of $23 a tonne, without adding additional increases in the cost of transport. These increases could severely impact the construction industry as people opt out of building or renovating because they simply can't afford it. There is already a significant number of unemployed construction workers on the southern Gold Coast, and we cannot afford to have more workers put off as a result of a decline in the amount of housing and commercial projects. With our tourism and construction industries in despair, we have had to rely on a second layer of industries, including manufacturing and education, to ensure that our local economy stays afloat. The future growth of these industries is uncertain, as the prospect of a carbon tax is already being evaluated, especially in the higher education sector. I will use Bond University as an example to demonstrate my point here, and I note the submission made by Bond University to the Joint Select Committee on Australia's Clean Energy Future legislation was accepted, unlike the numerous submissions made by others, including those from the McPherson electorate, that were dismissed as correspondence. I recently held a carbon tax forum in my electorate of McPherson and I invited the community to come and share their views on the proposed carbon tax with me. I invited a range of panel members, including Senator Simon Birmingham, to give presentations and answer questions in relation to the carbon tax. Jim Wilson, the general manager from Connecting Southern Gold Coast, was there as a representative of the small business community, and particularly those businesses who were unable to attend the forum due to the increase in the hours of work associated with running their businesses. Also in attendance to address the community on the impact of the carbon tax on the Higher Education Centre was Chris Hogan, the Associate Director, Information and Planning Financial Services from Bond University. Bond University is a very small university by Australian standards, with about 4,500 students and around 1,200 staff members on campus. The university has made preliminary evaluations on the impact of the carbon tax and has calculated the cost of the carbon tax to be $2 million in both indirect and direct costs. Bond have advised me that they are expecting to see the following indirect flow-on effects from the carbon tax. Rises in electricity and other utilities. Additional wage costs of monitoring and reporting data. <coughs> Me. Cost of acquisition of CO2 reporting software. Cost of implementation of additional smart meters on campus, which pinpoint certain locations and their energy use. Appointments of consultants to standardise data and ensure accuracy of data. Additional compliance reporting to government. Travel, estimated $3 increase in domestic flight fares um, per media story by Virgin Blue wage increase requests to meet the consumer price index. From Bond's own calculations, the total indirect costs are not less than $1.2 million in 2012-13, rising to $1.3 million by 2015-16. In addition to these costs, Bond calculated the direct costs of the carbon tax at $0.6 million per annum, rising to $0.8 million in 2015-16. In order to facilitate these costs, Bonds has two options, either increase revenue by raising fees or reducing costs, primarily through job costs, cuts. Fee increases would impact Australian students and their families in the local community. 
because it would most likely lead to students looking at alternative institutions to start or continue their tertiary education. We need to encourage the tertiary uptake rate on the Gold Coast, and rising costs would severely impact enrolments in this private institution, as currently students are unable to access Commonwealth-supported places. In addition, Bond has international enrolments of around 30 per cent of the total student body. If Bond was to increase its fees in order to save jobs, then the international students would also possibly consider studying in other countries that are more competitively priced. Bond University has also said, and I quote, regarding the potential impact on the higher education sector as a whole, given we expect Bond will be impacted and Bond is very small, it seems most likely that all of the 39 universities in the higher education total sector will also exceed the threshold of 25,000 tonnes of carbon dioxide per year, unless the government decides they are specifically exempted. We could find no such exemption in the government's information on the proposed carbon tax. Most other universities are considerably larger than Bond. Bond's expenditure comprises around 0.7 per cent of sector expenditure. If we were to scale up Bond's estimated proposed carbon tax impact of $2 million per year to the sector level, we would get a sector-wide impact of the proposed carbon tax in the range of $200 to $300 million. But of course it isn't just the education sector that will be adversely affected by the introduction of a carbon tax. I've been meeting with local manufacturers, many of whom are already facing increased pressure as a result of the high Australian dollar and reduced spending patterns. For manufacturers, the carbon tax may well be the final straw, and I'm concerned that there will be an increasing number of organisations taking the difficult decision to close their operations. One of our local manufacturers, the Rock Crush Group, has over 100 years of combined experience in the engineering and manufacturing of winches and also dredges that are exported worldwide. They have been based on the Gold Coast now for more than 40 years. When I asked them how they would be affected by the introduction of the carbon tax, I was told, quite simply, that it would drive their operations offshore. They also said that here in Australia there would be no other option than to make job cuts. The proposed carbon tax is causing a lot of anxiety within the community. Pensioners and families are struggling to make ends meet already and have had to tighten their belts beyond what is reasonable. Small business owners are also doing it tough. You can see the impact on local businesses in the vacancies of commercial and retail shops and the higher than average unemployment levels on the Gold Coast. Our not-for-profit community organisations, in particular surf life-saving clubs, are also worried that the carbon tax will close them down. There is an alternative available to the carbon tax. There is a better way. The Coalition's direct action plan will cost $3.2 billion and will be funded from the $50 billion in savings that we announced pre-election. Our plan is fully costed and capped and will not be at the expense of reduced standards of living. It is straightforward, practical and easy to understand. The direct action plan will not destroy jobs. It will protect our economic development and the environment at the same time. Since Copenhagen, many countries around the world have distanced themselves from carbon taxes and emissions trading schemes. The USA scrapped its cap and trade system entirely, and the only other existing example of an emissions trading system is the European ETS. However, the European system only costs roughly $1 per person per annum while the proposed Australian system will cost $400 per person per annum. While Europe's ETS costs $500 million per year, the Labor government's carbon tax will cost Australian taxpayers $9 billion a year. The Labor government's target to reduce emissions by 80 per cent by 2050 will force the coal industry to cease its operations entirely. Additionally, an estimated $57 billion of Australia's taxpayers' funds will be sent offshore to buy carbon offsets to enable, for, enable Australia to reach this target. Australian taxpayers work hard to contribute to the economy, and what we have here is the potential for our wealth to be transferred away from the Australian people who built it. 
I'm concerned about reports that indicate that 100 arrests have occurred throughout Europe for the extensive defrauding of the European Union ETS. I am aware of reports that indicate around 90 per cent of the trades in the European Union's ETS were fraudulent, resulting in a loss to European taxpayers of $6.6 billion. Deloitte Australia has even warned that carbon credit fraud is the white-collar crime of the future. I'd like to conclude today by reminding the Labor government that when the Howard government introduced the goods and services tax, the people were given the opportunity to decide on the GST. It was a replacement tax. It replaced the wholesale ta sales tax and was 15 years in the making. The proposed carbon tax will not replace an existing tax. The carbon tax is a cascading and compounding tax that will affect everyone. Deputy Speaker, I have listened to the community and I'll be supporting their views by voting no to the carbon tax. The question is that these bills be now read a second time. I call the member for O'Connor. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. My position on the carbon tax or this Clean Energy Bill 2011 has always been the same. As such, and I, I do not intend to take up too much of this chamber's time today. I would, however, like to take this opportunity to reiterate my position on this carbon tax. I do not support a carbon tax. I did not support a carbon tax at the election. I do not support a carbon tax now, and I have consistently, consistently said that I do not and would not support a carbon tax in this parliament. My views on a carbon tax have always been the same, which is more than I can say for most members of this house. I have consistently said that a carbon tax is bad for my electorate of O'Connor, bad for the state of Western Australia, bad for regional Australia, and bad for industry. A carbon tax is bad for my electorate of O'Connor because it will burden the families of O'Connor who rely on the local industries for employment, industries that will be heavily affected by the carbon tax. It is bad for the small business of O'Connor, such as the Widgee Multha Roadhouse. A small business such as these will be hit by an effective carbon price on fuel without any viable alternatives. It is bad for the people of O'Connor who rely on the goods to be transported over great distances to reach their supermarkets, stores and homes. A carbon tax is bad for my state of Western Australia. It is bad for WA, which is the home to most of the mining industry, which will be hit, uh, which will be hit hard by the carbon tax, which is already under siege from an unfair distribution of the GST and the impending mining tax. It is bad for the uh, unique WA electricity market and the WA energy generators such as Griffin Energy, who are set to share zero dollars of the $5.5 billion compensation that will be allocated to national market. I have consistently said that the carbon tax is bad for industry. It is bad for industries which do not need another tax. It is bad for industries which will be disadvantaged when they compete in the international market. It is bad for industries that rely on transport fuels for on-site power generation. I have consistently said that the carbon tax is bad for regional Australia and rural Australia. Regional Australians who have no choice but to rely on goods which have been transported over great distances. Rural and regional small businesses have no choice but to rely on diesel fuel for on-site power generation. I have consistently opposed this tax and will be consistent when I vote against this tax in this parliament. Although I firmly and consistently oppose the carbon tax, constituents and industry representatives have pleaded with me to do what I can to make this tax less damaging. Although I will vote against this carbon tax in whatever form, it is my duty as a, rep as a representative to my electorate and to the many industry members that have been ignored by this government. One of the most consistent and specific complaints from industry is about the Clean Energy Bill 2011, a bill that will apply an effective carbon price on transport fuels used for on-site fuel generation, a carbon price that will hit small businesses. Members of the House will recall the government's repetitive promise that this carbon tax is a tax on big polluters. However, however, as we all know, this is another broken promise to the Australian people. The government's amendments, the government's amendments impose an effective carbon price on, heavy, on every business that uses transport fuels. This is an effective carbon tax on big business, small business, developing business and established businesses. Every business in a non-exempt industry that requires on-site fuel use will be whacked with this carbon tax, including, of course, businesses that are not part of the 500 top polluters, businesses that are not big polluters under any definition. The Minerals, the Minerals Council of Australia 
Australia's public submission on the carbon pricing framing carbon pricing framework demonstrates that the carbon price on fuel will apply to tens of thousands of small businesses covering manufacturing, construction, retail, wholesale and tourism sectors. These operations are by no means big polluters and should not be shouldering the brunt of, of the carbon price. One of the sectors hit hardest by these amendments are junior miners and mineral exploration operators. This, in, this is particularly important for regional mining and mineral exploration operations. These operations rely on diesel fuel to operate for many of these, for, and for many of these operators there is simply no other option. In many country towns and remote locations where junior miners operate there is no alternative. This is about changing behaviour. It's just another hit to small business. Sorry, this is not about changing behaviour. This is just another hit to small business. Changes must be made to these bills which will hold government to its promise to only tax big polluters. As such, I intend to move amendments that will introduce a threshold of fuel consumption before a company pays an effective carbon price. The threshold is based on the government's 25,000 tonnes of carbon dioxide equivalent threshold that, as referred to in the government's clean energy bill. The small polluting operators should not be part of a carbon, price, carbon tax regime which is being spruiked as a big tax on polluters. On big polluters. My amendments to the Clean Energy Bill 2011 will exempt the small polluters from carbon tax, a provision that would already exist if, in the legislation if the government had held true to its promise that only big polluters would pay. These changes are necessary to ensure that this is a tax on big polluters only, and I look forward to moving these amendments later this evening. Even if the amendments are adopted, I will re be representing my electorate and state by, oppo by opposing this carbon tax. This reform is part of the government's triple assault on regional Australia, a carbon tax, a mining tax and the unfair distribution of GST returns. These are the major concerns for regional WA and I will continue to stand, take a stand on these issues. Thank you, Madam Deputy Chair. The question is that these bills be now read a second time. I call the Minister for Veterans Affairs. Thank you, um, <coughs> Madam Deputy Speaker. It's a great pleasure for me to uh, participate in this debate and I acknowledge the contribution of the member for O'Connor. <coughs> I can't say I agree with him, but nevertheless, uh, I do welcome his contribution. I do want to talk uh, briefly about my own electorate, though, uh, Madam Deputy Speaker. I won't be uh, canvassing <coughs> the idiocy of the Leader of the Opposition's position in any great detail. It's there for all to see, the, the sort of uh, blandishments which he's placed uh, around uh, his uh, arguments, whether or not he's a client, uh, science sceptic, uh, climate change sceptic one day, or believing uh, in climate change and other, we all know that uh, what he really thinks, uh, and that is he doesn't support the science. Uh, my electorate, of course, is very unique, uh, Madam Deputy Speaker. It's 1.34 million square kilometres. Uh, it's a small population covering a large area, uh, and it covers some pretty interesting country, uh, including 5,000 kilometres of mainland coastline and a further 2,000 kilometres of coastline encompassing the offshore islands. Of course, 80 per cent of the land uh, of that coastline is Aboriginal land. <coughs> uh, Lingiari's population is young, uh, and we have an enormous bounty of sunshine, clean air and open space, which we are exploiting for the purposes of alternative energy futures. Uh, because our good fortune is, it's, is easy to ignore, uh, as those choo opposite choose to do, that as a nation our emissions per person are the highest in the world. Uh, and if our emissions were saddlebags, uh, Madam Deputy Speaker, uh, we would each have to carry around the top weights of far less proportions in any contest. Scientific evidence makes it clear climate, uh, the, the climate change is real, the planet is warming and it's now time to act. Let me just give you one example of my own electorate of the Cocos Islands and why it's important. This is a coral atoll with an altitude of only three, minutes at its highest, uh, three metres at its highest point, even a small rise in sea level would see the islands disappear. This is not alarmist talk, it's reality. Yet it doesn't seem to be something which is accepted by the opposition. This is science. Projections from the CSIRO and the Bureau of Meteorology show that if we don't reduce our carbon pollution, the Northern Territory's coastline regions will experience a, th a near 30-fold increase in the number of 35 degree plus days annually by 2070. I welcome Labor's Clean Energy Future Plan. It accepts that part, carbon, that part carbon plays in our everyday life 
and incorporates its cost in our investment decisions to protect our infrastructure, our economy, our environment and indeed our way of life. It lays the groundwork uh, that will be appreciated for generations to come. It's one of those systemic changes which come, come around every now and then and if you've got the courage to seize the opportunity and to deliber deliberately make uh, changes to legislation which actually give us something significant in terms of uh, uh, the structure of our economy as this bill does, then it's something which uh, generations to come will thank us for. No thanks, of course, to the opposition. In the electorate of Lingiari, though, the clear, the clear energy, clean energy future is already making significant inroads. It's real and it is happening. My hometown of Alice Springs is on the international map in terms of solar power energy penetration into the community. Three years ago, my colleague Peter Garrett launched the Solar City project in Alice Springs. Much has been done and I don't have time to go through all the detail, but I will mention four solar power projects that are a source of great pride to those of us in Central Australia. The solar panels at the Crown Plaza Hotel, the solar panels at Alice Springs Airport, the use of solar power in the Alice Springs $16 million aquatic centre and recent, the recently opened solar farm south of the town, consisting of the largest tracking solar array in Australia, creating enough energy to power 288 homes in Alice Springs. These are significant changes. I could also mention the 400 households in Alice Springs that have had assessments and made changes to improve their energy efficiency. Environmentally, the potential for climate, cha climate change to alter the ecology of our arid regions, our tidal coastline areas and our iconic national parks is a challenge that this legislation acts to meet. The economic development of our remote regions has been a constant challenge. The legislation in front of us, and which we will pass uh, in the next 24 hours, will provide opportunity for clean energy initiative based initiatives based on our remote regions in line with Labor's renewed focus on this important, poli important policy area. You would know, Madam Deputy Speaker, that uh, the Lingiari population, there is a substantial proportion of my electors who are Aboriginal people who live in many remote communities, around 40 per cent of my electors. Lingi Lingiari therefore is home to many ab Aboriginal organisations that have an interest in or are participating in economic ecosystem service uh, or capacity building, including research and development opportunities afforded by climate change mitigation and adaption strategies. The unique and varied Indigenous land and knowledge assets across Australia can deliver many benefits to carbon projects across the country. The North Australian Indigenous Land and Sea Management uh, Organisation, NAILSMA, uh, is a bioregional forum for Indigenous land and sea managers across Northern Australia. It works hard to support practical land and sea management using stra strategic approaches to care for country with an emphasis on practical management by traditional owners across the whole of Australia's north. You only need to look at NASMA's website and be astonished by the full range of activities which they undertake. Also on the top end of the Northern Territory is the groundbreaking, groundbreaking West Arnhem Fire Management Project which has been underway for a few years now. This is a very significant and important partnership between Aboriginal traditional owners and representative organisations, Darwin liquefied natural gas and the Northern Territory Government, which has been implementing strategic fire management across 28,000 square kilometres of West Arnhem Land. Of Western Arnhem Land. This project offsets some of the greenhouse gas emissions from the ConocoPhillips liquefied natural gas project at Wickham Point in Darwin Harbour by adopting effective fire management practices. Set in what is known as the stone country to the west of Kakadu Escarpment, of the Kakadu Escarpment, the topography, environment and Aboriginal values of this country are absolutely unique. While the project aims to offset greenhouse gas emissions, it is also enabling the traditional owners to reconnect with country and undertake cultural and natural resource management in this region of unique biodiversity. Traditional owners, land management organisations, the Wadakan, the Jarwin, the Jelk, the Ajamaralan, the Mimal Rangers and uh, are working closely with non-Indigenous partners such as Bushfires NT and Tropical Savannas CRC. Using controlled dry season burn-offs to reduce the size and extent of unmanaged wildfires, the project measures the greenhouse gas offsets, a very, very important initiative. While the West Arnhem Fire Management Project is a fee-for-service arrangement in which traditional owners are paid for fire management, it points to a creative, 
cleaner energy future and is to be applauded. The process and accounting practices used to abate greenhouse emissions positions this project to take advantage of carbon, training, uh, carbon trading when it comes on stream. The Walfer project has led the way in demonstrating potential alliances between corporate Australia, government, Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal scientists and land managers. Initiatives such as the Walker project provide uh, for collaboration between governments at all levels, at all levels develop, to develop direct relationships with Aboriginal people who are landowners for their participation in climate change initiatives generally and carbon projects in particular. As recently as last week, my colleague Minister Tony Burke in announcing the collaboration between the government, Aboriginal owners of, and not-for-profit conservation sector to preserve the Fish River Estate pointed to the potential of this unique bioregion for local traditional owner participation in collaborative, collaborative clean energy initiatives. The stewardship of the Indigenous Land Corporation working with the Nature Conserva Conservancy and Pew Environmental Group will enable Aboriginal traditional owners to manage their land in an ecologically sustainable and economically responsible manner in their interests and in the interests of all Australians. I acknowledge the value of the work done and the contributions made by the ILC, Nature Conservancy and the Pew Group in showing the way forward to a future that our children and grandchildren deserve and require. And of course, in Central Australia, there's also a great deal of activity. The return of land to its traditional owners in areas such as the Simpson Desert and the Fink Gorge is providing similar opportunity for such collaboration, including the potential for carbon sequestration and other farming initiatives. <clears throat> Aboriginal ownership and interests in land can correlate neatly with the interests of all parties involved in the progressive development of a clean energy future. Labor's necessary and productive reform recognises the right of traditional owners to be central to the trade and carbon associated with reforms. In this respect, I acknowledge the work of the National Indigenous Climate Change Steering Committee and its chair, Rowan Foley. The NICC Steering Committee aims to, quote, bridge the divide between Indigenous Australia and mainstream Australia through providing a mechanism for the purchase of carbon credits with identified social, environmental and cultural benefits. Labor's clean energy policy will have such social benefits. Its, tr its transformative economic impact will be important in our remote regions, which, while also providing a necessary environmental investment. Indigenous Australians manage approximately 20 per cent of the Australian land mass. Through the Indigenous Carbon Farming Fund, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders will receive $22 million assistance over five years to participate in the Carbon Fund initiative. I welcome the establishment of the National Indigenous Climate Change Steering Committee and the dialogue they have established with the community and government in identifying Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders and organisations in carbon initiatives. For many years now, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities have been at the forefront of renewable energy generating systems. For example, Madam Deputy Speaker, in Lingiari there is work done by the Bushlight Program and the many activities of the Centre for Appropriate Technology throughout the NT, known as CAP, CAP is the acronym for Centre of Appropriate Technology. Organisations such as CAT will welcome the Remote Indigenous Energy Program that will help Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities to access clean, affordable and reliable 24-hour power supplies. Over four years, the $40 million project will assist 55 remote communities with solar panels and wind turbines and include training and power system maintenance and information to support households and communities manage their energy. Of course, uh, Madam Deputy Speaker, I'm also a minister in the health portfolio. And there are a number of important health impacts uh, from climate change. Peter Tate, Dr Peter Tate, an Alice Springs resident, has written of the negative health effects of global warming derived climate change. He quotes from Turner, Muscatello, Zeng and others who have written about the effects of heat waves, particularly high nighttime minimum temperatures on a range of conditions such as heart disease. Mays, DeMeyer and others report on the correlation between temperature and violent suicide while an article by Craig Anderson casts light on the relationship between prolonged hot weather and domestic violence. Conditions such as hay fever and asthma are similarly exacerbated. 
other factors such as humidity, the rate of change of temperature, the length of time the temperature is raised, the absolute daytime temperature and high temperatures at night all contribute to heat stress. The effects of heat are more pronounced in outdoor workers who make up a significant proportion of the mining, construction and pastoral industries in Lingiara and elsewhere across northern Australia. Rates of diarrheal disease, more common in hot conditions, are already high in the Northern Territory. It's harder to maintain fluid intake in infants in hot weather, increasing the risk of dehydration, which tragically can lead to death in the very young and the elderly. Meliodosis is known to be associated with wet weather, wet weather, more storms and flooding, even if rainfall overall is reduced. This could increase rates of meliodosis at those, in those at risk. Meliodosis has already been reported in Central Australia during exceptionally wet periods. This was previously seen to be a tropical disease. I look forward to working with corporate uh, and Aboriginal interests as Australia moves to a cleaner, environmentally responsible and an economically progressive future. The Labor Party has always been the party of reform. We show responsibility and leadership when it's required, and now is such a time. Acting now to move to a clean energy future will avoid long-term costs. I welcome the challenge and I totally support the legislation. I might say, Madam Deputy Speaker, <clears throat> as I said at the outset of my contribution, I'm bemused by the attitude of the Leader of the Opposition. He spent a year travelling around the country spreading his care campa scare campaign, making claims based on wild speculation and downright untruths. He needs to be held account for the untruths which is perpetrated on the Australian community. The Leader of the Opposition has, has, has uh, confirmed that he'll strip back the $15 billion in household assistance we have promised over four years under this legislation, unwinding our tax cuts and ripping up the pension increase we will be delivering to every single pensioner across the country. Mr Abbott believes these people do not need a helping hand and he will take that assistance from them, slug them with a higher tax bill to pay for his plan, his side of the debate, only half-hearted responses and an inability to confront the reality of climate change. The exaggerations from the other side of this chamber have been startling, but the fact is that the average price impact of the carbon pricing the this legislation will be only naught point. Time has expired. The member for Durack. Uh, thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. In light of the comments from the previous speaker, the member for Lingiari, I would remind him and the remainder of the House that the most abysmal mistruths uttered in this. Uh, place have been from the Prime Minister in relation to the fact that there will not be a carbon tax under a government I lead. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Today I rise to speak on the Clean Energy Bill 2011 and related bills. Bills, I might add, that are being rushed through Parliament by a Labor-led, Green-endorsed government, a government which quite obviously has no sense of moral obligation to the people of Australia, so rushed and cloaked in secrecy is the detail of the worst tax hit Australians will suffer in their lives, that the government only released updated modelling on the impact of the carbon tax just minutes before the commencement of the Joint Select Committee inquiry into the government's carbon tax bills. The Australian public have been misled time and time again by the leader of this government. I'm afraid the position of Prime Minister in Australia has been tarnished. Irreparable damage has been done and future Prime Ministers of Australia will bear a tainted reputation based on the legacy of the current leadership. The Prime Minister of Australia once commanded respect from children and adults alike, similar to the old-fashioned policeman. I'm sorry to say, now that respect is long gone, and with it goes another Australian tradition, that of respect for authority. It seems to me that with the Greens in bed with the government, a lot of Australian traditions are being thrown out the door, all for the sake of vocal minorities to the detriment of the majority. We heard from the Prime Minister that there will be no carbon tax under the government I lead. And then in contrast, we heard from the same Prime Minister, the best way to make polluters pay is by putting a price on carbon. So that is the policy of the government I lead. And that is the plan which is before the House now. Today we move from words to deeds. This parliament is going to get this done. There will be a price on carbon from the 1st of July 2012." End of quote. Where is the real Julia? Who is the real Julia? Australians deserve to know which Julia we are dealing with and when. This carbon tax is toxic 
and this government is toxic. As reported in the Ad Adelaide Advertiser on the 11th of July this year, people remain sceptical about the government's ability to administer such a complicated plan, which involves a myriad of reforms and assistance programs. The government does not have a good track record of administering such programs. Just witness the building and education revolution and the home insulation program. It goes on. Many of them will feel that this scheme will be little more than a huge washing machine where money swirls around and around. This government's figures on how much the scheme will cost and how the compensation package will leave householders better off appear to be a little rubbery." End of quote. These colleagues are the sentiments of constituents right across Australia, not just Adelaide, not just in the cities. This is what an entire nation is saying. In the past month, I have attended many events in my electorate of Durack. At the Minnanew Field Days, I was accosted by rusted on Labor voters. Uh, now, Mr. Speaker, uh, Madam Deputy Speaker, I have been in this game a long time. No other time during my political career have I been accosted by such rusted on Labor voters wanting to shake my hand, begging me to change the government, begging me to stop the tax. It is my duty to all constituents in Durack, those that voted me, for me and those that didn't. Uh, although, uh, Madam Deputy Speaker, uh, those that didn't at the last election may do so at the next. Uh, Madam Deputy Speaker, it's my duty to pass on the messages I received to the House. I must pass on these messages to the Prime Minister via the House because, Madam Deputy Speaker, the Prime Minister will not reply to my correspondence. On the 8th of July 2011, I sent a, pre a message a letter to the Prime Minister requesting her to visit the Durack electorate and explain the carbon tax. I even gave her a list of 25 towns to choose from. As yet, I have had no reply. It is hard to fathom how the powerhouse of the nation, Durack, is not deemed to be worth a scratch on the soles of the shiny leather shoes of Ms Gillard, further evidence of a government not listening to the people. Madam Deputy Speaker, the message to the Prime Minister from the people of Durack is this. This country has gone to rack and ruin. Have an election. Madam Deputy Speaker, that's, uh, that's, not the, mes that's the message in general context. It's not verbatim. Uh, I would have uh, suffered your admonishment had I delivered it uh, verbatim. However, I digress. I stand here today to address the Clean Energy Bill 2011, in particular the dire effects it will have on Australian industry. An example of an industry most disastrously affected is the Australian lime industry. Together, the, the, uh, the Australian lime industry production accounts for 75 per cent of the 2.1 million tonnes of the Australian demand for lime each year. The industry operates 18 facilities across all states and the Northern Territory, largely in regional areas. Lime is a versatile product extensively used in a range of applications, including the resources industry for extracting metal ores, uh, producing soda ash, uh, in agriculture as a soil conditioner, the construction industry, of course, uh, in cement, environmental applications to stabilise hazardous landfill and neut neutralise acidic wastewater, uh, to filter waste air streams and to purify drinking water. Lime production includes technology, uh, technically sophisticated high temperature processing conducted in kilns from selected sources of limestone. Australian lime produces, uh, production brings world-class technology, service industry support and offers employment in a wide range of specialised skills for operators, engineers, scientists, management and all business disciplines. The industry is working towards greater sustainability practices which share its regional industry synergies with local community issues such as the management of waste oil and other materials that the lime industry utilises as alternative fuels and raw materials. As an industry uh, that is emissions intensive and trade exposed, it is important that clean energy future legislation gives certainty by including transparent guidance and accountability. Available resources of limestone and energy in Australia lead to manufacturing of lime being suited to the economy. Loss of lime manufacturing to offshore production would result in carbon leakage and an increase 
in global greenhouse gas. We know the USA, Canada and Japan have postponed their carbon pricing schemes. We also know China and India's emissions will continue to grow significantly despite their greenhouse gas efficiency improving due to the Kyoto Protocol Annex 1 countries contributing technology and funds to carbon efficiency projects. We also know a starting price of $23 uh, per tonne of greenhouse gases is 50 per cent above the world trading price of $15 a tonne. Uh, it is a fact that the 2020 environmental benefit objective will not be met by pricing carbon. Treasury modelling shows the clean energy future addressing only 38 per cent of Australia's 2020 minus 5 per cent target, leaving 62 per cent to be sourced from purchasing international permits. Madam Deputy Speaker, I, I will repeat that. It is a fact that the 2020 environmental benefit objective will not be met by pricing carbon. Treasury model shows the clean energy future addressing only 38 per cent of Australia's 2020 minus 5 per cent target, leaving 62 per cent to be sourced from purchasing international permits. That equates in 2010 dollar terms to a cost of $57 billion in 2050 and a staggering figure of $650 billion cumulative up until that 2050 year. Billion upon billion of Australian taxpayers' dollars going into the pockets of overseas carbon credit traders. Billion upon billion of our dollars going to schemes with all the potential to be as reliable as the Nigerian tax schemes. A plan, the plan is riddled with loopholes and is open to an extent of rorting never ever before seen in Australia. Norway, Norway, Madam Deputy Speaker, hardly a third world country, has been found to be implicated in a rorted $5 billion European scheme. This carbon tax strategy will only lead to the same thing happening here in Australia only more frequently. These bills are complex and Australians are being duped. The average constituent does not understand the carbon tax, but they do understand the consequences. No worldwide reduction in emissions and a whole lot of pain for every man, woman and child in Australia. The Centre of International Economics in July 2011 revealed that the European Union Emissions Trading Scheme in the first six years collected $4.9 billion. Treasury modelling of the Australian uh, Clean Energy Future Scheme reveals that in the first six years it will ri raise $71 billion. This scheme will be the most costly carbon scheme in the world. The clean energy future policy should not apply to process emissions and as such should not apply to the production of lime. The clean energy future will cover greenhouse gas emissions from process sources in the production of lime. Sixty per cent of greenhouse gas emissions in lime production are created in the cracking of the raw materials. These emissions don't have any relevance to energy consumption or energy efficiency. Applying a price to these emissions can only be described as a tax, which cannot be abated by a price on carbon emissions. The assistant program fails to give adequate support to the lime industry as allocated permits are only applied to a portion of the process for lime manufacturing and cover only 94.5 per cent of that portion of the process for the first year, declining a further 1.3 per cent each year thereafter. The clean energy future is described in three stages to be implemented over seven years. 
In the first three comprehensive reviews by the Productiv Productivity Commission will influence the clean energy, clean energy futures direction and conditions. This places emissions intensive and trade exposed industry with no more than five years of assistance certainty and even less certainty in the scope of the overall scheme. The lime industry is capital intensive, has a long associations with its location and technology. Three to five year horizons are short term planning insufficient for business investment certainty. The clean energy future legislation in draft and without regulations nine months before the program starts has seriously jeopardised 2012 budgets for the industry and gives no time for systems to be implemented to manage the complexity and impact of the change. Lime manufacturing is imperative to the Australian resource future, which is, of course, Australia's economic future. The cost of emissions trading to the production of lime will cause a significant increase to the price and the volumes utilised in manufacture of internationally traded products and will affect the viability of downstream industries. Australian lime production could be replaced with imported product, effectively shutting production and curbing growth of a viable Australian manufacturing sector, effectively putting one more nail in the coffin of our grandchildren's future. Labor governments don't hesitate to trash our grandchildren's future. They appear to have a policy of squander the future today and to hell with tomorrow. Capital investment in lime processing will go overseas. The best we can hope for is to be increasing greenhouse emissions due to the transportation of lime to overseas kilns and an enormous increase in the cost of every cement content product. Members of the opposition would do well to contemplate the cement content of civil projects and building construction in their own electorates and the consequent reaction of their constituents to this unnecessary Labor government inflicted price hike. They say that every cloud has a silver lining, hard to find in this case, but at least Labor members that lose their seats at the next election will know why. So, Madam Deputy Speaker, the question is not whether there is such a thing as climate change. The question is, will Australia ever recover cover from the tax on weather? Will the lime industry of Australia be another statistical lemon in this Labor government's basket of rotten fruit. Madam Deputy Speaker, I absolutely oppose these bills. I thank the member. The Minister for Justice, Home Affairs, Privacy and Freedom of Information. Thanks very much, uh, Madam Deputy Speaker. Uh, I rise to support the legislation uh, before the House. Um, Mr. Speaker, uh, Madam Deputy Speaker, this House, of course, has been discussing these issues for some time, and some would say uh, for decades. Uh, and it's true to say, of course, that leaders of major political parties of have held the view, primarily, that uh, we do need a market-based approach uh, to dealing with carbon. Uh, and, of course, the former Prime Minister, John Howard, had that view. Uh, former uh, leaders of the opposition, Brendan Nelson and Malcolm Turnbull, had that view. Uh, and, of course, Prime Minister Gillard has that view and Prime Minister Rudd had that view. Uh, and, indeed, uh, of course, Tony Abbott had that view uh, when it suited him and when it suited him not to. He opposed um, the uh, market-based approach to uh, pricing carbon. And that's a, a dreadful shame for this country, uh, um, Deputy Speaker, because uh, this is fundamental reform that's required. This is the reform uh, that um, governments should be embarking upon. And, of course, fundamental reform is always made easier uh, where there is a responsible opposition taking a bipartisan approach. Sure, uh, of course, uh, checking and challenging assertions made by governments, that's entirely proper. Uh, but to turn against the facts, uh, to turn away from the science and to turn away from what is in the interest of this nation is not uh, something that, um, in my view, a responsible uh, opposition leader would do. Uh, and it's unfortunate uh, that, to that extent, uh, we're, not, uh, uh, we're not one on, on the view that uh, uh, carbon pricing is absolutely uh, critical for this country. Um, so this policy package... Uh, uh, Madam De Deputy Speaker, is based on good science, uh, good economics, uh, good administration, and I would say it's good for the nation. Uh, and I want to say a few words about each of these things. The good science tells us that we have a problem. We human beings, of which we Australians are a part, uh, we are part of the cause and we're part of the solution. The good economics, uh, the package of bills implements a tax which reflects fundamental, basic, widely accepted economic principles. Let's start at the start of that economics. 
If you let people do a bad thing like polluting and you let them do it for free, they do it too much. You've got to price the bad in this world. That's the ele elementary idea of externalities. But the carbon tax is not to be a permanent feature of the Australian fiscal landscape. This is a temporary tax designed to take us to a full market for carbon emissions. And, and Madam Deputy Speaker, that uh, unleashes a slew of powerful market forces. Market forces economising on carbon, market forces innovating. And to put it in terms that might be familiar uh, to some in this place and possibly comfortable to the opposition, this is about tax avoidance, a subject I would have thought dear to some of their hearts. This is about a tax which governments want to be avoided. This is about, Madam Deputy Speaker, this is about making sure that uh, we, wa we want the big polluters who have been having a free lunch at the expense of the rest for us for too long to be engaged with the idea of avoiding this tax by economising and innovating. So this is not something, this is not an impost for the sake of placing an impost uh, on uh, large polluters. This is about changing the dynamics of our economy uh, and ensuring fundamental restructuring uh, takes place. So the economics um, underlying this tax is very simple indeed. If you let the market rip and don't price pollution, you get too much of it. You get way too much of it. If you price pollution in the right way, then let the market rip, market forces are ignited to produce less pollution. And that's the fundamental essence of a market-based approach, and that's why economists uh, across the country, indeed around the world, would argue that the most efficient means uh, to uh, deal with carbon emissions is a market-based approach. Um, and I would argue um, that's indeed what the government's doing with the legislation uh, uh, it's, that's before the House. But of course, uh, if, you attack, if you attack pollution in the wrong way, the way in which I would argue the opposition is proposing, uh, this week at least, um, big polluters are better off and householders are much worse off. If you price pollution in a better way, householders on average are no worse off. And indeed, if you price pollution in the best way, our way, the way that's been proposed by the government, uh, householders are overcompensated. Now, Mr. And now, Madam Deputy Speaker, the government has recognised that it is, um, it is important that we get um, this, this, um, this, these fundamentals right. But as I say, of all the leaders of major parties in the last decade, Tony Abbott is the only leader uh, to argue against the science, uh, to argue against the economics of a market-based approach. And, Madam Deputy Speaker, that, uh, uh, of course, is fundamentally a, a, a concern for this country, uh, because in the end um, we will be judged uh, in years to come about where we stood on a fundamental reform for our economy uh, and, indeed, for dealing with environmental challenges uh, like uh, carbon emissions. And I do believe uh, this government, like Labor governments before, before it, um, are on the right side of history. Uh, indeed, we were on the right side of history when we enacted the compulsory superannuation legislation opposed by those opposite. <coughs> we were, of course, on the right side of history when we supported the principle of un universal health coverage and introduced Medibank and then ultimately Medicare, when, of course, the opposition opposed uh, that, that approach to providing health services to citizens of this country. Uh, and, of course, um, uh, they appear on this occasion again to be on the wrong side of history uh, by opposing the most efficient means uh, to reduce carbon uh, in our economy. And whilst I do uh, uh, allude to those areas of public policy, I guess it's not entirely surprising <coughs> that a coalition uh, opposition uh, would oppose superannuation for working people. They're not enamoured uh, with supporting working people, uh, and they certainly haven't been one to believe in the public health system uh, for ordinary punters in this country. <coughs> but the one area I have to say I'm completely confounded by uh, in their opposition is indeed opposing a market-based approach. Because the one brand, the one element, I thought, the one essence of what was supposed to be the Liberal Party, uh, Madam uh, Deputy Speaker, was in fact that they believed the market was the best mechanism uh, to deal with fundamental reform. And it seems to me, uh, in order to um, be opportunistic uh, and indeed to put politics ahead of policy, they have chosen, that is, the Leader of the Opposition, Tony Abbott in particular, uh, has chosen to turn on uh, its head Liberal Party philosophy, 
to turn their back against market, a market-based approach, uh, to turn their back on the, the, the wisdom and counsel of, uh, of economists and scientists, <coughs> excuse me, and to support a view that actually um, is uh, inefficient, to support um, funding polluters <coughs> at the expense of householders and indeed to have the most efficient, inefficient means uh, to bring about reform in this area. And that is a, a shame uh, and indeed for that reason, uh, uh, Madam Deputy Speaker, uh, I support the legislation and, uh, uh, and of course uh, call upon this House to pass the legislation as soon as possible. The member for North Sydney. Thanks very much, Madam Deputy Speaker. Uh, I oppose this package of legislation which introduces a carbon tax because it's not the right plan for Australia. It's not the right plan for Australian households and it's not the right plan for Australian businesses. In the absence of agreed international action, we are placing enormous pressure on the Australian economy for little gain. Without agreed, consistent and measurable international action, this legislation takes Australia out on a limb. To oppose this legislation is not to oppose the science of climate change. That's the Labor Party spin. I do not and have never denied the science and support of recognition of climate change. I am not a scientist nor am I an expert on climate change but I must make my decisions based on the best interests of the community. As a legislator, I aim to make decisions based on the best available evidence and advice. I believe on the evidence available that our climate is changing. I believe on the evidence available that human behaviour does contribute to climate change. And I believe on the evidence available that reducing carbon dioxide emissions will slow down the pace at which the climate is changing. And I have held these views consistently for more than 10 years now on the public record. The Coalition is committed to the same carbon reduction goals as the Government. We are committed to reducing Australia's greenhouse gas emissions by 5 per cent, below 2,000 levels by the end of 2020. Where we differ from the Government is in the mechanism for achieving those goals. As a Liberal, I believe that markets are the best pricing mechanisms for commodities. I was a strong supporter of an emissions trading scheme up to the disaster at Copenhagen in December 2009. At that conference, despite the predictions of the government, there was no binding global agreement for climate change action. And with no global scheme in place, it no longer made sense for Australia to unilaterally commit uh, to an emissions trading scheme. There is no global market for carbon trading. There is no transparent, liquid or accountable market for carbon dioxide trading. And in this light, I do not believe that a new tax which will increase the price of everyday goods in Australia is the right solution for our country. There is a better way. The Coalition's Direct Action Plan tackles the challenge of human-generated carbon dioxide emissions at its source, it provides incentives for emitters to do the right thing and to find less carbon intensive ways of doing business. And I note at this point that a large part of the government's own package is in fact direct action. So it, uh, it rankles somewhat when they suggest that direct action won't work when they are literally committing more than $10 billion to direct action. Our solution does not impose additional costs on households because we've identified the savings to pay for our capped plan. Our solution does not penalise Australian industries and drive investment and jobs overseas. The government's plan is a very expensive tax churn. New taxes over the forward estimates rake in $27.3 billion. All of this money and more is spent, with the budget bottom line worse off by $4.1 billion over the current estimates. The Treasurer has not explained how this carbon hole in the budget will be financed but it's a safe bet that he will put it on the national credit card and increase the deficit. The hole, of course, is already getting bigger. Where carbon tax costs are not borne by the federal government, other governments will have to pay. And it's, of course, the same taxpayers, whether the federal taxpayers or state taxpayers. 
For example, New South Wales has now announced that we'll be looking to offset the expected cost to their budget of the introduction of the carbon tax, which will be around $900 million or more over the forward estimates. This will be done by increasing mining royalties paid by companies subject to the proposed uh, mining resources rent tax. This will capitalise on the Commonwealth's commitment to reimburse companies for the state royalty liabilities. And that is before uh, the federal government, in addition to its original commitment of over $31 billion, uh, still pours another $10 billion of debt into the Clean Energy Finance Corporation, dubbed the Gillard Bank. The government's carbon tax scheme creates a structural hole in the budget. Revenues beyond the forward estimates are highly uncertain and volatile as they rely on an international price for carbon. There is no way of predicting what that will be or whether it will occur. In contrast, the cost of compensation will rise steadily through time. That compounds the structural fragility stemming from the mining tax. The Coalition's direct action policies are just as effective at achieving Australia's carbon reduction goals, but at much less cost. The cost is known, $3.2 billion over the forward estimates. It's fully funded, as I said, through budget savings, not more taxes and more debt. There is no structural hole because there is no tax churn, with escalating compensation funded by uncertain and volatile revenues. The coalition policy provides business and the community with financial certainty and stability that they need, and with the added assurance that the government budget will remain in the black. The modelling of the impacts on the macro economy was originally based on a carbon price of $20 per tonne, not the starting price of $23 per tonne. Revised modelling, which most members haven't been able to comment on, given it was released well after this debate occurred, has now been um, released by the government using the correct starting price. The big surprise in the modelling is that there is no change in the key economic forecasts. Apparently, a 15 per cent increase in the starting carbon price has no effect on the economy. I find that very hard to believe. But there's an even stranger finding. The government wants us to believe that introducing carbon tax will have no impact on jobs. There is a statement in the modelling, and I quote, Employment continues to grow strongly, with national employment increasing by 1.6 million jobs by 2020, with or without carbon pricing. Apparently, all of the workers in those trade-exposed industries and those carbon-intensive industries will magically and immediately find new green jobs. Obviously, the final modelling is still not complete. It does not include the Clean Energy Finance Corporation because the government is yet to finalise consultation with key stakeholders about how the corporation will operate. So the effect of the debt finance $10 billion Gillard Carbon Bank is left out of the modelling. The modelling does not include policies that provide investment and innovation grants, such as the $3.2 billion Australian Renewable Energy Agency or the $1.2 billion Clean Energy Technology Program, or the $300 million Steel Transformation Plan. The Carbon Farming Future Fund and the Biodiversity Fund are also not modelled. These programs are omitted from the modelling because their, quote, investment and behaviour is difficult to predict. Well, that's just great. These are expensive programs. The government does not know whether they will achieve their objectives. But they are ploughing ahead regardless of spending taxpayers' money, which is typical of Labor. The modelling also does not include the planned closure of 2,000 megawatts of electricity generation capacity of the most emission-intensive power plants. The modelling still assumes other countries also act to mitigate climate change in marked contrast to the real situation where the United States, for example, and many other countries are moving away from economy-wide schemes. Overall, there remain significant holes in the modelling of the carbon tax package and significant doubt about the veracity of the findings. The Coalition is not convinced, and more importantly, the Australian people are not convinced. The imposition of a carbon price is not without economic cost. The modelling concedes that GDP and real average incomes will grow less with a carbon tax. There will be significant impacts on the mix of industries. Mining will be smaller, with big hits on coal, gas and non-ferrous ore. Manufacturing of aluminium, alumina and iron and steel will also be significantly impacted. 
The new modelling confirms that consumer prices will be 0.7 per cent. Consumer prices will rise by 0.7 per cent in 2012-13, a second increase of 0.2 per cent the following uh, year until 2015-16. The new modelling also confirms that electricity prices will rise by 10 per cent in the first year, but that's not the end of the story. There will be a further increase in electricity costs of 8 per cent by 2022, with another 35 per cent out to 2050. So the carbon tax will lift electricity prices by at least a cumulative 50 per cent. This is on top of the already inflated impact of renewable energy costs on electricity prices. The Productivity Commission in June 2011 estimated Australians are already paying a subsidy equivalent of up to $694 a tonne for existing emission reduction policies. And in the case of large-scale renewable energy initiatives, the implicit abatement subsidy is up to $111 a tonne. This is an enormous amount of money that's already being spent and it flows through to electricity bills. The Coalition does not believe it makes any sense to introduce a carbon tax which will add to the burden of household budgets. Uh, and they're already under some pressure. Headline inflation was up 3.6 per cent over the past year, the highest rate in two and a half years. Interest rates have continued to increase uh, on seven occasions over the past two years. The government has increased or introduced 19 new taxes. The flood levy commenced on the 1st of July this year. The mining and carbon tax are both scheduled to hit from the 1st of July next year. And of course, uh, consumer confidence is weak, growth in retail spending is soft, dwelling construction approvals are comparatively low, house prices are down with established house prices falling in three out of the last four quarters, demand for credit is weak, household borrowing for ha uh, housing rising at the slowest pace in a generation, and the household savings ratio is close to generational highs as Australians cocoon concerned about uh, the uncertain outlook. And of course, the government has taken a very inconsistent approach to this despite their rhetoric. They've had a range of different views on emissions trading schemes, none more obvious than the Prime Minister and the Treasurer emphatically stating before the last election there would be no carbon tax, or in the case of the Treasurer, that it was a fanciful suggestion. And of course, this reflects their inconsistent policy across a range of areas mining tax, large live cattle exports, budget surpluses and so on. It's no wonder that the Aki business conditions in the June quarter were down to levels not seen since the survey began in 1998. Every business in the Australian supply chain will be affected by the carbon tax. The more manufactured a product is, the larger the energy component will be and the larger the impact of the carbon tax will be on the end price of the product. Some industries will receive partial compensation. This is a short-term fix. Businesses across a range of sectors must now be reconsidering future investment. The Treasurer has claimed that a feature of the compensation measures accompanying carbon tax will be increasing the tax-free threshold from $6,000 to $18,200. This claim, of course, is an exaggeration, as so much else is from the Treasurer. The tax changes are being accompanied by phasing down the low-income tax offset. The effective tax three threshold this financial year is in fact $16,000 when the income of Lido is taken into account. Uh, and of course another issue is that the legislative design of the tax makes carbon units a form of personal property. Any future action to repeal the legislation may well uh, amount to uh, forced acquisition of the units. Uh, the government of the day may be liable to compensate the holder for the value of the units. And this is an attempt by the government to put in place a poison pill, uh, should there be any attempt by this parliament to repeal the legislation. I warn the government that this is a bad idea. If the government thinks it can continue to defy, defy public opinion for all time in relation to this matter, then the Labor Party will suffer a generational fall in its support base. Both the Treasurer and the Prime Minister together with the whole Labor Party, are responsible for this tax. They refused uh, to announce a carbon tax before the election. They denied it was in place. Now they refuse to seek a mandate for a carbon tax at the next election. And they are making it more difficult 
to repeal the legislation, which, as I said, defies the will of the Australian people. The Coalition will not be deterred. We remain committed to rescind the tax when we are returned to government. Madam Deputy Speaker, the curse of the modern Labor Party is that it chooses to govern for Balmain rather than Bankstown. Given that this tax will leave Australians worse off without making any discernible difference to climate change, makes this tax the most compelling evidence of a party and a government that has clearly lost its way. The member for Chisholm. Madam Deputy Speaker, I rise to support the Clean Energy Bill 2011. The Labor government accepts the consensus among climate science that climate change is real. Climate change has been called the greatest moral, moral challenge of our time. It is also the greatest economic challenge of our time, and it will affect society, and it will affect societies most vulnerable. And we need to take action now before it's too late. Indeed, some would argue that we've actually missed the tipping point where action should be taken. As Tim Costello has said previously, the poorest countries are already in those parts of the world most exposed to climate change. In these countries, the poorest are, divide, are driven to live in vulnerable circumstances. Tenure is fragile. These families get the crumbling riverbanks or a steep hillside, unproductive land or, pl or floodplains. So the impact of wild weather is worst in the poorest company, country, communities. The government understands this. Labor members understand this, and that human action has contributed to the causes and the consequences of this climate action and the resultant changes in our environment. And we must do something to act, not just now, but into the future, not just for people in Australia, but for people around the world. To have an argument that somehow families in you know, my electorate are going to be paying and are going to be worse off because of this, and therefore we should not do it, defies logic and does not look at the impact that we are causing to those most vulnerable in our community throughout the globe. As a government, we understand that climate change is the greatest economic challenge of our time, and that is why we are introducing a sensible raft of legislation. And I support the introduction of this legislation into the House today. The science is in. All major parties accept the science of global warming and that human activity is contributing to climate change. As Professor Ian Chubb, the Chief Scientist for Australia, said during the recent Joint Select Committee on the clean energy bills. The latest information I have seen shows that the CO2 levels are high and the rate of accumulation accelerating. The science who studied this would argue that it is getting to the point where something has to be done quickly in order to cap them at least and to start to have them decrease over a sen sensible period of time. You could easily argue that it is urgent and that something needs to be done because of the high levels presently and the accelerated accumulation presently. We do not, we need to do something. The level of debate around these bills has been hysterical, and I mean hysterical. I accept that individuals have different points of view. I accept that we can have rational debates. I can reflect and agree to disagree with individuals. But people like Frank Johnston, who've sent me a death threat in bold capital red letters today, is beyond the pale. It doesn't add to this debate. It doesn't help the debate. And when he sent the other emails the other day that my 12-year-old opened, it's just not on. Let's have a sensible debate. We can have differing of opinions, but let's actually have a debate on fact and not hysteria. Let's actually look at the science and the information in front of us. Everybody's agreed. Both sides of the chamber have agreed on a target. We're just actually coming at it from different angles. And I really would request the community out there to try and actually have respect for those points of view. I will respect their point of view. I might agree with it, and I might be doing something that they don't like today. But I actually do reflect the majority of my constituency who have actually emailed me saying, stay firm, pass the legislation. We believe something needs to be done now. During the course of the inquiry into the clean energy bills, we did explore many of the issues, many of the concerns that individuals had, and we received a lot of correspondence for individuals, and I want to thank them for taking the time to send us that information. We didn't ignore it. We read it. We analysed it. A lot of the information has gone to the issue about the legitimacy of the legislation. And the report quotes the Prime Minister, Julia Gillard, earlier this year when she said on Q&A, now, I did say during the last election campaign, I promised there will be no carbon tax. That's true, and I've walked away from the commitment. I'm not going to try and pretend anything else. 
They also said to the Australian people in the last election campaign that we needed to act on climate change. We needed to price carbon. I wanted to see an emissions trading scheme. Then we had the election, and 17 days that were, and we formed this minority government. Now, if I'd been leading a majority government, I'd be getting on with an emissions trading scheme. It's what I promised the Australian people. As it is, in this minority government, the only way I can act on climate change by pricing carbon is to work with others. And so I had a really stark choice. Do I act or do not act? Well, I've chosen to act, and we will have a fixed price, like in carbon tax for a period, and then to get exactly what I promised the Australian people, an emissions trading scheme. Interestingly enough, back in October 2005, the then opposition leader as the Minister of Health also said on a, uh, another program, when in answer to Laurie Oakes said, well, Laurie, when I made this statement in the election campaign, I had not the slightest inkling that there would ever be intention to change this. But obviously, when circumstances change, government do change their opinions, and that is actually the responsible course of actions. Things change. Needs arises to change, and the government has done that. At the end of the day, we are introducing an admissions trading scheme, and that is what we promised the parliament, the, the community we would do for a long time. The debate that somehow this has been forced upon us in a great rush is absolutely, again, hysterical. I was actually shown a leaflet uh, by the then opposition leader, Andrew Peacock, back in the 1990 election when he promised action on climate change, when he looked at a 20 per cent reduction in climate levels back in 1990. This is not a new debate. It is not something that has just been forced upon us. It is not something that's come out of the, you know, the Labor-Green alliance and the, uh, the doom and gloom out there. This is something that's real and needs action. I've taken an active interest in the science of climate change and absolutely no doubt that our planet is warming. In May this year, the Climate Commission released a report called The Critical Decade, which provided strongest evidence of facts. It showed global temperatures are rising faster than ever before, with the last decade being the hottest on record. In the last 50 years, the number of hot days in Australia has more than doubled. Sea levels have risen by 20 centimetres globally since the 1880s, impacting many coastal communities. Another 20 centimetres rise by 2050, which, as scientists warns, is likely on climate, current climate change predictions, with more than double the risk of coastal flooding. The Great Barrier Reef has suffered from nine major bleaching events in the past 31 years, where it's previously had experienced none. And it's now beyond reasonable doubt that excessive carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is caused mainly through the burning of fossil fuels is what triggering the changes we are currently seeing in the climate. In the report, the science swarm that a rise of more than two degrees Celsius in global temperature will result in dangerous climate change, with more intense weather events through droughts, flooding and cyclones. CSIRO, the Bureau of Meteorology and the Academy of Science have, from around the world have all advised the world is warming and the high levels of carbon pollution risk environmental and economic damage. In Australia and across the globe, 2001-2010 was the warmest decade on record. Each decade in Australia since the 90s format 40s has been warmer than the last. Australia faces significant environmental and economic costs in a warmer, more unsustainable, unsus unstable climate. Climate scientists advise extreme weather events such as drought, heat waves, and bushfires are likely to become more frequent and severe. This threatens our home, business, communities, industries, agriculture, indeed, our way of life. For example, the recent Climate Change Risk to Australian Coast report found as many as 247,000 existing residential builder, buildings valued up to $63 billion are potentially at risk from a one-point metre sea level rise. I don't know why people somehow feel that this is inadequate or it's unconclusive or it's, it's controversial. These are reports, this is modelling. Yes, it is modelling. We can only model and predict and see what will happen into the future. When there was issues around the uh, depletion of the ozone layer, the same debate raged about why should we actually do something on the depletion of the ozone layer? Why should we as Australia do anything? But as Australia's approach to climate change needs to be similar to the phase out of chlorofarbs, chlorofarb, chloro high carbohydrates, CFCs. CFCs phased out we were phased out by 1995. And as a result, the first country, Australia was one of the first countries to ratify the pre uh, Montreal Protocol. Australia continues to be a leader in the phase out of ozone depleting substances. 
But at the time, there was this huge argument that no woman in Australia would be able to style her hair ever again because you weren't going to be able to use hairspray. No industry would be able to go on because we couldn't use CFCs. There's still being CFCs used and we need to be actually doing more to reduce them. But again, the sky was going to fall in. We were all going to be you know, shut down, turned off if we didn't do something about it when we reduced lead from petrol because there was a demonstrated causational link between lead in petrol and brain damage in children, the world again said, we must do something. Again, the sky was going to fall in, no car was ever going to be able to run again, unleaded petrol would be the end of the automotive industry in Australia, but we acted, we did something, we changed, and the world has not caved in. In my opinion, the evidence for climate change is overwhelming and conclusive. Take into account the fact that we in Australia have contributed to global warming above and beyond our fair share. It is incumbent on us to act as a reasonable international citizen and contribute to a solution. Science agrees the worst effect of climate change can largely be avoided if we reduce carbon pollution to an acceptable level. Australia has an opportunity to move to a clean energy future and cut pollution before that task becomes more difficult and costly. Indeed, Climate Works Australia, which I am on the board of, has put out some interesting modelling and some interesting predictions and warned that each year of delay would mean more opportunities are lost to become harder and more expensive to catch up. Climate Works previous research has found that delaying action on climate change to 2015 would increase the cost of business and household by $5.5 billion to reach Australia's 5 per cent of reduction target in 2020. We need to act. The other argument is that we're acting alone. We're, we're, you know, we're racing ahead. A recent article um, by Andrew Morton in The Age um, last month said, as Australia's major political parties squabbled last week over whether an MP should be granted leave from a vote on carbon price laws to witness the birth of his first child, arguably more serious statements about the future of carbon policy were being made overseas. In China, the world's largest emitter of carbon dioxide and a country often painted as indifferent to climate change policy, the State Council announced individual targets for, for provinces and cities that would require them to cut the amount of energy used to run their economies. Other countries are acting. They're acting ahead of us. They're doing things. We are lagging behind and we're missing the opportunities. We're actually missing the business opportunities and the, re and the research dollars and research opportunities in renewable energies. Part of the bills goes not just to the price on carbon, but the action around ensuring that individuals are not impacted, are not made worse off, and there will be a huge household uh, package in there. But it's also around direct action, uh, government investment in clean energy. And the federal government is investing billions in low emission technology and providing support for Australian households to become more energy efficient. A new $10 billion commercial orientated clean energy finance corporation will invest in renewable energy, low pollution energy efficient technologies. A new Australian Renewable Energy Agency will administer $3.2 billion in government support for research and development, demonstrating commercialisation of renewable energy. The renewable energy target, combined with other elements of the government's act plan, including the current price, will drive $20 billion investment in large scale renewable energies by 2020 in today's dollars. We know that we can reduce carbon pollution to ensure our children and grandchildren have a future, but our economy also has a future. Listening to some of the debates from the other side has been quite fascinating, and they've uh, been talking a lot about what's going to happen. And it's a kind of constant negativity that's completely overtaken the coalition, constantly talking your comment down and using every opportunity to scaremonger workers of Australia. It's time we looked at the facts. We've created nearly 750,000 jobs since we came to office and one of the lowest employment rates in the developed world. When it comes to a price on carbon, we're providing 9.2 billion jobs package to support workers in emission-intensive trade-exposed industries. And as the Treasury modelling shows, jobs will grow strongly under a carbon price, with national employment expected to increase by 1.6 million jobs to 2020 and a further 4.4 million to 2050. Those opposites stick in their hand in the sand and refuse to open their minds to the investment employment opportunities a carbon price will actually provide. Some members, like the member for Menzies in the debate, even said the notion of a green job is mythical. And whilst the member for Groom said last week that all new green jobs will go overseas. This directly contradicts their own direct action plans, which says, and I quote at page 17, the coalition recognises the potential for clean energy to underpin future employment growth in key regional areas. No, no, it is contradictory to their own policies and contradiction to the evidence already out there and more that we heard during the clean energy uh, bill's inquiry. 
like at MacArthur Wind Farm in Victoria that will create 900 jobs during construction, the woodland the Woodland Wind Farm in New South Wales that will create 150 jobs during construction, the solar farm in New South Wales that will create another 50 jobs, just to mention a few. These projects and many like them will provide billions of dollars in new investment, thousands of new jobs, as well as help us transition to a low carbon future. The race is on for clean energy jobs and investment in the future, and we want to be in a position in our economy to take advantage of that. In my own electorate, I'm seeing this, the CRO, CSIRO plant at Clayton where many jobs in this industry, at Monash University, in the Monash Sustainability Institute, individuals are taking action. They see the need for change. We as a government see the need to change. I've held two forums on climate change. One was organised by a group called Lighter Footprints. It had 300 people in a hall. All of them accepted the need for change. Actually, most of them were fairly angry we weren't going far enough. I held another one in my electorate with Alan Pearce from RMIT and Dr Beck Paris. I want to thank them from Monash Uni who gave a great presentation that it was accepted by everybody in the room. It's time to act and stop putting our heads in the sand. The member's time has expired. The member for Casey. Thank you very, very much, uh, Madam Deputy Speaker. We're here, of course, to debate 19 bills of betrayal, bills of betrayal that represent the triumph of political vice over policy virtue, bills of betrayal that sacrifice the prosperity of the Australian people at the altar of the Prime Minister's personal survival in her job. Madam Deputy Speaker, everyone in this House knows that this government is in extremis. Everyone in this House is asking the same question, particularly those opposite, in relation to the Prime Minister's standing in the opinion polls. And that question is how low can things go? And you'd think that in such a circumstance the Prime Minister would observe the basic lesson of politics that when you're, when you're in a hole, stop digging. But no, there she is, shovel in hand, burrowing ever deeper. But Madam Deputy Speaker, the political fortunes of the Prime Minister are a matter for her. That's her business. Of much greater concern is the fact that this misbegotten tax will bury the economic fortunes of Australian families and small business. Every Australian household will be whacked by this tax a hundred times a day. They'll be whacked every time they turn on a light. They'll be whacked every time their kids turn on the Xbox. They'll be whacked every time they go to the pub or the footy. Earlier this year on Radio MTR in Melbourne, uh, the station indulged in a bit of satire that would have been hilarious if it wasn't so tragic. They adapted the famous song by Sting to the carbon tax debate. And their adapted words, Madam Deputy Speaker, were every breath you take, every cent you make, with every promise they break, there'll be no escape, she'll be taxing you. Every single day, more and more you pay, carbon tax you obey, it's the Labor way, she'll be taxing you. Now, for satire to be successful, of course, it must be anchored in truth. And, Madam Deputy Speaker, truer words than those have never been spoken. Of course, the Prime Minister has promised uphill and down dale that the compensation scheme will leave nine out of ten Australian families better off. Really? Does anyone really believe a government that couldn't deliver a simple home insulation program can insulate Australian families from the impact of a carbon tax that will reach into the wallets of Australian families every minute of every day, of every month, of every year, once these bills are passed. Madam Deputy Speaker, my kids aren't present in the gallery, and you'll be pleased to know at their young age they don't yet read Hansard. So I can let you in on a secret that there is no Santa Claus, yet I worry that some on the other side of this House still believe old Saint Nick exists. So I feel compelled to inform the idealist opposite that there's no magic solution to render their scheme painless. And that's because their carbon tax is intended to modify behaviour through premeditation, premeditated economic pain. And you don't need to take our word for it on this side of the House. The Prime Minister said as much in February uh, when she declared that the very point of pricing carbon was to have that effect. This tax will drive up the price of energy. It's intended to. 
Electricity bills paid by Australian families and business will spike by at least 10 per cent. Gas prices will climb by 9 per cent, and that's just in the first year alone. But it's not just household budgets that will take a hit, Madam Deputy Speaker. You don't need to be a Nobel Prize winning economist to figure out that the basic impacts of the carbon tax on businesses throughout Australia will be significant. If you raise business operating costs, you kill jobs. If you raise business operating costs, you hinder the ability of Australian firms to compete overseas. It will mean that businesses will hire less and lay off more. And in some instances, those increased prices will be enough to push companies over the edge. Some shops will close. Some factories will go belly up. Throughout Australia, this tax will trigger a giant sucking sound of jobs being siphoned offshore. Offshore to places where foreign governments are smart enough not to engage in standalone economic masochism. This Prime Minister obviously thinks that she's the political equivalent of Star Trek's Captain Kirk. She thinks she's boldly going where no government's gone before. But as we know, there's a fine line between boldlessness and complete recklessness, Madam Deputy Speaker, and the Prime Minister is acting like the proverbial fool rushing in where angels and every other advanced national economy fear to tread. In the United States, the Obama administration couldn't pass the Waxman-Markey Emissions Trading Scheme Bill, even when the Democrats controlled both houses of Congress. But wait, in answer to a question in question time, the Minister for Climate Change seized upon California as a shining example for emissions trading. Now, I know fiscal know-how isn't exactly this government's strong suit, but someone needs to let the minister know that America's so-called golden state isn't so golden after all. California has an unemployment rate of 12 per cent and a state budget deficit of US $26 billion. Is that really an example the minister is seeking to emulate? And then, of course, there's China, so often heralded by the minister as an inspiring model of carbon correctus. Yet documents obtained by the Institute of Public Affairs show that the government's claims about China's higher carbon tax levels are bogus. In reality, China's carbon price is about three quarters of what the government intends to impose on Australia against the public's will. And you don't need to take my word for it. You don't even take, need to take the word of a member of this side of the House for it, because this past April, former Keating government minister Gary Johns penned a piece for The Australian entitled Dodgy Figures, Wrong Questions, Plague Debate. And in his article, Johns wrote, the Chinese must think Gillard a fool. Vivid Economics, which did the study on which the government's claims were based, has been colourful with its analysis, he said. They wildly overstate and wildly understate Australia's implicit carbon price. End of quote. Madam De Mr Deputy Speaker, for every older coal-fired plant shut down in China over the past three years, two new ones have been built. And as a result, Chinese coal consumption has increased 17 per cent per year over the same period. After all, who does the Prime Minister think is buying our coal and what does she think they're doing with it? Mr Deputy Speaker, the misleading and deceptive campaign waged by this government gives new meaning to that famous quip by Mark Twain, there are three kind of lies, lies, damn lies and statistics. But this habit of playing fast and loose with the truth isn't limited to dodgy data about China's carbon price. We all recall the prime, how the Prime Minister heavied the member for Griffith into postponing his emissions trading scheme after the shambolic Copenhagen climate conference collapsed in disarray. We all recall how the Prime Minister then moved seamlessly from procrastination to prevarication, from out overt delay to outright deception. And we all recall how this Prime Minister gazed into the television cameras during last year's federal election campaign and vowed to the Australian public there will be no carbon tax under the government I lead. But when the Prime Minister needed to seal the deal for political support with the Greens, she threw her no carbon tax promise overboard, and her personal credibility went over the side as well. And then there's last year's palace coup. 
only weeks before presiding over the political defenestration of the member for Griffith. This Prime Minister assured us that there was more chance of her becoming full forward for the Western Bulldogs than challenging for the Labor leadership and Prime Ministership. Well, Mr Deputy Speaker, it is a supreme irony, isn't it, that the Prime Minister probably does have a greater chance of becoming full forward of the Western Bulldogs than of remaining Prime Minister till the next election. With the legislation currently before this House, we have a discredited Prime Minister leading a discredited government to impose a discredited carbon tax on and disinclined Australian people. Mr Deputy Speaker, if the Prime Minister told the parliament the sun was shining, members would be forgiven for ringing the Bureau of Meteorology for a second opinion. The late great Ronald Reagan once said that his guiding principle when negotiating with the Soviets was to trust but verify. In this case, a slight adaptation of that adage is required, because this Prime Minister's history is so full of backflips, U-turns, broken promises and shattered political promises. The track record is so full of cheat and retreat that the only healthy attitude one can take is to distrust and double-check again and again. And that's why I cast such a jaundiced eye on the Prime Minister's promises of a clean, green, renewable energy future funded by the revenue of her carbon tax she promised would never occur under the government she led. In his speech on this bill, the Leader of the Opposition noted a United Kingdom study released in March this year that found that the cost of every job created in the renewable energy sector for every, the cost of every job created in the renewable energy sector, 3.7 existing jobs were lost. And he went on uh, to make that point in great detail. Mr Deputy Speaker, the true believers on the other side of this debate are afflicted by a curious mix of economic ignorance and messianic zeal. They're peddling pixie dust policies of wishful thinking and utopian dreaming. And for the Australian public, it is a toxic combination. But the only thing in which this Prime Minister clearly, truly believes is her own personal aggrandisement. This Prime Minister is willing to do any deal, bend in any direction, assume any political position in order to eke out her political survival. This legislation is pure political calculation designed to purchase green support upon which her government depends. In the final equation, Mr Deputy Speaker, the carbon tax is just, for this Prime Minister, the cost of doing business with Senator Bob Brown. This is an exercise in cynicism and should be contrasted with the Coalition's Common Sense Direct Action Program. Our Direct Action Plan will lower Australians' carbon emissions by the same 5 per cent that the government claims, and without blowing a gaping hole in the bottom line of Australian businesses and household budgets of Australian families. The Leader of the Opposition articulated this in his speech when the, when the debate on these bills began, when he said there's a much better way to reduce emissions, and the better way to reduce emissions is to work with the grain of the Australian people and to further encourage the intelligent and sensible things that Australians and Australian enterprises are doing now to reduce emissions. Mr Deputy Speaker, the Prime Minister tried to claim in the, in the debate on these bills that history will vindicate her. She asked members to think of being on the right side of history. Well, Mr Deputy Speaker, I'm in no mood to be lectured by a Julia come lately on economic reform. During the 1980s and 1980s, the Prime Minister was, of course, a rising star in Labor's political firmament. As president of the Australian Union Students and later as a leading light in the socialist left faction, she certainly had the power of Labor's pulpit. Yet I don't recall her voicing support at that time for the hawk keating free market reforms that received bipartisan support from the coalition. And given her past socialist leanings, I'd be astonished to discover that all along she's been a closet devotee of Milton Friedman. Mr Deputy Speaker, the Prime Minister's audacious claim to history 
rings hollow and rings hollow to all that heard it because her own political history is so hollow. At the last election, nearly 84 per cent of voters cast their ballots for parties that were opposed to a carbon tax. This Prime Minister has no mandate to impose this carbon tax. And if the Prime Minister truly believed that a carbon tax is the way to go, the Prime Minister would do what John Howe did with the goods and services tax, and that show the courage of her convictions and seek the assent and the permission of the Australian people at the ballot box. Mm. Mr Deputy Speaker, the fact that this Prime Minister has not and will not really reveals her devious nature on this important policy before the parliament today. Mr Deputy Speaker, the Australian people were made a promise before the last election by this Prime Minister. This Prime Minister deliberately broke that promise. Order. The honourable member will withdraw um, the, uh, the accusation of deliberately misleading. The Prime withdraw is deliberately misleading. Yes, you I can't withdraw, say it's I, 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 I withdraw, Mr. Speaker, in deference to you. The honourable member's time has expired. The question is that these bills be now read a second time. I call the honourable the Assistant Treasurer and Minister for Financial Services and Superannuation. Thank you, Thank you uh, Mr. Speaker. This clean energy legislation is a debate about hanging on to the status quo or energetically reaching out to shape the change which is happening in our society and our economy. The debate between the government and the opposition is a debate between new versus old, between progressive hope versus conservative instinct, whether or not we should be optimistic about what is ahead of us or we should have a fear of the future. And indeed, it's been far too often about scientific facts combating political fiction. And make no mistake, we in Australia cannot afford to surrender to those who preach the false promise that Australia does not need to change. Let us for a moment consider what our nation would have looked and felt like today had the superannuation savings vision of former Prime Minister Keating and Bill Kelty not been realised two and a half decades ago. Had Medibank, which has become Medicare, not been delivered in the 1970s? Had the Snowy Mountain Scheme not been rolled out under Sir William Hudson after the war? Had, in fact, the Harbour Bridge not have been started construction in the 1920s? Now, Australians haven't always found change easy. Francis Greenway, the famous colonial architect, suggested the Harbour Bridge to Governor Macquarie in 1815, and we finished it in the 1930s. And I would suggest that we have in fact been debating climate change and what to do in response to it since the 1980s. Former Prime Minister Thatcher spoke about it. Former Prime Minister Hawke spoke about it. Former Prime Minister Howard has spoken about it and indeed proposed an emissions trading scheme, much in detail like the one which is being submitted today. The concept of putting a price on carbon pollution is not a new concept. But let's not wait 110 years to get this done. We in this country are better at that than coping with change. When it comes to the complex issue of climate change and our government's measured response being debated today in the parliament, I would submit that we are simply taking out insurance. As the Australian's newspaper editor-at-large, Paul Kelly, put in his paper's publication last month, if I may paraphrase, the best pro-science approach is the insurance principle. Because there is a climate change risk, everyone can see take the prudent path is the to take out mitigating policy it. insurance. Yet the Leader of the Opposition would have Australians take out no insurance when it comes to climate change, to irresponsibly ignore the risk and somehow walk on through the raindrops as though we could never get wet from the consequences of a warming planet. We are witness to a steady climatic warming due specifically to anthropogenic factors, determined and recognised and so advised by a panel of internationally recognised, appointed and accountable scientific experts. Yet the Leader of the Opposition stubbornly says these scientists are wrong. He says the economists are wrong. 
He says the signs in the skies are not significant and the change in the weather does not need this action. He says that the extreme flooding and the drought and the turbulent climatic conditions, which can in time disable whole economies, are not significant enough to act upon now. To borrow from Winston Churchill, there is a gathering storm. And the Conservative parties, like their intellectual inspiration, the Luddite movement, believe that they can simply wish change away. By closing their eyes, by stopping their ears to inform discourse, they have somehow convinced themselves that they can abolish the future, put away the laws of cause and consequence, and lazily consign this great, uncertain, globalised world to harder changes later, and that this course of action is a good thing to do. Now, I don't actually believe that all of those in the opposition believe this. I know that the member for Wentworth and the remnants of those small L Liberal supporters of what was once the great Liberal Party, they know that climate change needs this action. And indeed, if the member for Warringah hadn't replaced the member for Wentworth, we might well have had these debates concluded some time ago. Change is coming. However it is fudged or spun, however people try to dodge around it, however we twist the numbers or uh, slime the science, change is coming that challenges, our challenges the world as we know it. So we must adapt. Our method, and it's a good one, is a tax to trading model coupled with generous assistance. This legislative priority before the House. Our carbon price policy is based on this three-point proposition. One, we all want to reduce pollution for a clean energy future. Two, business needs certainty and the big polluters should be charged a price for their carbon pollution. And three, that families need a fair go, so generous assistance and tax cuts. That's why this package introduced to the House targets the largest polluters, why nine out of 10 Australian households are compensated, and it's how we will cut 160 million tonnes of carbon pollution from our atmosphere by 2020. It is in the same way that we will support our coal and steel industries. The Australian economic story since European settlement was initially that of convicts, then gold, then farming our way through the late 19th and early 20th centuries, moving into heavier industries and manufacturing from the Second World War right up to the 1980s, and then a growing prosperous services economy since then and still today. The next step in our economic narrative is a thoughtful, moderate evolution into a lower pollution economy with good jobs, clean technologies and a sustainable future. We will still be an agricultural producer, a manufacturer, a services provider, but we won't be a rapidly expanding carbon producer in the way which we currently are today. I believe that a Labor government's role should always be to deliver economic change, but to assist the workforces and families with the inevitable reskilling and new training that allows a transformation to occur without leaving people behind, without leaving people on an economic scrap heap. Yet in the face of this confident grasp for progress, it has certainly been a bruising political 12 months just past. And perhaps the most bruised of all has been the Australian people's faith in politics itself. I put to the House in this debate that nothing, nothing has done more bruising than the opposition's economic belligerence. In the final quarter of this year and as we move into 2012 to properly prepare for the challenge ahead, Australia needs to have a full-bodied economic conversation that is more assertive, optimistic and open-minded to the facts than the war of words which has proved to be since the last federal election. This spring and beyond there are considerable issues to consider and weigh up from the mining tax and job creation to the national disability insurance scheme and lifting superannuation. And a big a test of whether we can have a sensible dialogue focused on the national interest is of course the proposed legislation before us right now, the Clean Energy Future Bills. So far in 2011, the national discourse has been too often narrowed, sold short and bottomed out because of the number of political vested interests that have attempted to hijack the debate and drown out the voices of Australians who reasonably expect the government to navigate a path to the future. The Australians today perhaps are cynical about politics, but that would be a natural response to the depressing conduct of the relentless negativity and cynicism of the opposition. As our, as the, as our chief scientist put three weeks ago, things have now reached a new low. 
A visiting German climate scientist reportedly said, upon being heckled during a visit to Melbourne University, take a look at Australia and you will find that the climate debate is the most toxic on the planet. On Four Corners last month, the Leader of the Opposition failed to acknowledge when asked that surely it's unbecoming of an alternative leader of the country to stand on a stage next to someone who says that CSIRO scientists are engaged in a conspiracy. I entirely agree with Prime Minister Gillard's passionate belief that what we're witnessing is a repugnant trend in our national politics. And it's profoundly incumbent upon all of those elected to this place to lead. And it's incumbent upon us in the Labor movement to resist at all costs the sort of unhealthy, cynical developments that we see emerging on the extreme right overseas. I refer to the United States where eminent writer Thomas Friedman has observed that the Republican Party is progressively being taken over by some who are entirely obsessed with only one issue, tax. I believe that the Friedman insight prompts us to think carefully about the path some extreme conservatives are now taking us here in Australia by concentrating almost entirely on boat people, climate change scepticism and the relentless cynical negativity at the neglect of virtually every other economic and social policy issue. I think that was brought into stark relief last week by the cynical approach of the opposition to the tax forum. The Leader of the Opposition today is neglecting a broader economic policy debate, a gentler, sensible conversation about Australia's future because he believes that he can shout his way into office about a carbon price that taxes polluters. We are witness in this place to irrational arguments and cynical daily bully boy fear-mongering, politics at its most depressing. Uh, this, this, this underestimation of the wisdom of Australians needs to end, not just for the sake of the government, but indeed for where this country needs to go. I would submit that the biggest threat to confidence in the Australian economy is not putting a price on carbon, but a federal opposition who have no confidence in the Australian people and an opposition who constantly underestimate the capacity of Australians to change. The Gillard government understands that you cannot put up a proposition that Australia can be frozen in the moment. The coalition would have Australian people believe that now is not a good time to change, that tomorrow will not be a good time to change, that it is never a good time to change. This nation cannot progress on the foolish policy prescription that Australians do not have to adjust, amend and do things differently. This nation needs great leadership, and change is never easy. The Gillard government understands that. We understand what business well knows, that the economy is in transition and that we cannot stand still. Australians understand that the world outside Australia is a tough place, but that inaction and complacency does this nation and our children and our grandchildren no favours. We know that business appreciates the value of certainty and that the world is moving to improved energy efficiency and to lower carbon pollution. We understand that we need to lower the carbon output, reduce the growth in carbon output in this country, and with the big polluters should assist in that process. None of us ordinary citizens are allowed to tip our garbage in the street and expect someone else to pay for the privilege of cleaning up our mess. We believe that families and consumers should get a fair go, and we also believe that climate change is real. And we also know that whoever is in charge that government will, sooner or later, have to put a price on carbon. It is the cheapest and most effective way to cut pollution. Imagine two future worlds. In one, Australia continues to lag behind Germany and solar technology as we do today. In another, we are world leaders in applying solar technology domestically, but also exporting it to the world. Why shouldn't we aim to be the best in the world? Why shouldn't we aim to capture the blue sky potential of industries that will clearly be massive in the future? China and India are urbanising now. In 20 years, and over the next 20 years, they'll be converting en masse to clean energy. China is already the largest clean energy investor in the world. Why do we want to miss the curve, miss the wave of change? Let's get ahead of the curve. Now, indeed, the tragedy of this debate is underneath all the bluster of the opposition. At least half the Liberal Party know this, and indeed I would submit that the opposition leader understands this. That is one thing for sure. Those opposite would also put a price on carbon. The only questions are when and how much it will cost you. Brendan Nelson supported a price on carbon. Malcolm Turnbull supported a price on carbon and still does. John Howard supported a price on carbon. Even Tony Abbott periodically, as his mood has changed, has supported a price on carbon. But unfortunately he's hiding now. 
Underneath all the feigned, hostile outrage, the opposition understand that they will have to introduce it, but they just don't want to admit to it now. It will happen. Even if they manage to scramble into power with their timid cynicism, it will have to happen. But what is the benefit, if you know that you have to change, of delaying the change? It only comes at a higher price. They instead would believe that when they come to power, would have you believe that when they come to power, nothing changes, that you can be frozen in the moment and this nation needs to change, needs to change little. Yet we understand that whoever is in charge of this nation, that we have an obligation not to betray the leadership entrusted to us by people. Real leadership does not always involve telling people what they want to hear. Real leadership means dealing with issues. We in the Labor Party do not rely on scaring people to obtain power, yet those, rely on threat to give, those opposite rely on threat to give them purpose. We rely on hope to give purpose. The op those opposite rely on conservatism to give them purpose. We believe in innovation. We don't accept the proposition that industries in Australia, agriculture, mining, manufacturing and the service industry and the nation at large lacks the capacity to change. Those opposite rely on fear, we rely on optimism. Those opposite rely on hostility, we rely on hope. Those opposite think the future is something to hide and run from. We believe the future is not something to be frightened of. Instead of talking down the economy and small business, we understand Order. that the world will not the stand still. We understand Order. forces the are at work and we will not shirk from Minister's the challenge. time has expired. And before calling the Chief Government Whip, I would commend to the Minister the provisions of Standing Order 64. The Chief Government Whip. Uh, thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Given how logical and persuasive the Assistant Treasurer's contribution was, I think it a good time for me to move that the debate be adjourned. The question before the chair is that the debate be adjourned and be made an order of the day for a later hour this day. I'll put that question. All those in favour say aye. Again, say no. I think the ayes have it. The honourable member for Chisholm Thank now you, has the call. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. On behalf of the Joint Select Committee on Australia's Clean Energy Future Legislation, I present the committee's report entitled Advisory Report on the Clean Energy Bill and Cell Transformation Bill 2001, incorporating supplementary marks and a dissenting report together with the minutes of proceedings. I ask leave of the House to make a short statement in connection with the report. Is leave granted? I thank the member for Canning. I thank the honourable member for Canning. I call the honourable member for Chisholm. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Mrs. Deputy Speaker, the committee reviewed the Clean Energy Bill 2011, the other 17 bills in the Clean Energy Package and the Seal Transformation Bill 2011. The committee has concluded that bills should pass. Australia is committed to reducing its greenhouse gas emissions by at least 5 per cent below 2000 levels by 2020. This lies at the heart of Australia's efforts to introduce a mechanism to place a value on greenhouse gas emissions and to achieve lasting reduction over time. The government has a plan to meet this target and looks beyond it to meeting longer-term commitments to reduce our emissions, which set out in the 18 bills in the Clean Energy legislation package and the Steel Transformation Plan 2011. The design of the plan has been subject to considerable public debate, discussion and policy development. A national commitment to reducing greenhouse gas emissions is based on scientific evidence about the adverse impacts on our planet and our nation of greenhouse gas emissions from human activity, both now and over the longer term. The scientific evidence is well founded, is accepted and continues to be appropriately tested and scrutinised. However, the committee has also noted that many unfounded and unwarranted attacks that have been made on science in the course of this debate. As a nation, we have been discussing this issue for more than 10 years. There have been numerous reviews since 1999, all of which have concluded that, to, that a market-based admissions trading scheme is the most appropriate way to act. Other countries are acting through mechanisms designed to suit their own situations, including through emissions trading schemes. Since 2009, the Australian Parliament has considered legislation to introduce a mechanism to put a price on greenhouse gas emissions. The bills in the Clean Energy Legislation Package reflect this decade of policy development, consultation and scrutiny. In considering the package, the committee has looked at whether it provides a foundation for future economic growth and for the transition to an economy based on cleaner and more sustainable energy sources. It is clear that a regulatory framework which provides certainty over time and allows business to make the decisions about the most appropriate way to act is preferable to one in which the government directs outcomes. The consequences of not having a robust and certain framework are clear. Businesses will face greater risk associated with making decisions and act, or not act accordingly. The package provides a certainty that business need to make these decisions to ensure future investment. It is appropriate that people, in considering a reform, should consider the short-term impacts it will have. 
The government has addressed these through a series of measures to provide transitional assistance to emissions intensive trade exposed industries, household assistance to low and middle income earners, and measures to improve energy efficiency and the development and adaptation of new technologies. Beyond this, the longer term costs of not taking action must also be considered. There are the direct economic consequences of squeezing the task of meeting our 2020 commitment to reduce greenhouse gas emissions into a shorter and shorter time frame. But further inaction or delay also poses deeper and more long lasting impacts for us all. There is a clear and real deterrent detriment for not taking the task of greenhouse gas emissions reduction in a coordinated way. It will stifle investment in clean energy and energy efficiency, delay the adaption of new technologies, increase the ultimate cost we all must bear. The cost of economic change are greatly reduced when they occur gradually, which the package proposes. The impact of delaying investment in our energy sector is real and serious. Individual Australians have now experienced the cost of not making investment in energy infrastructure due to lack of certainty on addressing greenhouse gas reductions. They face significant increases in electricity prices pr precisely because we have not taken action, and these impacts will continue. These costs far outstrip any impact of placing a price on greenhouse gas emissions now. In considering now to meet our commitment to reduce Australian greenhouse gas emissions, we must ensure that the regulatory framework does this at least cost in a way which is tailored to the Australian economy and which ensures that traditional costs are minimised. It is also critical that this framework gives clarity and certainty for investors over time, particularly in our critical energy sector. The committee is confident that the package delivers these outcomes. The committee received evidence from a range of business, local governments and others who may be covered by the mechanisms. While many of these acknowledged the benefits that would flow from a full range of reforms encompassed by the package, including the recently passed Common Farming Initiatives, there was a degree of bad uncertainty from applications from certain groups. This uncertainty is to some extent understandable, given the high level of much public discussion and the misconceptions about the reforms that have been gained. To deal with this, considerable effort is needed in the implementation of the package to ensure that those covered by it are aware of its implications, their obligations and the opportunities available to them. I commend the report to the House and I encourage everyone to read it. Order it. Being 2 p.m. the debate is interrupted. The Prime Minister. Uh, thank you very much, Mr Speaker, and with the indulgence of the House, I would like to mark the award to Australia's newest Nobel laureate, Professor Brian Schmidt. Uh, I was able to meet with Professor, Professor Schmidt and uh, convey our congratulations to him. Uh, Mr Speaker, even though I had a direct discussion with him, I am not going to pretend I am in a position to describe to the House the nature of his discovery in astrophysics. It is not very often that you are looking for words of congratulations for someone who has uh, literally uh, redefined our understanding of our universe, but that is exactly what Professor Schmidt has achieved. This is a fantastic personal award for him. But when I met with him, the thing he wanted me to most understand was he viewed it as an award for the team of researchers that he worked with. He is very proud of the work that he does. He's very proud of the team of researchers that he works with. And he has many uh, friends at the Australian National University who were able to celebrate this award with him. So our congratulations go to him for a remarkable achievement. Yeah, yeah. The Leader of the Opposition. Well, Mr Speaker, uh, I rise to join the Prime Minister in welcoming Australia's 12th Nobel Prize and the 6th uh, for the Australian National University uh, and in congratulating Professor Brian Schmidt. Uh, Mr Speaker, in a stellar career, uh, the Nobel Prize is the ultimate accolade. Uh, although uh, Professor Schmidt was born in the United States, he's built his career here in Australia and, remarkably, Mr Speaker, uh, he says that he might not have been able to succeed uh, in the way he has uh, had he been anywhere else in the world. Uh, so, uh, Mr Speaker, this is obviously a great moment for our country. It's a great moment for his university and for Australian science. And it is proof, if anyone needed, that the brain drain is not all the wrong way. The Leader of the House. Thanks, Mr Speaker. I ask Leave of the House to refer further, further statements on indulgence on Brian Smith, Nobel Prize winner for physics to the main committee. Is there any objection to leave being granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. The Leader of the House. I move that further statements on indulgence on Brian Smith, Nobel Prize winner for physics be referred to the main committee. 
Order. The question is that further statements on indulgence on Brian Schmidt, Nobel Prize winner for physics, be referred to the main committee. All those of that opinion say aye. Contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Order. Before calling on questions, I've got to say that I notice that there is a fair degree of background noise already in question time. Um, I think that that indicates that you're talking quietly amongst yourselves, but you're all talking quietly at the same time. So, questions without notice. Are there any questions? The Leader of the Opposition. Mr Speaker, my question is to the Prime Minister. I refer the Prime Minister to the member for M Morton, who said he would resign rather than back a leadership change, saying, and I quote, I will not be breaking faith with the people of Morton. I did it in 2010 and I have been constantly reminded that I did. This is about me keeping faith with the people who put me in office. So I ask the Prime Minister, will she and Labor members of this House now keep faith with the Australian people by honouring her pre-election commitment that, and I quote, there will be no carbon tax under the government I lead? Order. 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 The question has been asked. The Prime Minister now has the call. Prime Minister. Uh, thank you very much, Mr Speaker. And what a remarkable question from a Leader of the Opposition who is on the public record as supporting a carbon tax, who is on the public record as supporting a carbon price, who has said consistently only one thing to the Australian people. The only thing he believes in is what he thinks the politics of the moment is telling him. That's the only thing he believes in. Uh, historically and famously referred to by the member for Wentworth as a weather vane, someone who's got no core beliefs about Australia's future, no ability to shape that future, no concern about jobs in the future, no concern for pensioners or for family payments in the future, no concern for cutting taxes. Mr Speaker, today and tomorrow particularly, this House of Representatives will vote on putting a price on carbon. Yeah. This, vote, this House of Representatives will record its vote on whether we believe climate change is real, on whether we believe that the most efficient way of addressing climate change is to put a price on carbon pollution, on whether we believe in protecting Australian jobs, on whether we believe that pensioners and people who are raising families deserve extra assistance, on whether we believe we should be providing tax cuts to working people earning less than $80,000 a year and particularly the biggest tax cuts to people on lower incomes. These will be the things that go for a vote tomorrow. And what I can say to the Leader of the Opposition is each and every step of the way he has found a way to twist and turn in this debate. He used to be in favour of pricing carbon, now oh, he right, says he's opposed. But I can understand the, the Leader of the Opposition Sturt. here today advocating further delay in putting a price on carbon. I can understand that because the Leader of the Opposition senses what the Australian people will ultimately come to know that his so-called promise to repeal a price on carbon is just nonsense. He won't repeal a price on carbon if he is ever elected as Prime Minister. He won't do that because more than half of his political party Order. supports putting a price on carbon. He won't do that because to do that would mean repudiating every living Liberal leader. He won't do that because ultimately wiser heads will prevail in the opposition and they will say, don't take money out of the hands of pensioners, don't take money out of the hands of families. He won't do that and he isn't to be believed when he says it will, he will. Tomorrow this House will record its vote and every member will be required to file in here and to record whether they are on the side of history, whether they are on the side of action whether they are on the side of change or whether they were content to stand against and watch the world change while Australia stayed the same. Well, we on this side of the parliament will vote 
for a clean energy future, for reducing carbon pollution, for enabling economic growth without increases in carbon pollution, for putting more money in the hands of pensioners, working Australians who need it the most, people raising families and making sure, more importantly than almost anything else, we seize the jobs and opportunities that come with a clean energy future. Order. The Leader of the Opposition. On a supplementary to the Prime Minister, Mr Speaker, in the light of the Prime Minister's answer a moment ago, why did she say five days before the last election there will be no carbon tax under the government I lead? And in the light of what she's just said, if the arguments in favour of a carbon tax are so good, why won't she have the courage Order. of her convictions and put this to the people at an election? Order. Order. Prime Minister. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker, and I look forward to the Leader of the Opposition's uh, explanation as to why he said in the past that he's in favour of putting a tax on carbon, why he said in the past that he's in favour of putting a price Order. on carbon, why he Order. said in the past that, quote unquote, he's a bit of a weather vane when asked. it comes to this, a man of no core convictions, the no promises, stirs. nothing that can be believed, and certainly one thing that can never be believed is his assertion that he will repeal this price on carbon. The Leader of the Opposition won't do that. To the Leader of the Opposition's question, as I have said many times before, in this parliament and beyond, as I have spoken to members of the community, I have talked to them about how the science is real. I accept the science. Frequently, the Leader of the Opposition does not that we need to cut carbon pollution by 5 per cent at least by 2020. I believe in doing that. Some days the Leader of the Opposition does not. I believe we should accept the advice of economists that the most cost-effective way of doing that is to put a price on carbon. The Leader of the Opposition never accepts, accepts advice from economists. Instead, he personally criticises them. That I believe that as we price carbon and reduce carbon pollution, we should do everything we can to provide benefits to pensioners, to people raising children, to workers deserving of tax cuts, and we will. That we should do everything we can to support the steel industry, and we will. And tomorrow's vote, in part, will be about who stands alongside steel workers and who is prepared to desert them. That will be what tomorrow's vote is about as well. As the Leader of the Opposition well knows, in the last election campaign, I spoke to the Australian people about the science being real. I spoke to the Australian people about the need to have an emissions trading scheme. We have used the opportunity of this parliament. This parliament will deliver this major reform, which will enable us to seize a clean energy future. Meanwhile, I anticipate the Leader of the Opposition the man who used to be in favour of pricing carbon, the man who used to talk favourably about putting a tax on carbon, the man who has said he is nothing but a weather vane when it comes to this huge issue for the nation's future. I anticipate that the Leader of the Opposition will start twisting and turning and becoming sharper and more hysterical in a desperate attempt to try and convince the Australian people he will repeal carbon pricing. We know he won't. Order. Before calling the member for Karangamite, I inform the House that we have present in the gallery this afternoon members of the Australian Political Exchange Council's 28th delegation from the United States of America. On behalf of the House, I extend a very warm welcome to our visitors. The member for Karangamite. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Prime Minister. How is the, the government undertaking reforms to create a clean energy future and make sure that, despite the patchwork economy, no Australian is left behind. The Prime Minister. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. Right, and I the thank the for member North for Karangamide about his question, because the thing that is at the centre of his question is jobs, jobs for Australian pe uh, the Australian people, jobs for working Australians. And I can understand 
while the opposition greeted it with scoffing because they don't care about jobs. Mr Speaker, in the days since this parliament last met, the government has announced its intention to have an Asian century white paper. Almost every Australian would be able to give you chapter and verse about the resources boom, about the boom in mining. Many Australians are either participating in it, in it themselves, live in a, a community that is affected by the growth in mining, or have a family member who is affected by the growth in mining. People understand that there is a resources boom, and that is a good thing. That is a great thing for our country because it means jobs and opportunity and prosperity, with more than $400 billion of investment in the pipeline. But at the same time, many Australians say to themselves, well, that's fantastic that there is such a record pricing for the things that we've got to sell. But what happens? What happens in the days beyond the resources boom, in the days where we fully export, exploited our mineral wealth, when we have extracted it, when we have exported it? What happens in those days? What will people do for a job then? What will those Australians do for jobs then? What will their children do? This is a question on the minds of Australians as they contemplate the future. The Asian Century White Paper will be about speaking to Australians about the opportunities that come from growth in our region, and those opportunities are more than the opportunities from the resources boom. They are about the spectacular development of the middle classes in Asia, growth of 1.2 billion people in the Asian middle class by 2020, people who will want to buy our food, want to buy our wine, want to come here on holidays, want legal services, accounting services services, international education, opportunities right across the Australian economy. But we face a challenge, and the challenge is, in these days of the resources boom, as the Australian dollar is high and sustained, how to make sure that industries feeling the pressure of that high sustained Australian dollar also maintain their competitiveness during these days. And that's why we focused on the Future Jobs Forum, on working with those industries during the days of the patchwork economy, because I want to see us sustain economic diversity during these days and in the days beyond the resources boom. I want to see us come out with a more diversified economy rather than a less diversified economy. That is what the Future Jobs Forum was about. And interestingly, Mr Speaker, the tax forum was also about those questions of the patchwork economy. They were centrally before the tax forum in the reform propositions that people worked through. Mr Speaker, we are determined to seize this future. It is about the mineral resource rent tax, so we can take tax from the uh, turbocharged section of the economy and use it to support businesses elsewhere. It is about the NBN and the benefits of a high technology future. It is about responding to the demands of a patchwork economy and making sure we're doing what we can to support Australian industry. And it is too about seizing a clean energy future. We cannot be left behind. We cannot be left behind as the world seizes clean energy jobs. Mr Speaker, we don't intend to have Australia left behind. We will fully seize the opportunities that come from this future. Yeah. The Deputy Leader of the Opposition. Yeah. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Foreign Affairs. I refer the Foreign Minister to his recent trips to Japan, the United Arab Emirates, Kazakhstan, Bahrain, Brazil, the Republic of Korea, Mexico, Indonesia, <laughs> Papua New Guinea, Thailand, Israel, Vietnam and the United States, amongst many others, over the last year. Can the Foreign Order. Minister confirm that not one of these countries has an economy-wide carbon tax? Order. Order the House will come to order. 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 The Minister for Foreign Affairs. I uh, welcome very much the uh, question from the Shadow Minister for Foreign Affairs. Although we do wonder how much longer the Leader of the Opposition has confidence in the uh, Shadow Minister for Foreign Affairs, given his statement the other day about the good old member for Kuyong when he said 
It's nice to have someone in the parliamentary party who understands foreign affairs at last. Now, Julie, that is a ringing vote of endorsement, if ever I had one. And just, just remain calm. Order. Mr Speaker. Order that. No. The, the, the minister will resume his seat until the... The minister will resume his seat until the House comes to order. 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 The Minister for Foreign Affairs. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. And I also appreciate very much the um, Shadow Minister of Foreign Affairs' a discovery of the fact that, as Foreign Minister of Australia, I do travel abroad. Um, and as I've said in various fora around Australia when asked this, the universal conclusion of foreign ministers around the world is that most foreigners do live abroad. That is why we travel abroad to meet those foreigners. And I thank very much. I thank very much. I thank very much the uh, Shadow Minister of Foreign Affairs Order. for drawing that basic fact to our attention. My own view, my own view um, and member. I share this very much with the member for Curtin, the Deputy Leader of the Opposition, Shadow Minister of Foreign Affairs, is that there comes a stage when point scoring over the cost of overseas travel by political figures demeans our national self-respect. They protest. The members they protest, for North Mr. Sydney. Speaker. The author and of Dixon. those remarks was John Winston Howard uh, in his most recent book, Lazarus Rising. And I think that actually goes to the maturity which is lacked in this place on the part of those opposite when it comes to the necessity of either a prime minister or foreign minister travelling abroad in Australia's national interests. Furthermore, could I say, could I say to uh, the, uh, oh, the member for McCullough? Can I also say to the Deputy Leader of the Opposition, and can I say also to the Shadow Minister of Foreign Affairs, that when it comes to global action, the uh, Shadow Minister of Foreign Affairs should contemplate a few basic facts. She should contemplate the facts that we have around the world at present a large number of economies which have already introduced or are in the process of introducing emissions trading schemes. We also have evidence around the world that in terms of, for example, the People's Republic of China or India, we see actions of a type we have not seen in previous decades. China in 2009 adding 37 gigawatts of renewable power capacity, more than any other country of the world. India has introduced a tax on coal, which is expected to generate funds for further re research into clean energies. The UK, run by the Tories, Order. has set an ambitious plan to halve the its carbon exports Order. and carbon emissions by 2027. And, Mr Speaker, the Republic of Korea has a 2020 emissions reduction pledge to reduce emissions by 20 per cent below business as usual, not to mention Japan, a target to improve its energy efficiency by 30 per cent by 2030. What does all this indicate, Mr Speaker? It says that there are governments and political parties around the world who recognise the future, the need to act on climate change and to put a price on carbon, and there are those who keep their heads stuck firmly in the ground and who refuse to do so. We are acting for this nation's future. You are denying this nation a future. Order. Order. The member for Cook on a point of order. I would just ask, I would just ask could the Minister for Foreign Affairs table the section of Lazarus Rising from which he's been reading? I don't encourage the member for New England. If I was marking homework, that's very close. But 
And I say to the member for Cook, I will ignore it on this time, but he should be very careful. He's got form on those sort of things. The member for Robertson. No black caviar. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And my question is to the Treasurer. Will the Treasurer outline for the House the importance to our economy of putting a price on carbon pollution? What would be the consequence of failing to charge the biggest polluters? The Deputy Prime Minister, the Treasurer. Well, Mr. Speaker. Treasurer has the call. Well, Mr. Speaker, I thank the member for Robertson for what is a very important question because tomorrow in this House we will vote on one of the most important economic reforms in a generation, Mr. Speaker. And it is going to be a test for each and every one of us in this House tomorrow, Mr. Speaker, because are we going to face up to the climate science and doing something about carbon pollution? Are we going to face up to the fact that we should not? leave for our children and our grandchildren greater costs and the heavy burden of carbon pollution, Mr Speaker? And are we going to show to the Australian people and subsequent generations that we had the guts to face up to the tough economic reforms that will deliver prosperity for future generations, Mr Speaker? And for us on this side of the House, we are going to act on all of those challenges because we understand that in the 21st century, to be a first-class economy, you must be powered by clean energy. And that is why it is so important that we do put a price on every tonne of carbon pollution emitted by the biggest polluters. We understand on this side of the House that we need to send a price signal to drive the investment in clean energy and in renewable energy. And we understand the importance of that in the 21st century if we want to continue to be a strong economy. One of the reasons why Australia is so strong, one of the reasons why the International Monetary Fund gives our economy such a big tick is that governments in the past, over the past 25 to 30 years, have had the guts to face up to the big economic reforms. That is why we are strong now. That is why we are resilient now, because governments took the long-term view. And the long-term view is the one that is right for our country. It may not be the most immediately politically popular course of action, but it is right for our country. And that is why we on this side of the House will be supporting a clean energy future tomorrow when those critical votes come through. And those on the opposite side of the House will be saying no, as they constantly say no, turning their back on the future, turning their back on their children and their grandchildren turning their back on future economic prosperity, Mr Speaker. All of the modelling shows that our economy can grow strongly with a price on carbon, that income can, incomes can grow strongly putting a price on carbon pollution. And we also know what they'll do as well. They will rip away the essential tax reforms that we are putting in place, essential reforms which will see another one million people take it out of the tax system because we're going to triple the tax-free threshold. They will take the claw out and claw that back, Mr Speaker. And what they will also do is claw back the pension increases, Mr Speaker. They will claw it back because they don't have a positive approach to the future. They want to turn their back on the future, rip away that assistance and ignore what must be done, what must be done to grow our economy, to grow jobs and to ensure future prosperity. They only know one course of action. That is to say no, to wreck and turn their back on the future. The member for North Sydney. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Treasurer. I refer the Treasurer to concerns in financial markets about the risk of a sovereign debt default in Europe. The weak growth outcomes recorded in the United States, Japan and many European countries and the IMF's downgraded the growth forecast for Europe and the United States, stating that, and I quote, the global economy is in a dangerous new phase. I ask the Treasurer, isn't this the worst possible time to introduce the world's biggest carbon tax that will slow economic growth in Australia, increase inflation in Australia and cost Australian jobs? Here, here. The Deputy Prime Minister, the Treasurer. 
Well, Mr. Speaker, I do thank the Shadow Treasurer for his question. And whilst it is true there is uncertainty, it is also true there is volatility in the global economy. It is also true that the Australian economy remains relatively strong, Mr. Speaker. And he quoted a number of authorities before. Indeed, he quoted the International Monetary Fund. Well, the International Monetary Fund has been to Australia. They've produced their, what's called their Article 4 report. It's come out in the last couple of weeks in full. You know what it does in that report? It gives a big tick to cut carbon oh, pricing, Mr. North Speaker. Sydney has the very report that he quotes to seek to say that we should defer carbon pricing is the one that gives it a very big tick. A comprehensive report on the Australian economy, but he didn't read the report, Mr. Speaker. He's just that sloppy all of the time. The Order. fact is that the IMF Order. has given carbon pricing in Australia a big tick. Indeed, as they have given the government's economic management a very big tick. Now, what I need to do now is to quote from that report. It's only a couple of weeks old because what it says is this. Australia's performance since the onset of the global financial crisis has been enviable. That's what it says. That is, it says the Australian economy is strong. It says the Australian economy is in good shape. And it says it's strong and in good shape for a couple of reasons. First of all, it says what a good oh. job this government did Order. during the global financial crisis to support our economy and avoid going into recession. And then it points to the fact that over the years, fundamental economic reforms have been implemented by governments from both sides of politics to strengthen our economy. So they go back. They talk about the big, the, the big reforms of the past, IMF report after IMF report, the floating of the dollar, the bringing down of the tariff wall, national competition policy, national superannuation, all the big reforms that have strengthened our economy. And it is in that context that the International Monetary Fund supports putting an overall price on carbon. So the height of the Shadow Treasurer to come in this House and quote the International Monetary Fund, which is giving the government's economic policies a big tick and which supports carbon pricing. Now, this is just so, so typical of those opposite. They are so negative. They've got their heads stuck so far in the sand, they can't see the wood Order. for the trees. Order. Mr Speaker, these people, these people, these people are completely and utterly incompetent. Order, order. Order, the member for Dixon. The member for Sturt. The member for O'Connor. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister for Climate Change. I refer to the government's changes to fuel tax credits as a part of the carbon tax, and I ask: Is the government aware that tens of thousands of businesses in Australia, many of them which, of which are small businesses, will be paying the effective carbon price? And does the government admit the, that this effective carbon price on fuel is not just a tax on big polluters? The Minister for Climate Change and Energy Efficiency. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. I thank the member for O'Connor for his question. And of course, uh, the House will consider further later today the government's clean energy uh, legislative package was a, is an extremely important reform for this country. And of course, he's referred to the carbon pricing mechanism uh, in his question. And of course, it's around 500 of the largest emitters of greenhouse gases that will carry a liability under the, under the carbon price mechanism, there are, in relation to off-road fuel, some forms of off-road fuel usage, of course, uh, arrangements that the legislation will put in place to apply an effective carbon price to them. Now, Mr Speaker, I'm aware of the fact, of course, that the member for O'Connor, I think, has uh, placed forward an amendment uh, this morning that relates to this issue, and I'd like to assure him that the government is looking very carefully at it. We understand the uh, concerns that he is raising and uh, recognise, of course, that he's representing the concerns that would have been raised with him uh, by people within his electorate. Um, I'm working, as I said, in my office and seeking some advice about the implications of the amendment that has been put forward. And, of course, I'd note uh, in this context, I think it's important to always bear in mind that in relation to the effective carbon pricing arrangements that 
the government is proposing to apply to various areas of off-road fuel usage, of course it is always important to bear in mind that there will be no effective carbon price applied in relation to light commercial vehicles so that Australian motorists will not be facing an effective carbon price in relation to their fuel usage. Uh, we'll have a look at the proposed amendment and have some further discussions with uh, the member for O'Connor about those particular issues, but it's also important just to conclude on this note that in rural and regional Australia, the exemptions in relation to off-road uh, usage that apply uh, to the agriculture, forestry and fishing sectors are also very important considerations, but we'll have a look at the issues that the member has raised and have further discussions with him in relation to them. The member for Wells. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is also to the Minister for Climate Change and Energy Efficiency. Uh, will the minister update the House on the government's clean energy future reforms? Why is the passage of this legislation critical for the Australian economy and our environment? The Minister for Climate Change and Energy Efficiency. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. I'd like to thank the uh, member for Wills for his question. And Mr Speaker, as the House is aware, this morning the uh, second reading debate uh, resumed on the government's clean energy legislation package. As I said a moment ago, this is a very important environmental and economic reform uh, for this country. This evening, of course, we expect uh, to be able to proceed into the consideration in detail stage uh, in relation to the bills before a final vote tomorrow morning on both the clean energy bills and, of course, uh, another bill that is before the House, the government's steel transformation plan. Now, Mr Speaker, this is a crucial economic reform. It is central to assuring this country's economic prosperity and competitiveness in the years ahead. The Clean Energy Future Package will deliver very significant benefits to the economy over time, including a very significant increase in investment in clean energy. Now, the Treasury modelling that the Treasurer referred to a short while ago predicts, in fact, that the carbon price will drive around $100 billion—$100 billion of investment in the renewable energy sector over the period to 2050, and it will transform our energy sector and create a considerable number of jobs. And those jobs won't be just in new industries, in renewable technologies, but they will also support jobs in what we'd describe as the more traditional areas of the economy, including in construction, in electrical services and many areas of manufacturing. And in fact, the modelling shows that employment will increase in our economy by 1.6 million jobs to the year 2020. Now, Mr Speaker, at the same time, of course, the scheme that the government will introduce will be environmentally effective and the carbon price arrangements will see emissions reduced in our economy by at least 160 million tonnes in the year 2020 and ongoing. That is the least, the least reduction in emissions that we can expect from the arrangements to be put in place. Time and time again, Mr Speaker, in our history, in our economic history, it is the Labor Party that has made the reforms that are so crucial to future prosperity and intergenerational equity. And time and time again, it's the coalition that sided with vested interests against the interests of the nation and the Australian people generally. And let's not forget the fact that they opposed Medicare, they opposed compulsory superannuation, and now they are opposing this reform. Medicare, compulsory superannuation and this reform all promote intergener intergenerational equity. They will promote social equity. They will improve the environment. They are institutional changes that have ensured our economy remains competitive. And Mr Speaker, we've heard earlier in question time too, of course, that the Leader of the Opposition proposes to oppose the steel transformation plan. And of course, this is after he's been running around trying to terrify people about their jobs in the industry. Once again, hypocrisy. Mr Speaker, this package that is before the House, this package that is before the House will be environmentally effective, it will be economically efficient and it will be socially equitable. The household assistance that the government is providing will ensure that nine out of ten households receive assistance 
through either the tax reform and the tax cuts that will be implemented or the increase yeah, in Dr. Commonwealth McCullough. benefits, a 1.7 per cent increase in the pension, nine out of ten households will receive this assistance and it will be a very important and equitable reform for the nation. The member for Casey. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Prime Minister, and I refer the Prime Minister to the Treasurer's claim that the carbon tax will have a, quote, modest impact on prices. Can the Prime Minister confirm that this increase will add to the cost of electricity, gas and water bills that have risen 43.9 per cent since Labor came to power, and the price of fruit and vegetables that have risen 35.4 per cent? I ask the Prime Minister, is this really the right time to introduce a trillion dollar carbon tax that will increase the cost of everything? Order. 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 Prime Minister has the call. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and it's clear that the campaign of deceit continues. Uh, that question. Uh, that question has been uh, put together in order to pretend to the Australian people that price rises in things like electricity are somehow associated with the actions of this government. The member is better than that. The member knows that is untrue, and he should not come into this parliament and pretend that it is true. Completely untrue, Casey. completely false, calculated to create a climate of fear completely disrespectful to the people of Australia. As the member knows, if he is seriously concerned about questions like rises in electricity pricing and in water pricing, he may want to have a discussion uh, with his state colleagues, particularly Premier the Bailey, who Casey is on the record as supporting a Casey. price on carbon on the record as supporting a price on carbon. Now, I understand, Mr Speaker, that because of a set of questions relating to investment in infrastructure particularly, that electricity prices have been rising. They've been rising under Premier Bailey. They've been rising under Premier Barnett in Western Australia. At least Premier Barnett has had the honesty the honesty to go out to the Western Australian people and explain how the price rises are associated with the need for investment in infrastructure in Western Australia. That is, that the price rises are there because of a set of reasons Order. associated with state governments. And the same, of course, is true with water infrastructure, including investments that are being made in new capacity. Uh, so no one should uh, fall for the uh, misleading attempt that the member has engaged in it is completely disrespectful to the Australian people. On the question of the price impacts on carbon, despite of carbon pricing, despite these many, many months of fear and smear and absolutely running away from the facts, despite the Leader of the Opposition each and every day going out there and saying to the Australian people things that are untrue. Uh, what the member knows, and every member of this member parliament knows, is, is that the uh, flow-through price impact of asking the biggest polluters in our country to pay the price of their carbon pollution uh, to Australians is less than 1 per cent of CPI—0.7 per cent of CPI. And it is as a result of that uh, flow through price change, less than 1 per cent of CPI, less than a cent in a dollar, that the government has determined it is appropriate to use uh, more than half of the revenue generated by carbon pricing to help pensioners who will receive an increase of $338, to help people raising children with an increase in family payments, uh, to help Solomon. Australians earning less than $80,000 a year with a tax cut, and to associate that tax change with a major tax reform, which will mean a million Australians will not be in the tax system, not pay any tax and see better each and every week the rewards for working. Now, I'd say to the member who asked the question, who in other iterations of his political life has been prepared to contemplate reforms, including reforms like carbon pricing, perhaps instead of following the leader of the opposition's fear campaign, he should listen to a former Liberal leader, and I'm referring to Dr John Hewson, who has appeared in this book, former employer of the leader of the opposition. That was a bad decision, but he's made one good one. 
He says, I say yes to carbon pricing because this is the most important thing we can do for our nation this century. A former Liberal leader joining every other living Liberal Order. leader in favour of carbon Order. pricing, all except the wrecker over here. Order. Order. The member for Shortland. Thank you, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Families, Housing, Community Services and Indigenous Affairs. Minister, will you update the House on how the government is supporting Australian families and pensioners in our plan to put a price on carbon pollution? What would be the impact of failing to provide this support? The Minister for Families, Housing, Community Services and Indigenous Affairs. Thank you very much, uh, Mr Speaker, and I thank the member for Shortland for her question. Uh, she knows that this government is determined to act in the national interest to introduce a price on carbon pollution. She also knows that this government is determined to make sure that uh, it's the big polluters that pay for carbon pollution and not Australian families and pensioners. We want to make sure that acting on climate change continues to be in the interests of the economy and in the interests of our children. Of course, under our plan to put a price on carbon pollution, we do intend to provide support to pensioners. 3.4 million pensioners will receive assistance, assistance that amounts to $338 for single pensioners each year and $255 a year for each mem member of a pensioner couple. And very importantly for pensioners, of course, through both the pension and the clean energy supplement, they will increase over time to make sure that the assistance that we do provide to pensioners will keep up with the cost of living. It's also the case that under our uh, plan to put a price on carbon pollution, we intend to uh, provide support to nine out of ten households. Nine out of ten households will receive support, and of course, very importantly, that will include three million low-income households who will uh, receive assistance over and above their expected increase in prices. So all of these, uh, all of these increases in payments and pensions will be very important for all of those Australians. It will also be the case that these increases in payments will go straight into the uh, uh, bank accounts of uh, families and uh, straight into the bank accounts of pensioners no extra forms or queues for people to worry about. Now, of course, what we know is the Leader of the Opposition has a very different plan to this, a very different plan. What he intends to do is act in his own interest, not in the nation's interest. What this Leader of the Opposition is going to do is make sure that uh, he uh, gives, the bill, gives the bill for dealing with carbon pollution to families gives the bill to pensioners, and we know that that will amount to uh, Australian families being $1,300 a year worse off as a result of his changes. Even worse, uh, even worse uh, Mr Speaker, what we know is that this Leader of the Opposition intends to claw back, claw back the assistance that this government will provide to pensioners and to families. And I hear the member for Herbert up there making uh, a right royal noise about uh, the clawback that this uh, leader of the opposition is going to do. And that'll mean 17,400 pensioners in Herbert will have their assistance clawed back. The party of fight back is now the party of clawback. The order. Order. The Leader of the Opposition. Uh, thanks, Mr Speaker. My question is to the Prime Minister, and I refer her to global economic uncertainty, dwindling consumer confidence, the higher costs of living faced by Australia's forgotten families, and widespread job insecurity, all of which will be made worse by the government's toxic carbon tax. And I ask, 
With the government increasingly paralysed by disunity over leadership, why should the Australian people have any confidence that the Prime Minister is protecting their jobs rather than her own? Prime Minister. Uh, thank Order. you very much, Mr. Speaker. And the kind of question we often get, often get from the leader of the opposition—it's always, you know, heavy on the drama. What it's never got in it is any facts, and what we never hear is any alternatives that make any sense. The leader of the opposition never campaigns on his so-called direct action Order. plan, a plan to subsidise polluters, because he knows it won't work and it doesn't add up. And the Leader of the Opposition is here today with all of this dramatic carry-on because he knows once a carbon price is legislated and commences and to operate, the then the fear campaigns he has been engaged in will be exposed as absolute nonsense. And he knows that he won't ever repeal carbon pricing. He will go round, running round like a headless chook in hyperactive mode, trying to pretend to everybody that he will. But he knows this that significant figures in the Liberal Party support putting a price on carbon. Every living Liberal leader except this Leader of the Opposition. He knows, he knows that once it is in place that money will start to flow to pensioners and to families and providing workers with tax cuts. He knows that in the past he has been incredibly in favour of putting a price on carbon and so his uh, rhetoric about repealing the carbon price will be seen through by the Australian people. Now, the Leader of the Opposition has the temerity to come in here and talk about jobs. Well, I say to the Leader of the Opposition, in the carbon pricing package, we are providing literally billions of dollars to work with Australian industry to support Australian jobs. We will be there working with Australian industry to support those jobs in manufacturing, in steel, as well as seizing the clean energy opportunities of the future and the jobs that come with it. The Leader of the Opposition, who has been in and out of factories trying to associate himself with working people, the same working people he ran a mile from during the days of work choices, is now saying to those steel workers that he stood alongside, I could help your industry by voting for a $300 million steel transformation plan, but I won't do it. The politics is more important to me than supporting your job. We in the votes today and tomorrow will be supporting the jobs of steel workers. The Leader of the Opposition will sit in that chair and vote against their jobs. Vote against their jobs. And Mr Speaker, on the question of jobs, last week we had a future jobs forum. The input of the opposition, well, apart from cutting assistance to the automobile industry, apart from having no plan for skills except cutbacks to apprenticeship, apart from having no plan for the economy except desperately trying to cover up their planned $70 billion of cuts to services, what does the opposition stand for? Well, it certainly isn't jobs, Mr Speaker. It certainly isn't jobs. No plans for the jobs of Australians at all, and they are bored by the discussion of it. Mr Speaker, every time we have talked about carbon pricing in this country, figures in the opposition have thought up a new reason to delay. Well, history is marching on. We are going to get this done, Mr Speaker. This House of Representatives is going to get this done tomorrow. We will be there voting on the side of history. The Leader of the Opposition will be writing his name into history as the biggest wrecker to ever serve in a leadership role in Australian politics. The Leader of the Opposition. Order. 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 The Leader of the Opposition. So you'll have the to Mr take Speaker, I, I move that so much of the standing and session orders be suspended, Order. as would prevent the Leader of the Opposition from moving the following motion forthwith, that this House calls on the Prime Minister to explain to the Australian people the following. First, why this is the right time to introduce the world's largest carbon tax, despite growing economic uncertainty, and second, why, why it is right for the Prime Minister to break her solemn pledge that there would be no carbon tax under a government I lead by bringing in this tax without the consent of the Australian people. Well, Mr Speaker, standing orders must be suspended 
because that is the only way to make the Prime Minister face up to the folly and the deception of her carbon tax. Mr Speaker, the only way we can make this Prime Minister front the Australian people and the Australian Parliament is by suspending standing orders. And Mr Speaker, still, still, this Prime Minister scurries out of this chamber. Disgraceful behaviour by this Prime Minister, a Prime Minister who refuses to answer questions in this parliament and now refuses to face up to a suspension motion in this parliament. Mr Speaker, no previous Prime Minister would behave in such a graceless and unparliamentary way. Now, Mr Speaker, let me say this. There is never a good time to introduce a bad tax, but this is the worst possible time. Uh, confidence in our own country is at rock bottom record lows. Unemployment is edging up. The euro is under great pressure, and countries in Europe face the risk of sovereign debt default. There is the threat of a worldwide recession. And what is the response of this government to clobber the Australian economy with a carbon tax? Mr. Speaker, the forgotten families of Australia are doing it tougher and tougher. Cost of living pressures has almost, have almost never been worse. Power up 51 per cent since December 2007. Water up 46 per cent since December 2007. Uh, gas up 30 per cent. Health costs up 20 per cent. Education costs up 24 per cent. Rent up 21 per cent. Fruit and veggies, Mr. Speaker, up 35 per cent since de December 2007. The average mortgage holder is paying $500 a month more now than 18 months ago. And what is the response of this government? They want to make a bad situation worse by clobbering the Australian people with the world's biggest carbon tax. And it just goes up and up and up. That's why we need standing orders suspended to make the Prime Minister to face up to what she is doing to the Australian people. $23 a tonne next year, $29 a tonne in 2020, $131 a tonne, Mr Speaker, on the government's own figures, on the government's own figures uh, in 2050. And Mr Speaker, if you look at the government's own figures, the gross national income per head of Australians will be $5,000 a year less under a carbon tax than it would be without a carbon tax. That's $5,000 in lost income for every Australian, $5,000 out of every Australian's pockets because of this government and the act of economic self-harm, which is constituted by its carbon tax. And Mr. Speaker, we hear the Prime Minister talk about compensation. Well, even on the uh, government's own figures, some three million Australian households will be worse off under this carbon tax. And, Mr Speaker, we all know what this government would be like. We all know what this government would be like. The compensation would be temporary, but the tax would be permanent, because we know that this government is absolutely addicted to spending and taxing and borrowing. Mr Speaker, in 2050, our gross domestic product will be $100 billion a year less with a carbon tax than it would be without a carbon tax. Between now and 2050, our economy will be $1 trillion worse off. That's $1 trillion in wealth that our economy won't have between now and 2050 because of this government and its carbon tax. Every single Australian will lose $40,000 between now and 2050 because of this government's carbon tax. It's as if every single one of us was asked to work for a whole year for nothing. For nothing. That is the wealth destruction inherent in this government's carbon tax. And Mr Speaker, for what? For what? They say they are reducing emissions by 5 per cent by 2020. Wrong. That's not what their carbon tax is doing. 
Their carbon tax is raising emissions by 8 per cent, from 578 million tonnes now to 621 million tonnes on their own figures. Uh, they only reduce uh, emissions by 160 million tonnes by shovelling $3.5 billion abroad, uh, buying more than 100 million tonnes of carbon credits from the foreign carbon traders. And that minister uh, sitting on the front benches should have the honesty to own up. He should have the honesty to own up to the fact that we aren't reducing our emissions by 80 per cent by 2050. On his own figures, we are reducing our emissions by 6 per cent, by 6 per cent from 578 million tonnes to 445 million tonnes. We only achieve uh, the reduction in emissions by shoveling $57 billion, or 1.5 per cent of Australia's GDP, to the foreign carbon traders, the greatest transfer of wealth overseas in this country's history. But, Mr Speaker, this is a bad tax based on a lie. It's a bad tax based on a lie. Does anyone in this House remember the Prime Minister standing up in this chamber just a few years ago and proudly boasting, the Labor Party is the party of truth-telling? <laughs> Do they remember our Prime Minister saying that? Uh, does anyone remember the Prime Minister saying uh, in the campaign of last year, what I say in this campaign is what I will do? Well, she said it, and I tell you what else she said. She said, there will be no carbon tax under the government I lead. That's what she said. Uh, that is the phrase that will haunt this Prime Minister and this government to its political death. Uh, this is the phrase that the Prime Minister just cannot face. Uh, like Dracula uh, and the clove of garlic, this is the phrase that this Prime Minister simply can't face up to. But, Mr Speaker, it was very interesting. It was very interesting. Uh, I, was, I, was, I was reading uh, the Sydney Morning Herald this morning and I came, I came across a man of honour. One man of honour. One man of honour, and this is why standing orders should be suspended, so that the one man of honour uh, opposite can listen to his Prime Minister demonstrate that she's not a person of honour. I will not be breaking faith with the people of Morton. I did it in 2010, and I've been constantly reminded by my, vo by my voters that I did that. The member for Morton went on. People need to grow a bit of backbone and give the Australian people a chance to embrace and understand our policies. Well, I tell you what, Mr Speaker, the Australian people well understood the policies that this Prime Minister took to the election. There will be no carbon tax under the government I lead. There will be no carbon tax under the government I lead. I tell you who should grow a bit of backbone. It's this Prime Minister. She should grow a bit of backbone. Grow a bit of backbone and stand up to Bob Brown and the Greens, who are running this government's uh, agenda. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, I say to members opposite, I say in particular to the member for Morton, why is he prepared to keep faith with the Australian people in a way that benefits the Prime Minister and saves her job and not keep faith? with the electorate in a way that benefits them and saves their job by voting against this carbon tax, this toxic carbon tax that will be so bad for the people of Morton. So I say to members opposite, you've got about 18 hours left to stand up for your electorates. Stand up for the coal mines and the coal miners of this country. Stand up for the steel mills and the steel workers of this country. Stand up for the manufacturing workers of this country and say no to this toxic tax. And if you think it makes sense, have the guts to have an election. If it really Order. makes sense, have Order. an election the and time have it has now. Expired. Is the motion seconded? The Deputy Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I second the motion. Mr Speaker, it is vital that standing orders are suspended to give the Prime Minister the opportunity to come back into this House to explain to the Australian people why she believes her job security is more important than the job security of millions of workers across Australia. This suspension is necessary because the Prime Minister twists and turns every day in every question time 
and refuses to provide the Australian people with the answers to their concerns about this carbon tax. This suspension is necessary because the Prime Minister arrogantly dismisses concerns about the job security of others because she is so selfishly focused on her own job security. And who could blame the Foreign Minister for wanting to get his old job back? After all, it was this Prime Minister who convinced him to drop his carbon price scheme, and then she used it against him to take his job off him. And revenge is a powerful motivator. Oh yes, revenge is a very powerful motivator. But this Prime Minister is running from accountability. She's refusing to acknowledge the concerns about the impact of the carbon tax and the dishonest way in which it's being foisted upon the Australian people. Mr Speaker, last week I visited a furn furniture manufacturer in Cowra in the electorate of Hume with the member for Hume. Here, here. And this story that I was told is being repeated in thousands and thousands of businesses across Australia. And that's why this suspension is necessary. This business was established 30 years ago. Its success based on the efforts and energy and commitment of a local family, taking a risk, building a business, creating jobs and opportunities for local people currently employing 130 people and using Australian plantation timber to make furniture. The owner spoke so passionately about his commitment to quality and innovation and efficiency and how that has allowed him to compete successfully against imports from China. He told me about his constant drive for greater efficiency and waste reduction and his investment in capital, which has enabled him to reduce the carbon footprint in his business by more than 30 per cent in the last couple of years. This business has calculated what the future cost of electricity will be under this carbon tax. He's done the sums with his accountant, and this proud small business manufacturer believes the increases in costs because of this carbon tax will destroy his business, possibly within a couple of years of its introduction. He's not so concerned about his own welfare because he'll just retire, but that of the 130 employees who he said will struggle to find alternative work. And he is particularly angry that competitors in China won't be impacted by an economy-wide carbon tax. His business will receive no compensation under this government's carbon tax legislation, and this government gives him no recognition at all of his efforts to voluntarily reduce emissions from his business. Now, Mr Speaker, it is vital that standing orders are suspended to give the Prime Minister time to explain to this small business and the thousands and thousands like it across the country why manufacturers in this country should pay a carbon tax when its competitors overseas will not. This Prime Minister should explain to the 130 employees <coughs> of this cower of business and their families why their jobs are threatened in order to save the Prime Minister's job. Mr Speaker, it is vital that standing orders are suspended so the Prime Minister can explain why a carbon tax is being imposed at a time when economic storm clouds continue to gather in Europe. There's great uncertainty about the global economy. There's talk about a recession. Consumer and business confidence remains fragile in this country, and the Prime Minister must explain why she intends to further damage confidence by her insistence on a carbon tax. The latest Roy Morgan poll of consumer confidence shows it continues to fall. It's significantly lower than it was 12 months ago. Mr Speaker, this suspension is not only vital to give the Prime Minister an opportunity to explain why she broke a promise to the Australian people, it's an opportunity for every member of the Labor Party to consider their position. The member for Morton said he'll quit the, if the Prime Minister is successfully challenged for the leadership. And he said, this is not about loyalty to Julia Gillard or Kevin Rudd. It's about loyalty to the people of Morton. This is about me keeping faith with the people who put me in office. Well, I say to the member for Morton and I say to the members opposite to keep faith with their electorates. They must honour the election promise the Prime Minister took to the last election when she uttered those infamous words, there will be no carbon tax under a government I lead. If the Labor members want to keep faith with the Australian people, they must hold her Order. to that promise, no Order. carbon the tax. Member's time has expired. The question is that the motion be agreed to. The Leader of the House. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Order. The if Leader you of the want House to go to call. why this suspension is being moved, 
You don't oh, have to the look at the clean energy so. bills. No, you don't Sturt have to look at what legislation is before the parliament. You have to look at the TV guide. The TV guide. Because the TV guide shows that on ABC TV today at 3 p.m., Play School is Leader beginning. Leader of the House resume his place. The manager of opposition business on a point of order. Mr. Speaker, given that the Prime Minister has failed to uh, has failed to front this very important suspension, I move that the Leader of the House be no longer heard. Order. The question is that the member be no longer heard. All, of, all those of that opinion say aye. Contrary, no. I think the noes have it. Division required. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes. Order. Order.
Order. Lock the doors. The question is that the member be no longer heard. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. And I appoint the honourable members for Barker and Parks, Tellers for the ayes, and the members for Chifley and Shortland, Tellers for the noes. Order. The result of the division is I 71, no 75. The question is therefore negatived. The question is that the motion moved by the Leader of the Opposition be agreed to. All those of that. Order the Leader of the House. It's extraordinary that those opposite move a motion of suspension to allow a debate and then gag the debate. It says everything about their negativity, everything about what they're about on a day that we have clean energy legislation because, because we could get on with the business of the House that might allow the member for Wentworth to speak because we've had 120 speakers but he hasn't oh, spoken uh, because oh, he the agrees with us. The time has expired. The, the question is, the motion moved by the Leader of the Opposition for the suspension of standing and seasonal orders 
be agreed to. All those of that opinion say aye. Contrary, no. I think the noes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes. Or to lock the doors. The question is that the motion moved by the Leader of the Opposition for the suspension of standing and sessional orders be agreed to. The ayes will pass the right of the chair, the noes to the left, and I appoint the honourable members for Barker and Parks tell us for the ayes, and the members for Chifley and Shortland tell us for the noes. Order. The result of the division is I 72, no 74. The question is therefore negative. Members, please resume their places quickly and quietly. Order.
Order the Prime Minister. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. In the absence of any questions on the nation's interest from the opposition, I ask that further questions be placed on the notice paper. Order. Order. Would members please either resume their places or, if they are leaving the chamber, do so quickly. Order. I present Corrigenda to the Auditor-General's Annual Report for 2010-2011. Order. The member for Chisholm on indulgence. Well, question time. I was moving adoption of the uh, clean energy uh, bills, and I just wanted to very much put on the record my thanks to the secretariat. I think everybody who was involved in that would appreciate the work that went into the to the committee report. So Stephen Boyd, David Monk, Simon Winter, Philip Hilton, and Natasha Petrovic, who did an amazing amount of work, and I really did want to put that on the record. Thank you. Thank the member for Chisholm. Uh, I have received advice from the Chief Government Whip that, the, that he has nominated Mr Lyons to be a member of the Standing Committee on Climate Change, Environment and Arts in place of Mr KJ Thompson, the Leader of the House. I ask the Leader of the House to move a motion for the appointment of a member to serve on the Standing Committee on Climate Change, Environment and Is the Arts. Is there any objection to leave being granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. The Leader of the House. I move that Mr K. J. Thompson be discharged from the Standing Committee on Climate Change, Environment and the Arts, and that in his place, Mr Lyons be appointed a member of the committee. Well, the question is that the motion moved by the Leader of the House be agreed to. All those of those opinions say aye. If the contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. The Leader of the House. Mr Speaker, documents are tabled in accordance with the list circulated to honourable members earlier today. I move the House take note of documents numbered 1, 3, 4, 6, 8, 11, 12 and 13. Full details of the documents will be recorded in the votes and proceedings in Hansard. Order. The question is that the House take note of the documents. The member for Cowper. I move the debate be adjourned. Order. The question is that the, ha that the debate be adjourned and the adjourned debate be made in order of the day for the next day of sitting. All those of that opinion say aye. Contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. The Leader of the House. Uh, Mr Speaker, um, I ask uh, leave of the House. I, I ask uh, leave of the House to move a motion to suspend standing and sessional orders to enable the House to continue to consider government business from 9.30 pm until no later than 11 pm tonight. Is there any objection to leave being granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. The Leader of the House. Mr Speaker, I move that for this sitting that so much of the standing and sessional orders be suspended uh, as would prevent one government business having precedence from 9.30 pm until 11 pm, two the Speaker interrupting the debate at 11 pm if the House is still sitting and immediately adjourning the House, three any business being debated when the house is adjourned being listed on the notice paper for the next sitting and four any variation of this arrangement being made only by a motion, motion moved by a minister mr speaker briefly uh, there's an approach from the manager of opposition business to extend the time for consideration in detail of the clean energy bills this evening uh, the government is happy to accommodate that. Uh, this will allow for some certainty and for the debate to end at a reasonable time for the parliamentary staff, given that that will be a 14-hour sitting day today. I do indicate that uh, up to now we have had uh, 33 hours of debate up to question time. This will allow another six and a half hours of debate. There have already been uh, some 120 speakers to the clean energy bills, and uh, this will allow for further debate uh, this evening. I commend the resolution to the House. Order. The question is the motion be agreed to. The Manager of Opposition Business. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Just very briefly, I'm uh, glad that the uh, Leader of the House has agreed to extend the consideration in detail. Uh, for a couple of hours tonight, but in, in doing so, uh, can I make two points? The first is that there are still speakers on the speakers list for the second reading from both the opposition and the government who will not, not get the opportunity to make their speeches because the government is gagging the carbon tax package of bills, which is a shame uh, and a disgrace. Uh, secondly, can I say that the opportunity for consideration in detail 
the opposition for consideration in detail uh, would have been the perfect opportunity for the government to have these bills, these 19 bills, scrutinised by the parliament to ensure that the I's have been dotted and the T's have been crossed. In spite of the fact the opposition opposes this package legislation, consideration in detail is very important. And yet the Leader of the House's proposition was that there would only be three hours of consideration in detail on 19 different bills. Certainly we are extending that tonight through this motion, but quite frankly, if the Leader of the House wanted to get this legislation right, rather than just get it through and gag it, there would not be a vote be happening at five o'clock tonight on the second reading, and the consideration in detail would be left open-ended in order to give the parliament the proper time frame to properly consider the government's legislation. Order. The question is the motion moved by the Leader of the House be agreed to the Leader of the House. Speaker, in conclusion, uh, can I say that uh, the government would be happy to accommodate the two remaining opposition speakers who are not on the list. I'm speaking to conclude the debate Order. from the, the motion the that I moved to call. Uh, the Leader of the Opposition, the of course, they've never ever read a standing order in their life, Mr Speaker. But I'm prepared to, uh, we'd be prepared indeed to not have the MPI debate prepared to not have the MPI debate so as to allow the two remaining speakers the two remaining speakers to conclude uh, we on this side of the house uh, will make that offer uh, to the opposition uh, very publicly uh, we will not seek to have further speakers on the debate we'd be happy to accommodate uh, the opposition to have those two speakers uh, immediately and then we could have uh, the MPI debate in the remaining time if need be but uh, we'd be very happy to accommodate, to accommodate what the, uh, what the uh, manager of opposition business uh, requests. And it might be more useful than listening to the shadow treasurer. Order. Uh, Order. Than listening to the shadow treasurer. He couldn't bother, be bothered to turn up to the tax oh. forum or the jobs forum last week. Order. The question is that the motion moved by the Leader of the House be agreed to. All those of that opinion say aye. If the contrary, no. I think the ayes. Have it. The Leader of the House. I ask the Leader of the House to move the motion to suspend standing and session orders to enable uh, statements uh, on tax reform to be made. Is there any objection to leave being granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. The Leader of the House. I move that so much of the standing and session orders be suspended as would prevent one, the Treasurer, Shadow Treasurer and the member for line each making a 10-minute statement on tax reform in the House during government business time on Wednesday 12 October 2011. Two, after the conclusion of the statements in paragraph one, five-minute statements by members on tax reform being listed as an item of business in the main committee. And three, any variation of this arrangement be made only by a motion moved by a minister. Mr Speaker, as you'll be aware, in this parliament last week, the uh, tax forum was held. Uh, there were uh, 200 people came from from around the country, from around the country, Order. and engaged in serious policy debate. Uh, I certainly was pleased uh, to be there at what was an extremely successful forum and an exchange of ideas. Of course, uh, for those opposite the. The tripling Order. of the uh, income tax-free threshold from $6,200 up to $18,000 and the commitment by the government to increase it further to $21,000 is not tax reform. Of course, we have taken one million people through this legislation out of the tax system. What this will enable uh, the parliament to do uh, is to have an appropriate uh, debate tomorrow. It will be after the discussion. Uh, that takes place uh, tomorrow uh, in, and the determination of the clean energy bills. And the then, then we will have uh, this debate for half an hour. It will then be adjourned to the main committee to give other members an opportunity to participate in that debate. I indeed congratulate the member for line on, uh, on his initiative, on his initiative in supporting in supporting this forum and in participating in it. And it's a pity that those opposite simply can't be bothered to be engaged in the serious policy debates before the nation. Order. The question is that the motion moved by the Leader of the House be agreed to. All those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. The Chief Government Whip. 
Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I seek leave to move a motion to refer bills to the main committee for further consideration. Is there any objection to leave being granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. The Chief Government Whip. I thank the House. I move that the following bills be referred to the main committee for further consideration. Maritime Legislation Amendment Bill 2011 and Veterans Affairs Legislation Amendment Participants in British Nuclear Test Bill of 2011. Well, the, the question is that the motion moved by the Chief Government Whip referring certain bills to the main committee be agreed to. All those of that opinion say aye. Contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. Order. I have received a letter from the member for North Sydney proposing that a definite matter of public importance be submitted to the House for discussion, namely the failure of the government to properly consider the impact of a, a carbon tax on jobs and cost of living in this time of economic uncertainty. I call upon those members who approve the proposed discussion to rise in their places. The member for North Sydney. Thank you, Mr Speaker. This Treasurer and this government has put great emphasis on the creation of jobs as a core priority. That's as it should be. The Coalition fully supports this objective. When all the issues are boiled down, however, the best way to ensure prosperity for Australia is to ensure that everyone who wants a job has a job. At the press conference following the budget lock-up in May this year, the Treasurer said, and I quote, I was asked downstairs before, what do you think is the centrepiece of the budget? Well, it's jobs, jobs, jobs. In the last sitting week, the Treasurer repeated this theme, quote, we on this side of the House understand the importance of jobs and the dignity of work. The dignity of work is so important, not just to an individual families, but to an economy. That is why we put such a high priority on jobs. Unfortunately, the Treasurer is not backing his rhetoric with results. The labour market is deteriorating. Jobs are being lost. The number of unemployed is rising. The August Labor Force report showed that 23,200 jobs have been lost since March. More serious for families, 68,000 full-time jobs have disappeared. That's 68,000 former breadwinners who can no longer put food on the table. The number of full-time jobs is now around the same as it was back in November 2010. There has been no job growth in Australia in full-time jobs for nine months. The unemployment rate has increased from a recent low of 4.9 per cent to 5.3 per cent in August. Uh, and the figures are coming out for September later this week. And the ANZ job advertisements is a, uh, a the fall in ANZ job advertisements is a portent of what that may mean. So out of all of that, the number of people looking for work has jumped by 52,600 since April. The August figure for unemployed was the highest rate since October last year. These figures would not yet include the full impact of the coming job losses. At Blue Scope Steel, 1,400 jobs. One Steel, 400 jobs. Qantas, 1,000 jobs. And of course, Westpac, uh, one of Australia's largest employers, has flagged significant job losses. In the May budget, the government forecasts the unemployment rate to fall to 4.75 per cent by June next year. This forecast is now clearly at risk. And it's not just one sector doing it tough. The job losses have been widely spread across industries. Over the six months to August, there were nearly 50,000 jobs lost in manufacturing in Australia, 21,000 job losses from wholesale trade. 5,000 from retail, 18,000 from accommodation and food services, which is effectively the tourism industry, particularly in regional remote areas, 13,000 job losses in transport, 7,000 job losses in media and communications, 8,000 job losses in the property industry, and 9,000 jobs lost from scientific and professional services. There has been some job growth. Of course, mining has been up, as you would expect, 21,000, and associated construction has been up 30,000. But the job gains in these high-growth sectors were not enough to make up for the losses in those sectors of the economy outside of the mining sector. The mining sector represents about 9 per cent of our economy, just 2 per cent of direct jobs in Australia. 
uh, but the challenge is for the rest of the economy that is being left behind. And there is clear evidence that the non-mining sectors are being squeezed very hard by higher interest rates and a high Australian dollar. It might also be that capricious decisions by this government, for example, live cattle exports, one of the worst decisions I have seen in 15 years in this place. And, and that fifth, from this government, as the Deputy Leader of the Opposition says, it is a big call from this government, but let me make it perfectly clear. That live cattle export ban, which prevented 180,000 Australian head going to Indonesia, is a catastrophe for the northern parts of Australia and primary production. And it properly, and the, I wonder why the Prime Minister hasn't picked up the phone to the President of Indonesia recently. I wonder if the, Prime, the President of Indonesia wouldn't even return her calls after what she did to Indonesia when it came to live cattle exports. But that's the, that's the way this government operates. There can be no excuses for rising unemployment at a time when the country is experiencing unprecedented demand for our resources and 140-year highs in our terms of trade. So what's the government done? Well, they had a jobs forum. It's typical of Labor's approach to problems. Don't fix it. Let's talk about it. Let's get everyone together, hold hands, sing kumbaya, and maybe we'll come up with a solution to the challenges of the nation. And the talk fest in this case broke all records. It just went for 24 hours, one day. Uh, usually the Labor Party has two or three day talk fests, but no, when it comes to jobs, it was just one day. So that wouldn't have been any comfort to the 68,000 full-time breadwinners who have lost their jobs since April. Not surprisingly, out of a jobs forum, the outcomes were limited. But there were two fundamental undertakings given by this Prime Minister. First, make major federal grants of $20 million or more, including grants to the states and territories, contingent on maximising opportunities for Australian businesses. And second, require future project developers to publish more extensive details on opportunities available to Australian businesses if they want to receive a 5 per cent tariff exemption on imports for major projects through the EPBS scheme. So, as the Leader of the Opposition has stated, both were credible initiatives, but they're not going to lead to the reappearance of jobs. For example, it is the case that the mining industry in Western Australia already has to provide the government of Western Australia with regular details on the amount of Australian produce involved, uh, product involved in their mines. A keynote speaker at the forum, Andrew Liveris, President and Chairman and CEO of Dow Chemical, has previously called the decision to proceed with a carbon tax unwise and ill-timed. Bear in mind the government asked this fellow to come along to the jobs forum, and here he was quite appropriately criticising the carbon tax. So the government couldn't even pick a uh, keynote speaker that would support their job-killing carbon tax. The government wants us to believe that introducing carbon tax will have no impact on jobs. I observed earlier today there's a statement in the updated Treasury modelling on the carbon tax, and I quote, this is actually in their modelling. It says, employment continues to grow strongly, with national employment increasing by 1.6 million jobs by 2020, with or without carbon pricing. So Treasury assumes that all workers in trade-exposed and carbon-intensive industries will immediately find new green jobs. The Treasury modelling says there is no impact whatsoever of the carbon tax on jobs. And in fact, and in fact it doesn't make any difference to jobs. So that means effectively you can penalise Australian export industries. You can make the cost of production far more expensive for Australian manufacturers and according to the inputs from Treasury, there will be no impact on jobs. Well, I and my colleagues have been travelling the country from Caratha to Perth to Cairns uh, down to uh, Tasmania. And I can say to you emphatically, that is not what the employers think. That is not what small business thinks. That's not what the tourism industry thinks. That's not what the manufacturing industry thinks. That's not what the steel workers think. That is not what the professional service providers think. They all know, because they employ people, that the carbon tax will cost jobs. And the Treasury advice 
in this case is dead wrong. So I'm concerned that the recent deterioration in the labour market may not yet be over. Uh, I don't want to alarm workers of Australia, but I think there is quite a clear case to be made that this government uh, is totally, totally inconsiderate about their jobs. And the latest IMF report card, which uh, the Treasury keeps misrepresenting, but uh, everything else he does as well, it's no surprise here, it was released five days ago and it says, the risks are tilted to the downside. It says the key downside risks are that the global recovery stalls or Asian growth falters impacting demand for commodities. So funding markets could also be disrupted by concerns about sovereign debt in advanced economies. And the outlook is fragile. And the Treasurer knows the outlook is fragile because he's coming to us asking us to expedite our policy uh, to allow for covered bonds to be issued by Australian banks. And he says it's urgent because of the fragility of the funding of Australian banks. Well, yes, that's why we raised it more than a year ago. We identified this issue. We saw the challenge coming. And it's now that the Treasurer suddenly wakes up and says, oh, this is urgent. The funding needs of the Australian banks must be delivered urgently. And that's why he's pressing us to get our agreement to expedite the covered bonds bill, a bill that we that we suggested in policy form over a year ago. Now, let me be very clear about this. I'm not as concerned about funding requirements as the government is. While some European banks are, are experiencing difficulty accessing finance, Australian banks remain highly rated, well capitalised and with little exposure to European debt. However, the coalition will support the initiative because we are the ones that suggested the policy. And if it needs to be done quickly, we will help to expedite that. But if it is the case that it's so urgent, why doesn't the government delay the carbon tax bills to bring on the covered bond bills? Because the government wants to destroy the jobs to make business and commerce in Australia more expensive before it actually gets anything in place that's going to make it more affordable. So I've been warning about the global risk to Australia for some time. The May budget forecasts solid economic growth prospects and a return to surplus in 2012-13, on the back of the strongest terms of trade in 140 years. Not a finger has been lifted by the government. They're sitting back and waiting for China to do all the heavy lifting when it comes to the budget. But it's foolish to base our economic plan for the future on the assumption that these unprecedented good times will continue. In my post-budget National Press Club address, I noted that the May budget showed a relatively small fall in the terms of trade. Only 4 per cent would plunge the 2012-13 budget back into deficit. At that time, little did I know, after the Treasurer had claimed that the carbon tax package would be roughly budget neutral, little did I know that it in fact takes away over $4 billion from the budget. So this is a Treasurer that thinks budget neutrality is when you actually have a deficit of $4.5 billion on a single policy initiative. The IMF is now flagging a very near and present danger. So it's no, uh, it's no surprise that the Treasurer is backing away from his promise to deliver a budget surplus in 12-13. In recent weeks, the promise has morphed from an objective to an expectation, a determination, a plan, a guiding principle, he said. More recently, he said he'd give it his best shot. So if the Treasurer can't commit to a surplus, then it will prove that the so-called strategy to repay the mountain of debt that Labor has created has failed and is in tatters. Now, given the increasingly uncertain outlook for the global economy and the risk for Australia, now is not the time to be saddling our economy and Australian workers with the carbon tax. The recently re released report by the Senate Select Committee on the Scrutiny of New Taxes, uh, which was chaired by Senator Matthias Cormann, uh, assessed whether Australia should implement such a tax followed by an emissions trading scheme at a time of great uncertainty, both about the economic outlook and even more so about the nature and extent of the international abatement effort. The committee found that the carbon tax will have a substantial impact on our Australia. Many Australian jobs are in industries that are carbon intensive. The committee also found that the government's own modelling, under the government's own modelling, the carbon tax is likely to impose a trillion dollar cost on the Australian economy. And this trillion dollars is, uh, as the Leader of the Opposition said earlier in this place, 
is roughly the equivalent of a total output of our nation in one year today. So obviously uh, there are a number of issues that need to be addressed, and the Senate committee did a great job of making a number of recommendations. Ultimately, however, the best way to create jobs, the best way to stimulate the Australian economy, the best way to inoculate us against global volatility, the best way to handle the immediate future is not to have a carbon tax. The best way to promote job growth in Australia, the best way to give security to Australian families, the best way to stabilise the cost of living for Australian families is not to have a carbon tax. And Mr Speaker, when it comes down to it, the Labor Party talks up jobs but delivers little. When it comes to it, the Labor Party talks up reform, but all it delivers is pain. The carbon tax is pain, and it's going to cost Australians jobs. Order. The honourable member's time has expired. I now give the call to the honourable the assistant treasurer. Thank you, Mr. Acton Speaker. I listened very carefully to the shadow treasurer's address, but as ever, I was disappointed. Uh, we've heard the proposition. The proposition put forward by the opposition uh, is about the carbon tax, and they say it's the wrong time. In my submissions today, I'm going to put forward five arguments to rebut what the shadow treasurer was saying. And in essence, what I'll say is that yes, this government has properly considered the changes. That yes, this government is about protecting and creating jobs. Yes, this government's about supporting pensioners. Yes, that in a time of economic uncertainty, we're not acting alone, but in fact consistent with where the world is heading. And finally, if those first four arguments have failed to uh, persuade you, uh, I would certainly then just look at the record of the opposition. That when it comes to uh, when it comes to getting the big calls right, the opposition have never missed an opportunity to miss an opportunity. But now, turning to the first submission about why we don't accept the uh, hypothesis of the opposition, we have properly considered that this argument put forward in the shadow treasurer's uh, submission or debate. He says that we haven't had time to consider this debate. Well, where has he been for the last five years? What, where has he been hiding for the last five years? We have had more discussion on climate change than many other issues that were ever discussed. I certainly don't recollect the opposition when they were in government discussing their hardline work choices reforms for five years before they introduced them. But on the contrary, we have seen climate change and carbon pricing being debated for years. In fact, uh, the former Prime Minister of the United Kingdom, Margaret Thatcher, raised the issue of climate change as far back as the late 1980s. Former Prime Minister John Howard, if he had been re-elected in 2007, was going to introduce an emissions trading scheme. Certainly on this side of the fence, both our former Prime Minister Rudd and our Prime Minister Gillard have been debating the need to act on climate change for many years. Uh, a former leader of the uh, Liberal Party, uh, Brendan Nelson, certainly when he was opposition leader, was committed to acting on climate change. And indeed another former leader of the uh, Liberal Party, uh, the, member, the member for Wentworth, he's certainly been an active proponent and, uh, about climate change until, of course, today, where the proverbial cat has got his tongue, or dare I say it, the Liberal whips. But indeed, when we've looked at our debating it, we've also had a cross-party committee negotiation process, which was very thorough, very detailed. Lots of effort led by the Minister for Climate Change and supported by the Parliamentary Secretary for Climate Change. But there's been a very thorough process to discuss climate change. And indeed, yet again, whenever you hold a party, the coalition just won't turn up to participate. And of course, the late change in the game is not the government introducing a price on pollution. It is saying that the coalition doesn't even believe in a carbon price anymore as they did when they were last in office. So let us be clear, the first submission I'm putting to dispute the opposition's contention is that there has been a great deal of debate upon, upon climate change and a great deal of uh, argument and research and science has gone into the proposition. The second submission which I'd put forward, which shows that the opposition's attack on our, our efforts to tackle climate change are misplaced, is having a look at the jobs record of this Labor government. Let us be clear, even though, even though those ungracious people sitting opposite us in the parliament have said that uh, they, they, they never say anything good about the government, let us not forget that during the global financial crisis, no, during the global financial crisis, due to the excellent stimulus programs of the building education revolution, we've seen we've seen we've seen 750,000 jobs created in Australia. 
And indeed, and indeed, between June of 2009 and June of 2010, in the teeth of the global financial crisis, we saw 190,000 jobs created in small business. Indeed, the fastest sector to recover, and this is in part due, in part due to the excellent policies of the Labor government. But we also understand, we also understand, unlike the member for Dawson, that um, the world doesn't stand still. We understand that we cannot rely on the sleepy hollow of national party economics to try and uh, move this country forward. We understand that there is an international race on for clean technology jobs. We understand, unlike uh, the leader of the National Party, that in fact the world does not owe Australia a living and we cannot take our place in the world for granted. There's a race on for clean tech, new manufacturing, low pollution, economic service, green collar jobs of the future. And unlike the opposition, we don't want to give up competing with the rest of the world. We do not believe that Australia is doomed to a second-class existence. We do not believe that Australian industry cannot compete with the rest of the world. The sooner we have a market mechanism to turbocharge our innovative efforts, the better off we're going to be in the global race. These people want to tie, one, they want to tie our two legs together in the economic race to the future. But indeed, let us also have a look at the facts. Since we announced, uh, uh, I just warned the opposition, low incoming fact, do duck. Um, since we've announced that we'd be introducing a price in carbon in February, mining employment has grown by 10 per cent. The coal mining industry employment has grown by 10 per cent. Now, how can this be if the threats of the opposition have any truth? Whilst Mr Abbott and the Coal Association, the employers' union for the coal industry, has been busy trying to scare the pants of hard-working miners, 21,000 new mining jobs have come on stream across Australia—21,000 new jobs. And furthermore, furthermore, we are very lucky that the capitalists of the world do not take their economic and investment strategy from those opposite, because in this time of 2011-12, Mining capital expenditure is expected to be around $82 billion. We'd have to call that an inconvenient truth. But whilst those opposite would say that this price on carbon is the end of mining and we might as well fill in all the holes in the ground, uh, in fact, that is not the case. And it's almost been double. It's almost been double. I, I, again, I'm, I'm happy for the minister, for the, uh, for the leader of the uh, National Party, to take some notes here, if he doesn't read it in Hansard. $82 billion this year is double, almost double what it was last year, which was $47 billion. There's a lot going on in Australia. Just no one's bothered to tell the opposition. And indeed, and indeed, and indeed, um, last month. Last month, here's a contemporaneous fact, as opposed to an economics textbook written in 1920, read by the Nationals. In the last month alone, I didn't mean to imply that the member for Dawson reads books. Uh, in the last month alone, Chevron, BHP, and Rio. Chevron, BHP, and Rio. They're a bunch of milk bars. No, they're not. They're some of the biggest mining companies in the world. They've announced new projects or expansions in the resource sector worth more than $30 billion in total. Hold the hold. Hold the, hold the presses. Hasn't anyone told them that the carbon pollution tax, according to the opposition, is going to ruin their industry? Clearly not. Because, of course, those opposite know so much more than the boards of, the, the boards of these big companies. They know so much more that they'll ignore the $30 billion of these projects. They'll ignore the $82 billion in mining capital expenditure. They'll ignore the 21,000 new jobs created. In fact, in fact, again, I, I know it's a bit like arm wrestling with a with a child here. I don't mean to intellectually arm wrestle those opposite. But what I would say is that since we've announced the price on carbon, since we've announced the price on carbon, 14 companies have announced new projects or expansions in the resource sectors. Now, how can this be? How can those opposites say? How can those opposites say that the carbon pollution, uh, setting a price on carbon pollution, is such a bad idea? 82 billion dollars of investment. 21,000 new jobs, 30 billion with Rio, BHP, and Chevron, and we are seeing that uh, 14 companies have announced new projects or expansions in the resource sector. Anyway, that was just my second submission. So the jobs are being created. We want to win the competition of the future. The mining industry is moving forward. But then let's have a look at this debate, where um, where the opposition say that pensioners and people are going to be worse off underneath these schemes. If I haven't convinced. Uh, if I haven't convinced the um, intellectual Amazon's opposite of the first two points, let me then put to this proposition about the pension income rise. Now, what was written in the financial standard? The financial standards are 
is a financial journal. Financial journal. Um, superannuation investors aged between 55 and 59. 55 and 59, that would be the average age of those opposite, are set to receive a tax-free income boost if carbon tax relief measures are implemented according to MLC Technical Services. Now, what would they know? You're right, MLC Technical Services. Pension investors of that age would be able to receive an extra $1,500 in taxable pension income without paying any tax. Nice one, I'd say. $1,500 is good money. Um, from the 1st of July 2015, they'll be entitled to an extra $2,000 in tax-free income compared to now. Take into account the 15 per cent pension tax offset. This is going to lead to tax savings of around $280 and $360, respectively. Now, a lady called Gemma Dale, who's the head of MLC Technical Services, you'll probably be doing a Google search to check if she's not a secret member of the Labor Party, which she's not. It means that people can draw more income if required from their pension investment without paying any tax. However, however, uh, if the, it, what it says is currently those in the 55 to 59 age bracket can receive taxable pension income of up to $48,000 before being taxed. But if and when we get the clean energy bill through this parliament and when it's implemented and the income tax rates are amended, that figure is going to rise to $49,753 and $50,189 in 2015. This is good news. This is good news. So I think that when we have a look at the debate, I mean, unlike Prime Minister Howard, who once famously said working Australians have never been better off, that was just before he introduced work choices, the Gillard government understands that we have a multi-speed economy and many are doing it tough. But that is why we've got the good fortune of high employment, low inflation, good terms of trade and low, low Commonwealth public sector debt. Now I do understand, and Australians do understand in my fourth submission, that of course in these tough times globally it is very volatile. But there is no doubt in the mind of the government, and indeed no doubt in the, in the minds of the serious journalists and the people who are aware of what's going on in the world, that the rest of the world is acting on climate change. This is a very important point because the opposition has been at great pains to say Australia is going out on its own. We're so far ahead of the pack that we're just crazy. We're just crazy. In fact, over 30 countries, over 30 countries have carbon pricing in place and have already started the transformation to a low pollution economy. To, uh, if, the member, if the member for Dawson had ceased interjecting, he's got one mouth and two the ears, and I'd suggest he should use will the two cease ears. Interjecting. He's had a pretty good go. Oh, he's pretty good the assistant go. Treasurer's had he's the applying call. for a job on the Comedy Channel. There's no question about that. Now, countries comprising of over, but I don't know how we'll go getting the job, comprising over 80, countries comprising over 80 per cent of global emissions have pledged to take action on climate change. Europe has had a price on carbon since 2005. New Zealand has an emissions trading scheme. The United States, President Obama is coming here next, next month. He'll no doubt be queuing up to shake his hand. He has a clean energy target of 80 per cent by 2035. California, California, whilst you probably those opposite just think it's the set for Baywatch, the reality is it's also the world's sixth largest economy with twice the population of Australia. They've legislated to introduce an ETS. In less than 25 years, in less the than 25 years, is warned. In less than 25 years, 80% of US energy needs will be supplied by clean energy. The UK has updated its emission targets. India's got a tax on coal. They're using the revenue from this tax to invest in clean energy. The honourable member for Flynn will now remain silent. China has uh, pledged to lower carbon emissions per unit of GDP by 40 to 45 per cent by 2020. The Productivity Commission, the Productivity Commission, no doubt you think they're a, the Productivity Commission, no doubt those opposite will rubbish them too, as they rubbish anyone who disagrees with them, has identified over 1,000 carbon reduction policies across Bradfield seven of our major silent. trading partners, nearly a third of which are in the U.S. So, having said, and having I think uh, established that plenty of parts of the rest of the world are acting. Having established that this government has a good record in terms of jobs, and we're always focused on the new jobs, and we won't accept the lazy tyranny of low expectations with an opposition who doesn't believe that Australia can ever compete on climate change with the rest of the world. And having also demonstrated that pensioners are getting supported, nine in ten households will receive some form of support. If all of those four submissions have somehow failed to climb, to climb the Mount Everest of scepticism of those opposite. Here's the big one. Here's the big one. I did say at the start of my proposition that um, the opposition, 
never fail to miss an opportunity, never miss an opportunity to miss an opportunity. And when we look at some of the big calls right, and look at the coalition, and let's have a look at how some of the big calls the coalition have got wrong. I think that this could only but assist you believe that the coalition are making another uh, big call which is wrong. On work choices, on work choices, we said you were going too far, and you know what? You did. Uh, in terms of Indigenous Australians, we said you should say sorry to the stolen generations, and it took a Labor government to do it. Although I recognise eventually, with the support of all those opposite, by one or two. On the global financial crisis, you wouldn't support that. You wouldn't support it. it. Didn't turn up to work that day intellectually, and we stimulated the economy and avoided recession. On the national broadband network, in 10 years' time, you watch the revisionism from those revisionists over there. They'll say it was all their idea. And look at the floods in Queensland. You didn't support the levy. You wouldn't support the levy in a time of trouble for the nation. Yet we're seeing the impact of the levy building badly needed infrastructure and flood affected Australia. And you're doing it again on climate change. Well, we're onto this while we're still in opposition, and we're implementing a clean energy future. All and the big the one's the mining tax. All you want to do is give money back to the richest companies expired. in Australia. I now give the call to the honourable the leader of the Nationals. Today, all Australians, whether they're businesses or families, stand at the edge. Families are very worried about their future. Business confidence has fallen to the sort of levels you see in a depression. Closed shops, silent factories are a monument to Labor's economic failure. 68,000 jobs lost since April, unemployment rising across the, across the nation. In my own electorate of Wide Bay, the unemployment rate has increased from 3.4 per cent when the coalition left office to over 12.5 per cent under Labor. What a shameful record for a government to treble the unemployment rate in a fast-growing area of regional Australia. This government seems to not care about the economic pain and the hardship that it's imposing on Australian families. But before them now is the prospect of an Australian government offering them up as sacrificial lambs on the altar of the carbon tax. The government concedes that this carbon tax will do nothing to change the climate. The government acknowledges that it will not work as an initiative to, to lower the temperatures. Uh, of course, it never could. At around 1.4 per cent of global emissions, even if we sacrificed all of Australian industry, if we produced zero emissions, if we stopped breathing, if we lived in the trees, it would make absolutely no difference to the global climate. And you've only got to listen recently now to the UK Chancellor where, uh, saying that Europe's, oh, sorry, UK's 2 per cent of emissions are irrelevant when it comes to the world's climate. Why does Australia think, why do members opposite think that Australia's 1.4 per cent can single-handedly change the world's climate, save the polar bears, can, can save the barrier reef? This is simply nonsense. And for the member who has just spoken to suggest that the rest of the world is rushing headlong into introducing taxes of this nature is simply misreading or dishonestly uh, reciting the, the true situation. The reality is President Barmer will not, when he comes to Australia, have a story to tell of, a, of an economy-wide carbon tax in, in, in uh, the US. Indeed, it will only take one month of Australia's carbon tax to collect more money than the Americans have collected from their carbon taxation since it began several years ago. Only one month under our scheme to collect more than the Americans have ever collected. We are not catching up with the rest of the world. We are implementing the world's harshest carbon tax. The Europeans are currently collecting over their 30 countries referred to by the, by the, by the, by the, by the assistant treasurer are collecting about one dollar per person per year from the people of, the, of, the Euro, of Europe. Our tax collects four hundred dollars per person per year right at the outset. This is a haunting prospect for, the Australian, for Australian families. Their costs are going up enough as it is under this incompetent government. But now to add 
The, the impact of the world's biggest carbon tax is something that surely is, can only be seen as shameful. The Gillard government intends to consign future generations of Australians to massive cost hikes in perpetuity. This tax starts at $400 per person per year and goes up every year from then on. The carbon price will inevitably increase the cost of living pressures. Our competitive with our trading partners will, be, will plummet and Australian jobs will be fewer and harder to come by. Now, Mr Deputy Speaker, I know that there are those in the government ranks that don't really, in their heart of hearts, support this legislation, but they're tied to the carbon tax for two reasons. Now, it may even be the Prime Minister believed what she said before the election, that there'll be no carbon tax under the government she led. Maybe she was trying to tell the truth. But the green zealots have more say over government policy than Labor's backbench. More say, it seems, than even the Prime Minister. When Bob Brown is grinning like a Cheshire cat at Labor rubber stamping his legislative agenda and proclaiming it's a great day, you know there's something very, very wrong. Secondly, the powers that be within Labor have punted the ALP's political future on a carbon tax, bl bloody-mindedly pushing this legislation through regardless of its impact on the nation regardless that of all other countries in the world are moving in a different direction, all in the hope that people will perhaps get used to it before the next election. The faceless men have determined the direction and the Australian people will have to bear the consequences. They surge forward regardless of the prevailing economic uncertainty engulfing the globe and failing to heal the world financial storm clouds that are approaching. Instead, they're putting political self-interest ahead of the national interest yet again. To those Labor members of parliament whose constituents are screaming out for their members to stand up for them, I urge them to listen and obey the will of your own people. They know that their constituents don't support this great big new tax. They know it's bad for the country. They know it's bad for their jobs. Their constituents are telling them but they put their hands over their ears, like the honourable member opposite, pretending not to hear. <laughs> pretending not to hear. And what about the members for New England yeah, and the member for Lyme, who have been door. very active in supporting the carbon tax? They didn't even bother to ask the people of their electorates their opinions. They've conducted surveys on various issues, but never once chose to ask their own electors what they thought about the carbon tax. Well, for, fortunately, Senator Williams has taken on that task for himself. He sent a questionnaire to all the people in line and New England, and he got answers back. Significant numbers, thousands of people have responded to his survey. And on the latest count, I saw 83 per cent of the people of Lyon and New England are saying they don't want a carbon tax. Now, these independent members like to say they're the voice of the people. Well, the people have spoken. The people in, in line and the people in New England have spoken. They don't want the carbon tax. So if they really believe they're representing their own people, they have no option tonight other than to vote against this evil tax. They have no option but to vote against. It's bad enough that the Prime Minister has misled Australians in the name of political expediency and bowed to the will of the Greens and independents to remain in the lodge. But what of those of her party behind her who just blindly follow? What a bound and gag caucus that, that fails to stand up in the wake of those backroom deals. They should not be passive passengers going along for the ride, but their inaction makes every one of them complicit in this base betrayal of the Australian people. Given that the only community consensus that the Prime Minister has rallied around her in relation to the carbon tax is one of comprehensive rejection. Any Labor member who doesn't have the fortitude to cross the floor and be a hero with their working men and women across their own electorates, they are letting down their voters. Bad. They're letting down their voters. Bad. Because in the end, it's going to be ordinary families that will cop this carbon tax. Yep. They're the ones that are going to pay and keep on paying and pay more every year. 
It's their jobs that will be lost. It's their future that's being compromised. Electricity bills will blow out, gas, groceries, everything that they need. In fact, from the 1st of July 2012, if Labor and the Greens and the Independents get their way, Australians will start paying $105 billion in tax between then and 2020. And it gets worse and worse. Around a trillion dollars will be ripped from our economy at a time when our economy is already in such great difficulties. A trillion dollars, not much less than the Australian economy turns over in a year these days. And the government's going to throw all that away. It'll cost jobs, destroy manufacturing, and certainly re re result in a deteriorating standard of living for all Australians. Mr Deputy Speaker, this is a tax that will deliver nothing of good for this country. It will do nothing to boost our employment. There will be no new green jobs. Whatever there are are being created in China. Australia's last solar panel manufacturer is closing along with so many other manufacturing industries in this country. This is a tax that will hurt this country that is, that, that will, and, and, and this day will be a day of infamy in the minds of, of Australians for future generations. And what's worst of all, it will do nothing to the global environment. It will do nothing to improve the climate. It will do nothing for this country Order. and nothing for our planet. The Honourable Leader's time has expired. I now call the Honourable the Cabinet Secretary and Parliamentary Secretary for Climate Change and Energy Efficiency. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. What the uh, member for North Sydney and the member for Wide Bay and all of those opposite seem to completely and utterly fail to realise is that the reform of the government's carbon price package is about creating new jobs for Australians and attracting investment in the clean technology industries of the future. But led by the weather vane leader of the opposition, whose idea of long term appears to be 12 hours after the 24-hour news cycle, what is the problem for, the, for those opposite is that they cannot recognise anything long term. They cannot recognise, and we see this again from the speech that we've just heard from the leader of the National Party, they cannot recognise that this is a global problem. They cannot recognise that this is a problem that Australia needs to make a contribution to. And both the speakers that we've had today from the opposition, Deputy Speaker, seem to have forgotten that the coalition says, and I say that advisedly, they, the coalition says that it shares the government's target of a 5 per cent reduction of Australia's carbon emissions by 2020. And the reason I have to say says is that nothing about the coalition's conduct, nothing about the way that the coalition has approached the carbon price suggests that in any way, Deputy Speaker, the opposition takes this seriously. Instead, we have had today and yesterday and for many months now, we have had mindless negativity. We have had from those opposite effectively talking down our economy, talking down our businesses, talking down our workers, because that is the approach that those opposite have taken. Mr Speaker, the best thing that we can do for Australian businesses and for Australian families is to put in place a carbon price that will be part of the fundamentals going forward into the 21st century of a modern competitive economy powered by clean energy. And that is a realisation that countries around the world, particularly those in Western Europe, but more close at hand in New Zealand, have already come to. The reality is that if, that if we wish Australia to prosper the in the 21st Ford century, if we, wish, sitting where he should be if, he wants to make noise. If, if we wish Australians to prosper in the first-rate economy that Australia is entitled to into the future, then it can't be with anything other than a clean energy economy. And all of the credible analysis, including the report by Sir Nicholas Stern in the United Kingdom and the reports that have been done for us by Ross Garno here in our country show that we can make big cuts in carbon pollution in our country while the economy continues to grow strongly. And that, of course, is the path that those in Western Europe have already embarked on. It's the path that uh, across the Tasman, the government of New Zealand, with bipartisan agreement, has already embarked on. And it's the path that we will start on when 
the government's clean energy package passes through the House of Representatives tomorrow. We have Treasury modelling, Deputy Speaker, that shows that under a carbon price starting at $20, the economy grows strongly, with average growth in gross national income per capita of 1.1 per cent a year, down from 1.2 per cent a year. The Treasury modelling shows that average incomes continue to grow strongly, rising by about $9,000 per person by 2020 in real terms. The Treasury modelling shows that jobs will continue to grow strongly, with 1.6 million additional jobs by 2020. And the Treasury modelling shows that while this growth is occurring, carbon pollution will fall by 160 million tonnes per year in 2020. And we also know, Deputy Speaker, that the longer we wait, the greater the costs will be. The costs will increase the longer we delay. Failure to act now will only undermine our future competitiveness, and that will be so, of course, if we delay, as is proposed by those opposite, uh, with their proposal to amend the legislation to put off the start of the carbon price scheme. There is a clear economic consensus, Deputy Speaker, that we need a carbon price for future jobs, we need a carbon price for future growth, and although you wouldn't have known it from the way in which the uh, member for North Sydney spoke earlier, uh, you wouldn't have known it from the references that the member for North Sydney has made to uh, the, work of the recent work of the International Monetary Fund with its report on Australia, but last week in that report the International Monetary Fund endorsed our carbon price policy saying that they support, and I'll quote, the proposed introduction of a carbon price as a transition to a permits trading system to mitigate greenhouse gas emissions, end quote. And that's, of course, the IMF in the same report as the IMF congratulated the Australian government on the firm action that we took during the global financial crisis and on the policies that we have put in place since that time. We know from the work of the Productivity Commission reported to this parliament in May this year that the costs to the economy will be much higher under the policies of those opposite. And, of course, the time is coming, Deputy Speaker, when the spotlight will now turn to the policies of the coalition, the so-called direct action policy, which, of course, will lead directly to higher prices and higher taxes over time, this policy of paying polluters, which is in fact what is proposed by those opposite. The reason I say, Deputy Speaker, that the spotlight will turn to those opposite is that uh, once this legislation passes through the House of Representatives and then within weeks passes through the Senate and becomes law, uh, we will have increasing hysteria, as the Prime Minister said earlier today, increasing hysteria from those opposite as they uh, continue to assert that they are going to repeal our carbon price mechanism. And of course, if that is to be believed, and I don't think for a moment that it is, Deputy Speaker, if that is to be believed, the opposition will need to demonstrate what they will replace the carbon price mechanism with. And of course, at the moment, it's the pathetic fig leaf of a policy that was produced in February 2010 uh, by the opposition, which hasn't been updated, has not been altered in any way. And it's a plan under which polluters will be paid by the government to reduce pollution. The opposition's policy is in effect, in, in effect to tax the people to give money to polluters. Under our plan, polluters will pay for their pollution by paying the carbon price on every tonne of pollution that they produced. And I'll just mention a few more differences, Deputy Speaker. Under the government's plan, markets pick the most effective ways to reduce pollution. Under the opposition's approach, the government would pick winners. Under the government's plan, business would have long-term investment certainty. Under the opposition's approach, there would be no investment certainty. Under the government's plan, we will continue with Labor's great tradition of long-term reform of the economy. Under the opposition's approach, there would be no more than a stopgap political solution. In fact, as was revealed very clearly in a debate that the member for Flinders conducted against me last week in Melbourne, the opposition has no plan after 2020. 
That was the answer of the member for Flinders when asked, what is the opposition going to do if it were to be in government after 2020? And his answer, this is the opposition spokesman on climate change matters, said, I will be reviewing things in 2015. And if you examine the pathetic fig leaf of a policy that the opposition has put forward, the so-called direct action plan, that's of course the answer that one reads, because there is nothing after 2020. There is no plan. There is no trajectory of uh, falling emissions as there is under the government's plan. There is no certainty. There is no long-term predictability. Under the government's plan, Deputy Speaker, households would be assisted. Nine in ten Australian households will receive assistance. Under the government's carbon price plan, under the opposition's approach, there would be no assistance for households. Under the government's plan, Australia will meet the emissions targets that are, we, are, we are told by those opposite are bipartisan targets. We are told that those opposite agree with them, but under the opposition's approach, on no view could those targets be met, and those opposite know this. That's why they don't want to talk about their own plan. They don't want to talk about what they would replace the government's uh, carbon price mechanism with. Those opposite know that the government's plan is the most effective, the fairest and the most affordable way of transforming our economy, but they can't admit it because to do so would require the coalition to reflect on the complete ineffectiveness of their own policy. And instead, we have those opposite scratching around for any excuse, any excuse to delay the action that is needed to be started now to begin Australia on the task of reducing our national emissions, the excuse to Order. delay anything to the avoid Honourable taking action. The Cabinet yeah. Secretary's time has expired. I now call the Honourable Member for Herbert. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. The Shadow Minister and Member for Goldstein said in this place, if the carbon tax was to be levied only in Victoria, is it not conceivable that business would look at shifting to a neighbouring state? One of the major problems with this tax is that it does not reward growth. It does not provide a stimulus to get bigger, better, more profitable, make more stuff, employ more people. Because if you get bigger under this tax and manufacturing or, in, on, or industry, you will use more energy and the tax will grow. You are much better off shifting the process offshore and escape the tax. And that is where we are with this tax. And I just want to keep this as local as I can possibly do with my city of Townsville. Take Queensland Nickel. It employs 900 people directly and 1,200 indirectly. Just two short years ago, this place almost closed. It was poorly run under BHP's business model and it was not doing what it should do, process and refine ore into nickel. Had it closed, it was estimated at having a $4.5 billion negative impact on the economy of Townsville. Clive Palmer gave the plant over to the management and the staff and they concentrated on what they, what they do best. They turned it around and have made a profit. Now, the current price for nickel is hovering around the low to mid $8 mark, which is line ball commercially. They have used the heat in their plant to generate electricity and they have uh, made great strides in making this plant the best of its kind in the world. Processing, uh, processing nickel is highly energy, energy intensive. Its major competitors are from Brazil and Cuba. In fact, they are the only two other places in the world that use the Caron type uh, uh, refining method. They say that the areas around the Cuban uh, refinery are toxic. You neither fish nor swim anywhere near them. The men and women from Queensland Nickel that I know who, uh, say you can almost walk on the smoke billowing out of the furnaces in Brazil. These are two other countries will not be paying a carbon tax. Now we have seen six different classifications for paper production in this tax, but only one for nickel. Queensland Nickel is, is exposed to around $20 million from the start of this tax, and it will only become more and more expensive year after year ahead. The ore is sourced on international markets. The ore is sold on international commodity markets. There is nowhere for Queensland Nickel to pass this cost on. They will have to absorb it internally. Now, what happens when it becomes too much? Will the world be a better place? No. The ore will still be refined. It will, in fact, produce a worse result for the world if Brazil and Cuba get more ore and more market share. Can I share with something in relation to the Townsville City Council? The Townsville City Council has conducted its research on the figures provided by the government. 
they have found that they will be short between $3 million and $5 million per year from year one. Uh, and that's after this government's taxpayer-funded compensation. That will mean a rate rise to the residents of Townsville, the property owners of Townsville, of between two and three percent in year one, and so, uh, so, that we could, uh, so that they can have their rubbish collected and have their street and traffic lights on. There will be no benefit to the ratepayers of Townsville, and that will just be the start. And that will be repeated across the country in every city and every town where electricity is used and garbage is collected. Can I speak about the residents of Palm Island and Magnetic Island? The people of Palm Island are some of the most, most disadvantaged and socially dislocated people on earth, not let alone Australia. The only way to Townsville is by ferry. The ferry runs on diesel. There is no compensation for the diesel used on public transport. So the residents of Palm and Magnetic Island, who have no alternate, no alternate method of transport, will have to wear this cost. And to what end? What will they get for their money? Mm. What extra services and facilities will they receive? None. Mr Deputy Speaker, none. Nada. Nothing. Tax. Can I speak about the Extrata Copper Refinery in Townsville? 90 direct employees and 260 indirect jobs. Extrata will close its refinery, citing processing costs. Mm. They will still mine the ore. It will still be converted into concentrate in Mount Isa, and that will be done in Australia, where it is mined. But the concentrate will be refined overseas. That is $300 million worth of export dollars lost to this country. And to what end? What will the net result to the world pollution be? Certainly neither Extrata nor, neither Extrata nor the Climate Change Minister have addressed this issue publicly. But what, do the, but what do the tradesmen and women do here? Tradesmen and women do here. Do the boilermakers and electricians do as the member from Melbourne suggests and get a job on the Great Barrier Reef in tourism, <laughs> or do they just have to shift away from Townsville and chase the work, and take their children from the schools and their wives and husbands from the other jobs out of the town and take their income out of the town? Can I talk about the Copper String project? Over 5,000 jobs over the next 30 years. Mm -hmm. This visionary project was to bring Mount Isa onto the national grid, open the Northwest Minerals Province and allow the greatest collection of renewable energy projects access to the grid. Both sides of this House support this project, but only one side could do the negotiation with the major players, which included Extrata Mount Isa Mines, and that was this Labor government. That Extrata has signed a commercial deal with AGL to build a new gas-fired power station in Mount Isa brings into question both the negotiation skills of this government and their commitment to renewable energy. One of the reasons for this decision is the statement by Extrata that they will save one million tonnes of carbon per year. That is one million tonnes of carbon from the AC line linking them, from, linking them to Townsville and the national grid. That link is the key ingredient in the copper string vision. That link provides access for all the renewable energy projects to feed into that grid. That this government can cause the largest collection of renewable energy projects to stall uh, in part due to the carbon tax is surely the supreme irony. How is it that they can nut out a deal with the big miners on the MRRT in the blink of an eye and yet fail to convince them of the benefits of this most worthy project? How is it that this government talks about their commitment to renewable energy and yet, with the stroke of Extrata's pen, has the National Treasurer unable to speak about it at all? This project has seen, uh, would have seen economic, real economic growth across every sector to the north of Australia for the next 40 years. It would have seen employment for not only skilled workers but also for local workers and Western communities and for our first Australians as they battled to stay on their lands and provide for their families. Instead, we see this weak and vacillating government talking the talk but unable to get out of their chairs to walk the walk. Projects such as Solar Dawn, the Kennedy wind farm of over 800 turbines, along with other solar, ethanol and geothermal investment must now be under severe doubt. People in my electorate like Robin Richardson from Alliance Airlines and Peter Collings from West Wing Aviation, 
who provide the service of fly in, fly out to the, to the mining sector, who have plans for expansion, now look at their business and wonder where they go next. Do they go to Papua New Guinea because they don't have a carbon tax? This carbon tax is not reform, Mr Deputy Speaker. This is penalty. This carbon tax is not a tax on the big polluters. It is a tax on mums and dads and children. This carbon tax does not offer adequate compensation. It will only bring, it will only bring with it higher prices and losses of opportunities. This tax will cascade and compound until the final purchase is made by the person least able to ward off its hurt. This carbon tax will hurt my city. This carbon tax will hurt my region. This carbon tax will hurt my state. This carbon tax will hurt my country. There is a better way. The real action program proposed by the, by the federal opposition, by Tony Abbott, by Greg Hunt, by Warren Edge, by Warren Truss, by everyone on this side of the House, is capped, is affordable, and brings with it a tax the actual pollution being done. It works with business, not against business. We have a prime minister who says she's the education prime minister. And yet she believes in the stick and not the carrot. She believes that students and people work better with penalty than they do with encouragement. And she believes that business is exactly the same way. You have a Labor government that sat over there before the election and said that we don't believe in this. And yet afterwards they accuse us on this side of being negative. I watched the Minister for Climate Change on the weekend on, on, on Insiders, and he spoke in an interview with Barry Cassidy for nearly 12 minutes. And in that time, he had seven, seven chops at the Leader of the Opposition. You wonder why we're negative. You guys are worse than we are. You guys are the negative ones because you, you don't have a positive agenda. Order. The member for Herbert's time has expired. I call the member for Wills. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Uh, earlier this afternoon, the, the Leader of the Opposition uh, suggested that the carbon price would lead to a trillion dollars being lost. <laughs> I have to refer to the Leader of the Opposition and members opposite to the comments of Sir Nicholas Stern, who has said the economic costs of inaction will exceed the economic costs of action. So it is absolutely pointless to talk about whether we will lose this amount or that amount if you do not take into account the alternative. I believe, and, and if you're considering uh, how well uh, qualified the Leader of the Opposition is to make such an observation, we need to ask ourselves how much does he actually understand about carbon dioxide and the climate change debate more broadly. Uh, in July, he described carbon dioxide as an invisible, odourless, weightless, tasteless substance. So, Mr Deputy Speaker, apparently carbon dioxide is some kind of damn delusive scarlet pimpernel, impossible to find or capture, and the clean energy regulator is engaged in an exercise in futility. Yet just 11 days earlier, the Leader of the Opposition had said both the government and the opposition accept that Australia should reduce our emissions by 5 per cent by 2020. Well, how are we going to reduce emissions of something that is, according to the Leader of the Opposition, weightless? Uh, and indeed, Mr Deputy Speaker, well, that was an exercise in futility. And, in, and indeed, Mr Deputy Speaker, he was a minister when the Howard government passed legislation requiring businesses to report their CO2 emissions. Now, if carbon dioxide is weightless, is as elusive as he claims, if chasing it is an exercise in futility, why on earth did a government of which he was a member require businesses to measure, monitor and report it? The Howard government's National Greenhouse and Energy Reporting Act of 2007 established a national framework for reporting greenhouse gas emissions by corporations. The reporting framework involved, by 2010-11, approximately 700 companies that emit more than 50 kilotons of greenhouse gases to be involved. Now, if carbon is weightless, as the Leader of the Opposition claims, what on earth was the Leader of the Opposition doing requiring businesses to monitor and report their emissions? 
Mr Deputy Speaker, the Leader of the Opposition is also of the view that tackling greenhouse gases is an exercise in futility because other countries, according to him, aren't doing likewise. For example, he said there is no way that America is going to put a price on carbon any time soon. There is no way that the Chinese and Indians are going to put a price on carbon until their peoples have a comparable standard of living to those of the advanced Western world. The reality is very different. Ten American states, including New York, have already put a price on carbon pollution from their electricity generators. California, the world's eighth largest economy, will start a carbon trading scheme in 2012. China has announced it will introduce emissions trading commencing in key cities and provinces, including Beijing, Shanghai and Guangdong, and India has introduced the clean energy tax on coal. Now, these are just a couple of examples of the Leader of the Opposition's total disinterest in climate change detail. Mr Deputy Speaker, under the, he also said, under the clean energy legislation, the Climate Change Authority will not set emission limits or caps. Uh, he also said that uh, in fact, the Climate Change Authority would set emissions limits with almost no reference to the parliament. In fact, the Climate Change Authority will not set emissions limits or caps. It will make recommendations to the government. The government will set the caps through regulations. These will be subject to parliamentary scrutiny and disallowance. So the Leader of the Opposition was wrong again. Mr Deputy Speaker, he can't maintain a position on climate change for more than five minutes. In July, he said, I've never been in favour of a carbon tax or an emissions trading scheme. In fact, he was a senior minister in the Howard government that went to the 2007 election with a policy of introducing an emissions trading scheme. He has also previously said in July 2009, I think that if you want to put a price on carbon, why not just do it with a simple tax? Furthermore, he said, climate change is real. Humanity does make a contribution to it, and we've got to take effective action against it. I mean, that's my position, and that's always been my position. <laughs> Mr Deputy Speaker, not true. It hasn't always been his position. The member for Wentworth, in fact, said he is a self-described weather vane on this issue. More, more, more seriously, Mr Deputy Speaker, the Leader of the Opposition has tried to scare pensioners. He said, the compensation to pensioners is temporary, the tax is permanent. Wrong again. The fact is that the Gillard government will provide permanent increases in pensions and benefits. There will be lump sum payments from May June 2012, followed by increases in fortnightly payments from March 2013. Pensions, allowances and family benefits will then keep pace with the cost of living as they are indexed in line with the consumer price index. Mr Deputy Speaker, he's misled the House over electricity prices, saying the Western Australian Treasury modelling predicts that Western Australian households within three years will be paying more than $2,120 a year com for power compared with $1,515 a year now. In fact, the Western Australian modelling that he referred to actually estimates the average increase in household electricity bills due to the carbon price to be a $111 a year, just over $2 a week. The impact on electricity prices is taken into account in the government's household assistance package. So wrong again. He's been misleading about other prices as well. He said, according to the Housing Industry Association and the Master Builders Association, the price of a new house will go up by at least $5,000 under a carbon tax. In fact, this estimate was produced before carbon price policy was announced. It assumes no industry assistance, which means it significantly exaggerates the impact of a carbon price on housing construction. In fact, the government is providing $9.2 billion of assistance to manufacturers of building materials, shielding these products from 94.5 per cent of the carbon price. He's been, he's been misleading about jobs. He said there will be 45,000 jobs lost in energy intensive industries and 126,000 jobs lost in mainly in regional Australia. In fact, the modelling by Treasury and other sources has consistently shown that the economy will continue to grow strongly under a carbon price 
with 1.6 million extra jobs being created by 2020. Yeah. He's been misleading about industry impacts generally. He said that the carbon tax ultimately spells death for the coal industry. In fact, Treasury, Treasury modelling of the former CPRS showed that with a carbon price in place, coal industry output would grow by 66 per cent by 2050. 66 by 20 per cent by 2050, hardly the death of the industry. As well as misleading the public about the industry impacts, he's misled the Australian public over the budgetary impacts. He said when people buy their carbon permits abroad, what will happen to the Australian government is that they won't be able to afford carbon compensation after 2015. In fact, the government will sell a fixed number of carbon permits each year to big polluters. This is where the revenue will come from. There will be no reduction in revenue due to the international linking. So wrong again. Mr. Mr Deputy Speaker, moving to a clean energy future will provide new economic opportunities for Australian workers. Jobs will continue to grow under carbon pricing. They will be created in new and fast-growing clean industries such as renewable energy, carbon farming and sustainable design. These new industries will help to improve Australia's international competitiveness. Mr Deputy Speaker, I believe Australians are hungry for action to tackle carbon emissions. This is certainly true of my electorate, where thousands of citizens belong to GetUp and other local groups. What I am certain of is that the climate change challenge is not going to go away. We cannot stick our heads in the sand and wish it away. We must press on with this work. I believe that future generations are going to judge us on our performance over this issue. Mr Deputy Speaker, one side of politics is prepared to face up to its responsibilities. The other side just opportunistically wants to kick the problem down the road and leave it to someone else to fix. It's a shocking abdication of responsibility and the opposition stands condemned for it. Order. I call the member for Wannan on the MPI. No. no. Not on the MPI. No. On we haven't called it on. Just right. Um, I assume then from that that this discussion has concluded. I will call the clerk. Government business. Order of the day number one. Clean Energy Bill 2011. Resumption of debate on second reading. The question is that these bills be now read a second time. I'll now call the member for Wannan. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. And I stand today absolutely outraged. I have to speak on a bill, 1,200 pages of a bill, and I've been allowed five minutes to do so. Five minutes on a bill which is going to have a detrimental impact on serious industries in my electorate. It is an absolute disgrace. Five minutes, 1,200 pages. That's all this government will give me to speak on this piece of legislation. The clock might be showing 15 minutes, but if I speak for longer than five, then other people on this side of the House will miss out on speaking on this legislation. It's a disgrace. This is a deceitful piece of legislation which strikes at the heart of Australia's international competitiveness. The other side stands condemned for putting this bill through. Climate change is a global problem. It deserves a global solution. It does not require a solution that will send jobs and industries overseas. Yet that is exactly what this carbon tax will do. But it will not only do this. After we have sent the jobs and the industries offshore, we will then buy the carbon permits from the countries that have benefited from this exporting of jobs and industries overseas, and they will benefit handsomely. We are talking by $3.5 billion in 2020, by $57 billion by 2050. So we export the jobs and the industries overseas with this carbon tax, then we export taxpayers' money overseas. It is an absolute disgrace. Let's go to three key points that need to be made about this legislation. Climate change, global problem, needs a global solution. 
What has the government done to try and get that global solution? Absolutely asleep at the wheel. What have they done to try and get some sort of consensus in South Africa at the end of this year? Nothing. What type of coalition or consensus have they built to try and get action in South Africa at the end of this year? Nothing. What's our number one foreign policy objective at the moment? Trying to get a seat on the UN Security Council seat. But, and the Foreign Minister is leading this charge even though he said that this is one of the greatest moral dilemmas of our time. Why isn't he putting the same effort, the same energy into trying to get an outcome in South Africa, which would mean that Australia's international competitiveness would be protected? Absolute disgrace. What will it mean for my electorate, for Wannan? What will it mean for the agricultural sector in my electorate? The dairy industry, a five to seven thousand dollar hit per dairy farm. The meat industry, an extra cost of twenty-four to thirty cents for each carcass that goes through an abattoir in my electorate. Grain. What will it mean for grain? Thirty-six thousand dollars is the approximate cost which is put on each and every grain farmer in my electorate. It is an absolute disgrace. What about the 358 local manufacturers in my electorate? How can they deal with this? These are small manufacturing businesses that compete internationally. What can they do when they get hit with this? They cannot pass the costs on. They have to absorb it. It is hard enough for them at the moment without having an additional cost being put on them. The number one issue in my electorate is roads and the state of the roads. The last federal budget, federal government, not one extra dollar for roads. Yet, what are we doing? We're putting a 5 per cent cost on road construction across my electorate, and the government is doing nothing to compensate local government or state government on it. This is a disgraceful piece of legislation which is built on deceit. And what is it going to mean for paperwork for those small businesses in my electorate? What will they have to do with these 1,200 piece of, 1200 pieces of paper? It's going to add red tape to every one of those businesses. We've already seen a six, time, six times increase in businesses in their paperwork, in their red tape. This is just going to make it worse. Mr Deputy Speaker, I will have more to say on this this evening, as I only have five minutes today to get through what I need to say, so the member for Higgins has a chance to say something. It's a disgrace, but this is not the last you've heard from me on this issue. Order. The question is that these bills be now read a second time. I'll call the member for Higgins. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. And like the member for Wannan, I too am being silenced in this debate. I too only have five minutes to represent the issues and concerns of the people of Higgins. It is a disgrace, and I endorse his comments. I won't get my allocated less than one minute per bill, 19 bills for the carbon tax. I will get much less than that. Far from throwing open the curtains to let the sun shine in, this government is guillotining debate. It is silencing dissent. There was no mandate from the Australian people for this carbon tax bill. The Prime Minister told an untruth before the last election, saying there would be no carbon tax under the government I lead, and she will be judged by history for that, just as those people who support her in breaking that trust of the Australian people will also be judged. Today, I would like to highlight four issues with respect to this very flawed legislation. First, the global economy and the lack of a global move to introduce an economy-wide carbon tax, whether as a tax or an emissions trading scheme. Second, the flaws in the government's own figures and modelling. Third, the very real impact that the government's legislation will have on the people in my electorate of Higgins. And fourth, the fact that at this point in time, and that despite the lack of global consensus, there is an alternate way to reduce carbon emissions that will not damage our economy or export jobs, while still allowing us to meet our target for a 5 per cent reduction in emissions by 2020. In the time available, I'm going to concentrate on 
the first and third points and will put my full speech on my website so that the people of Higgins know that I have had a chance to represent their concerns. In September, the IMF released dire warnings for the world's economy. It prompted the Treasurer to issue the following statement. The IMF has issued a stark warning for the global economy, highlighting that it has entered a dangerous new phase. Global activity has weakened and become more unbalanced. Downside risks are also intensifying. He went on to say the report cautions that global financial risk remains very high, particularly in regions like the euro area, the United States and Japan. At the same time, this government is introducing a carbon tax, even claiming in the Treasurer's own words that it's the next crucial frontier in economic reform. Does this sound like an economically prudent and responsible course of action to explore new frontiers in a deteriorating global economic environment, an environment that has been described as dangerous? Of course it is not. Moreover, if Australia introduces an economy-wide carbon tax, we will be moving ahead of the rest of the world. The Productivity Commission informs us that no country currently imposes an economy-wide tax on greenhouse gas emissions or has in place an economy-wide ETS. When you look at the partial schemes that are in place throughout the world and analyse the figures there, they also tell a very cogent story. The European ETS collects just $500 million a year, which equates to roughly $1 per person per annum. Australia, though, under this carbon tax in its first year alone will raise $9 billion, or $400 per person per annum. This number only grows as the carbon price grows. Yet the emissions, according to the government's own modelling in Australia, will go up from 578 million tonnes to 600 121 million tonnes by 2020. And to achieve the, car the carbon abatements that the government says it will achieve, on top of their $9 billion a year tax for the first three years, they will need an extra $3.5 billion to be purchased each year from foreign carbon traders till 2020. To achieve their target by 2050, $57 billion will need to be purchased from foreign carbon traders. There is a meeting in Durban in November of this year to discuss the global response to climate change post-Kyoto. Yet in this debate we have heard nothing about this. In fact, if this is something that the, go the government truly believes is going to happen, a global consensus, then this would be the focus of our attention. But the reason they do not discuss it is they know it is a great big con. There will be no global consensus coming out of this meeting in Durban of this year. It will confirm what we all know to be the fact, which is that Australia is going to be going it alone. We know that China's emissions will continue to increase by 496 per cent by 2020, and that India's are also going to continue to increase by 350 per cent, some world consensus. I held a carbon tax forum in my electorate of Higgins, and I spoke with my constituents about the concerns that they have, concerns from self-funded retirees who know that they're not going to be compensated, concerns from small businesses who also know that they are going to have to shed staff and shed jobs. Um, and I will speak more about this later on. I spoke with small businesses throughout my electorate, and they are very much against this carbon tax. Now, I do not have any more time available to me to give my colleague an opportunity to speak because of this disgraceful act by this disgraceful government that refused to allow us to properly debate these bills. Order. I, the question is that these bills be never read a second time. I call the member for Riverina. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. The Prime Minister introduced her carbon tax to this parliament on 13 September 2011 in a speech lasting 23 minutes and comprising 2,678 words. On 28 occasions, the Labor leader used the words a price on carbon, carbon price, or carbon pricing. Not once did she use the expression carbon tax. Why is she in such denial? Australians are renowned for telling it as it is, not beating around the bush, not gilding the lily. Australians expect their Prime Minister to do the same, to be upfront, honest, to tell the truth, always. On 16 August 2010, the member for Layla, having just ousted her first-term predecessor, the member for Griffith, the man popularly elected by the people, had this to say. There will be no carbon tax under the government I lead. On 24 February, this year, the Prime Minister, still in the position but not by the choice or the will of the people, held a media conference to announce that she was going back on her word, to announce that she and her multi-party climate change committee would be burdening Australia with a carbon tax, to announce she was reneging on her deal with the Australian people, tearing up her verbal contract with the job-creating factories, the families, the farmers who grow the food and fibre to feed and clothe us 
the small businessmen and women who are the engine room of our economy, the truck drivers who keep our nation on the move and the workers she falsely espouses to represent. We will remember the media conference and make no mistake, so too will the people of Australia at their first available opportunity, the next election. The body language and the positioning of those in that media conference were telling. Standing at the back was the Minister for Climate Change and Energy Efficiency, flanked by the independent members for Line and New England. Out front, for a while at least, was the Prime Minister, and next to her were two of those to whom she is now beholden, Greens leader Senator Bob Brown and his deputy Senator Christine Mill. But it did not take long for Senator Brown to hijack the show. His opening line said it all. We feel very happy to be here in a process which is moving forward to this nation's future. Moving forward. Wasn't that Labor's 2010 election campaign line? And there's the rub. The Greens and Labor are one and the same. They certainly are in this parliament. You can lump the independents for Denison, Lyne and New England in as well. They are all Labor by any other name. The one Green in this House of Representatives and the three independents keep this illegitimate Labor government in power. Hanging on to a thread in spite of a $200 billion plus deficit, in spite of cost overruns and in spite of botching everything it touches. It is worth noting the one Green, the member for Melbourne, was the only member of the 150 elected to this House on 21 August in favour of a carbon tax. One out of 150. Hardly representative. Yet here we are, nearly 14 months later, about to embrace a massive taxation reform without first having put it to the people of Australia. The complexity of this tax will mean a massive increase in the size of the public service to administer the non-delivery of an invisible, odourless product to no one. At the same time, it will drive up grocery prices, electricity and gas bills for ordinary everyday Australians and see our jobs and industries sent offshore. Having to buy billions of dollars of carbon credits offshore is akin to sending a scam emailer your bank details. A carbon tax will hurt the Riverina. This is a region already reeling from this government's abject failure to bring about certainty in the water debate and thereby grinding all investment and hope in the Collie and Murrumbidgee irrigation areas to a dead halt. This is a region which is proudly home to Wagga Wagga-based airline Regional Express, which says a carbon tax will add $2 to the price of every ticket, and the impost on aviation fuel would cost the company $2 million in the first year. Abattoirs at Wagga Wagga and Yanko, employers of hundreds of locals, will bear a huge burden under a carbon tax, as will the Hine Timber Mill at Tumbarumba. A carbon tax will cost Fizzy, which has a state-of-the-art, already eco-friendly pulp and paper mill at Tumut, at least $12 million in its first year. It will force editorialised the Southern Cross newspaper Junie businesses to adapt, pushing many to the edge of viability and others to downsize their operations. Starting a business in this climate might not seem like the wisest of ideas with what you might call dark clouds on the horizon. There is a better way. The Coalition's direct action plan is a strong and effective policy which will reduce carbon emissions by 5 per cent by 2020 without a new tax. We need to invest in renewable energy, improve soils, ensure we have enough productive water to meet the global food task while maintaining healthy rivers and fund research and development in new technologies to bring about outcomes to help the environment. It is possible. It is happening now. It needs to happen in the future. But this carbon tax should be rejected. It is wrong. It is a fraud. It will harm Australia, do nothing for the environment, and it is based on a lie. If the majority, minority Labor government did the decent, honest thing now and took it to an election, the voters would no doubt overwhelmingly order, reject order, it. Order. The honourable well member's time is Prime interrupted. The honourable member's time is interrupted. In accordance with the resolution of the House on the 13th of September this year, I now call the Minister for Climate Change and Energy Efficiency. Thank you very much, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and I thank. The more than 120 members, I think it is now, for their contributions to the second reading debate on the clean energy legislative package. And I'd particularly like to thank those who've made a constructive and supportive contribution. I'd also like to thank the members of the Joint Select Committee into the clean energy legislation, in particular the chair, the member for Chisholm, and the secretariat of the, to the committee 
for all of their hard work examining the legislation and for preparing such a comprehensive report. It is important to record that the majority report fully supports the passage of these bills. The 19 bills comprising the Clean Energy Legislation and the Steel Transformation Plan Bill represent one of the most important environmental and economic reforms in this nation's history. The science demonstrates that atmospheric and oceanic warming is occurring, that climate is changing, that the climate is changing, and that greenhouse gas emissions must be reduced to mitigate the environmental, economic and social risks that we face. Climate change is a threat that must be tackled internationally, but in which individual countries, including our own, must play their part. And Mr Deputy Speaker, the government's clean energy legislation addresses the science. It will reduce emissions, it will drive investment in clean energy, and it will also ensure that Australia does play its part internationally. The centrepiece of the legislative package involves the introduction of a carbon price into our economy through the implementation of an emissions trading scheme. The largest emitters of greenhouse gases will be required to purchase a permit called a carbon unit for each tonne of carbon pollution they emit that is covered by the scheme, thus creating a powerful incentive to cut their pollution. Mr Deputy Speaker, this is a long overdue reform that will reduce the emissions intensity of our economy over time. It will drive innovation, productivity and competitiveness, and it will create jobs. Investment in clean energy and low emissions technologies has been stalled awaiting this reform. It is critical, therefore, that the parliament passes the clean energy legislation <coughs> excuse me, to provide certainty to business so this investment can be unleashed. I'll address some of the specific arguments raised in the debate in order to correct the record and then briefly foreshadow some amendments that the government will move. Firstly, in relation to the Treasury modelling. To address issues that have been raised concerning the Treasury modelling, I simply note that on 21 September uh, last month, the Treasury released updated modelling confirming the Australian economy will continue to grow and grow strongly while emissions are reduced. The additional results in uh, particular demonstrate that there will be no further impact on electricity prices in 2012-13 from the introduction of a carbon price compared to the original, original modelling. An argument's also been put that Australia would be acting ahead of the rest of the world in pricing carbon. This argument conveniently ignores the action that is occurring around the world, and it also disregards our own national interest in reducing carbon pollution and improving the competitiveness of our economy. One cannot ignore the fact that Australia is the highest per capita emitter amongst developing economies and that our future prosperity will be enhanced by making this reform. Delaying cutting carbon pollution will increase climate change risks, lock in more emissions intensive investments and defer new investments in clean technology industries and jobs. And the fact is that 90 countries representing over 80 per cent of global emissions and over 90 per cent of the global economy have now made pledges to undertake mitigation action. The European Union, for example, has had an emissions trading scheme for six years, covering 30 economies. Australia's top five trading partners—China, Japan, the US, the Republic of Korea and India have implemented or are piloting carbon trading or taxation schemes at national, state or the city level. China, which is our major trading partner, plans to pilot by 2013 emissions trading in several major provinces and cities, with a combined population of around 150 million and a combined GDP significantly larger than our own. Now, Mr Deputy Speaker, a number of members have also spoken to the specific impacts of the legislation on households, industries and jobs. The government is committed to supporting Australian households, Australian industry and Australian jobs as we reduce our emissions. The Treasury modelling shows that the Australian economy will continue to grow strongly at the same time as we cut pollution to reduce the risks of dangerous climate change. Real national income will continue to grow under a carbon price. Average incomes per person, in fact, increased by around $9,000 from today's level to 2020 and by more than $30,000 to 2050. 
national employment will increase by 1.6 million jobs by 2020, with or without carbon pricing. All state economies continue to grow strongly. The government is proactively assisting heavily affected industries and regions to transition into the scheme, including through its Jobs and Competitiveness Program, the Steel Transformation Plan, the Coal Sector Jobs Package and programs to support clean technology. In fact, Mr Deputy Speaker, many emissions intensive industries that are trade exposed will receive an average of 94.5 per cent of their carbon units for free in the first year of the scheme. This means that their carbon liability generally equates to less than 1 per cent of their revenue. There is, therefore, very significant support for jobs and competitiveness, but at the same time a continuing incentive to cut pollution. Some members have also falsely claimed that assistance to households will not be sufficient or long-lasting or permanent. And let me be clear on behalf of the government in relation to this point. The household assistance payments and tax cuts will be ongoing and permanent. The clean energy payments will be indexed to keep pace with the cost of living. A second round of tax cuts in 2015-16 will provide assistance to cover the projected impact of the carbon price out to the end of the decade. To meet the modest price impact of 0.7 per cent increase in the CPI, nine out of ten households will receive some combination of tax cuts and increased payments. Almost six million households will receive assistance that covers their expected average price impact. And importantly for a Labor government, over four million low-income households will receive assistance that is at least 20 per cent more than their expected average price impact. And that is extremely important to pensioners and low-income earners in our society. The changes to the personal income tax system, which include a trebling of the tax-free threshold, will deliver genuine and enduring tax reform, in addition to assistance for a carbon price. Mr Deputy Speaker, the second reading debate has also included consideration of the $300 million steel transformation plan, which will provide certainty to the steel industry <coughs> excuse me, so that it can invest and innovate to transform into a more efficient and competitive industry in a low-carbon economy. Now, the plan will also promote positive environmental outcomes. Eligible corporations will need to provide an annual report to the government specifying the activities, including workforce skills development, that have been undertaken and are planned to be taken to reduce emissions and improve the environment. The steel transformation plan will be additional to assistance provided under the Jobs and Competitiveness Program. Mr Deputy Speaker, some members have also commented on the cost of the package. Now, the Productivity Commission's report earlier this year, which analysed the comparative costs of climate change action across a range of countries, found that all emissions reduction policies impose some costs, with implicit costs per tonne of emissions ranging from below $10 to above $400. And the Productivity Commission is very clear in their analysis. An explicit price on carbon, such as through an emissions trading scheme, is the most cost-effective way for nations to reduce their emissions. And the fact is that the government's carbon price mechanism is the most cost-effective way that Australia can reduce its emissions by at least 5 per cent over year 2000 levels. Now, some members have pointed to alleged discrepancies between the size of revenue collected by the carbon pricing mechanism and by other countries' schemes. These comparisons that have been made are not valid, as they simply don't compare like with like. A direct comparison of the equivalent market size of the EU scheme and the government's mechanism over the same time period, 2013 to 2015, shows clearly that the EU scheme is more than five times the size of the Australian carbon pricing mechanism. A number of opposition members have also made absurd claims concerning the purchasing of emissions reductions on overseas carbon markets. The clean energy legislation does provide for linking with other international carbon markets, and it does so to achieve the lowest cost emissions reductions in our economy. And let's be clear, a tonne of emissions validly reduced overseas has the same environmental benefit as a tonne reduced in our own economy. The atmosphere 
does not have national boundaries. Through international linking of carbon markets, Australian businesses can source the lowest cost emissions reductions, and we can also establish a common carbon price between our economy and that of our trading partners over time, thereby ensuring that carbon pricing does not disadvantage our industries. Opposition to international linking is economically reckless. It would more than double the cost of emissions reductions in our own economy, and it represents an appeal to economic xenophobia. Now, Mr Deputy Speaker, on the issues raised concerning fraud and other types of crime, there are comprehensive oversight and strong compliant provisions in the legislation. Emissions units will be classed as financial products under the Corporations Act 2001 and the Australian Securities and Investments Commission Act 2001. ASIC will be able to investigate and prosecute market misconduct and the ACCC will have the power to address anti-competitive behaviour. Emissions units will also be regulated by Austrac under the anti-money laundering legislation. Now, where the clean energy regulator is given powers, they are wholly appropriate and they are consistent with powers given to similar regulators. And Mr Deputy Speaker, in light of the Joint Committee's report and ongoing consultation on the government's plan, I will be moving on behalf of the government some amendments. In particular, the government has responded to the views of landfill operators, including local councils, by allowing landfill operators to surrender 100 per cent of their liabilities by using Australian carbon credit units created under the Carbon Farming Initiative during the fixed charge years. This will allow many operators to acquire or generate inexpensive carbon credit units to meet their liabilities and I believe will be welcomed. Other amendments include further clarification of liabilities in relation to natural gas and drafting clarifications in relation to the residency requirements for household assistance. A number of companies in the consultation process have also expressed interest in having liquid petroleum gas included in the carbon pricing mechanism. Now, the government is open to considering this in a similar manner to the way in which large liquid fuel users may opt into the scheme, and we will consult on options for achieving it. No amendments, however, are proposed in relation to this at this time. Now, in conclusion, Mr Deputy Speaker, I would like to thank everyone who has worked with me and my colleagues in the development of this policy and the formulation of this legislation, including the Prime Minister, uh, my parliamentary and cabinet colleagues, my staff and departmental officers. It has involved a tremendous amount of work and I've been very fortunate to be supported by many talented and committed people. Australia does need to tackle climate change and as a parliament we have a responsibility to respect the scientific evidence and advice and to respond with an environmentally effective, economically efficient and socially equitable policy. And the clean energy legislative package discharges this responsibility and will achieve these outcomes. I commend the bills to the House and I do urge members to put aside partisan politics and to vote in the best interest of our country and of future generations. Yeah. Order. I will now put the question on the Clean Energy Bill 2011 and the 17 related bills, not including the Steel Transformation Bill, Plan Bill of 2011. The question is that these bills be now read a second time. All those of that opinion say aye. aye. Contrary, no. I think the ayes have it. No's have, no's have it. Division required. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes.
Order, lock the doors. The question is that these bills be now read a second time. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left, and I appoint the honourable members for Shortland and Chifley, tellers for the ayes, and the members for Parks and Barker, tellers for the noes.
Order. The result of the division is I-74, no 73. The question is therefore resolved in the affirmative. Yeah. The clerk. Yeah. Order. Order. Yeah. Order. The clerk has the call. Clark. Second reading. A bill for an act to encourage the use of clean energy and for other purposes. Second reading, a bill for an act to deal with consequential matters arising from the enactment of the Clean Energy Act 2011 and for other purposes. Second reading, a bill for an act to amend the Income Tax Rates Act 1986 and for related purposes. Second reading, a bill for an act to amend the law relating to social security, family assistance, veterans entitlements, military rehabilitation and compensation, farm household support and aged care and for related purposes. Yes, I've still got to read the titles. Yeah. Second reading, a bill for an act to amend the law relating to taxation and for related purposes. Second reading, a bill for an act to amend fuel tax legislation and for related purposes. Second reading, a bill for an act to amend the Customs Tariff Act 1995 and for related purposes. Second reading, a bill for an act to amend excise tariff legislation and for related purposes. Second reading, a bill for an act to amend the Ozone Protection and Synthetic Greenhouse Gas Import Levy Act 1995 and for related purposes. Second reading, a bill for an act to amend the Ozone Protection and Synthetic Greenhouse Gas Manufacture Levy Act 1995 and for related purposes. Second reading, a bill for an act to impose a charge on unit shortfalls under the Clean Energy Act 2011, so far as that charge is neither a duty of customs nor a duty of excise. Second reading, a bill for an act to impose charges on the issue of carbon units issued as a result of an auction under the Clean Energy Act 2011, so far as those charges are neither duties of customs nor duties of excise. Second reading, a bill for an act to impose fixed charges on the issue of carbon units under the Clean Energy Act 2011, so far as those charges are neither duties of customs nor duties of excise. 
Second reading, a bill for an act to impose a charge on the surrender of eligible international emissions units under the Clean Energy Act 2011. Second reading, a bill for an act to impose charges associated with the Clean Energy Act 2011, so far as those charges are duties of customs. Second reading, a bill for an act to impose charges associated with the Clean Energy Act 2011, so far as those charges are duties of excise. Second reading, a bill for an act to establish the Clean Energy Regulator and for other purposes. Second reading, a bill for an act to establish the Climate Change Authority and for other purposes. Order. Pursuant to the resolution agreed to by the House on the 13th of September 2011, I will now put the question on the Steel Transformation Plan Bill 2011. The question now is that the Steel Transformation Plan Bill 2011 be now read a second time. All those of that opinion say aye. aye. The contrary, no. no. I think the ayes have it. Di division required. Division required. Regrettably, ring the bells for four minutes.
Friday. Lock the doors. The question is that the Steel Transformation Plan Bill 2011 be now read a second time. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. And I appoint the honourable members for Shortland and Chifley tell us for the ayes and the members for Parks and Barker tell us for the noes. Order. The result of the division is I 75, no 72. The question is therefore resolved in the affirmative. Yeah. Order. I have received oh, the clerk. Bill for an act to provide for the transformation of the Australian steel manufacturing industry and for related purposes. Order. I have received messages from Her Excellency the Governor General recommending, in accordance with, the, with section 56 of the Constitution, Appropriations for the purposes of the following bills. Clean Energy Bill 2011, Clean Energy Consequential Amendments Bill 2011, Clean Energy Household Assistance Amendments Bill 2011, 
and the Steel Transformation Plan Bill 2011. The House will now consider the bills in detail. In accordance with the resolution agreed to on 13 September, the bills will be taken together. The question is that the bills be agreed to. Any proposed amendments are to be moved now. It might suit the House if members with amendments are permitted to move them in one motion. The questions on any amendments will be deferred and there will be a general debate on all amendments. At the conclusion of consideration in detail, questions will be put on amendments to all bills except the Steel Transformation Bill. One question will be put on all government amendments. One question will then be put on all amendments moved by the opposition, uh, by opposition members, and any necessary questions will be put on amendments moved by other members. Any further questions necessary to complete the detail stage will then be put. One question will be put on any government amendments to the Steel Transformation Plan Bill 2011. One question will then be put on all amendments moved by opposition members, and any necessary questions will be put on amendments moved by other members, followed by any further questions necessary to complete the detailed stage. The Minister for Climate Change and Energy Efficiency. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. I present the supplementary explanatory memorandum to the Clean Energy Bill. The Minister. Uh, I move amendments 1 to 48 to the Clean Energy Bill 2011 as circulated together. Mr Speaker, items 1 to 10, 11, 14, 15, 18, 19 and 22 to 25 uh, that appear on sheet 267 deal with issues associated with landfill waste. The Clean Energy Bill provides that landfill facilities with emissions of at least 10,000 tonnes but less than 25,000 tonnes of carbon dioxide equivalents will be covered by the carbon pricing mechanism if they are within a prescribed distance of a designated large landfill facility with emissions of at least 25,000 tonnes. This provision was intended to address the risk of waste being diverted from large landfills to smaller neighbouring landfills. Mr Speaker, the government has decided to set the initial prescribed distance at zero so that operators of small landfills will not be liable on 1 July 2012 and for at least the first three years of the scheme. This will provide time to gather evidence rather than projections of waste diversion to smaller landfills and to have the prescribed distance rule reviewed by the Climate Change Authority no later than 2015-16. Any future increases in the prescribed distance could bring additional small landfills into the mechanism for the first time. It's also possible that small landfills will become liable for the first time because another landfill within the prescribed distance will start to pass the 25,000 tonne threshold. The amendments on moving will reduce the regulatory uncertainty for landfill operators regarding the future operation of the prescribed distance rule. These amendments will ensure that if the prescribed distance is increased following the review, small landfills brought into the carbon price mechanism will not be liable for emissions from waste deposited retrospectively. The small landfill will only be liable for emissions from the waste that is deposited in the financial year that coverage of the landfill commences and subsequent years. They will not face liabilities as a result of these factors beyond their control. The amendments also provide for legacy and exempt landfill emissions to be measured <coughs> excuse me, using the ENGA measurement determination under section 10.3 of National Greenhouse and Energy Reporting Act rather than regulations. Item 3 is a minor technical amendment which is consequential on the amendments in items 1, 3 to 6 and 9 of sheet 257. Those amendments deal with situations where no person has clear operational control of a facility. Items 4 to 9, 12, 13, 16, 17, 20, 21, 26 to 45 are technical amendments to ensure that natural gas liability works the same way whether or not the end user of the gas owned the gas. These amendments, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, respond to comments made by some stakeholders during the Joint Select Committee's inquiry into the legislation. In some cases, gas is provided for use without transfer of ownership of the gas. 
For instance, the owner of the facility might buy gas for the facility and make it available for use at the facility without transferring ownership in the gas to the contracted operator of the facility. Item 46 of sheet 267 is a technical amendment to the opt-in scheme to ensure that aviation fuel users can use the opt-in scheme as intended. The amendment seeks to clarify that fuel users may opt into the carbon pricing mechanism even if the user or another entity becomes entitled to a fuel tax credit after opting in. The amendment will ensure that the opt-in scheme operates as intended and will remove any doubt as to the validity of aviation fuel users. Items 47 and 48 of 267 will allow local councils and other land fill operators to discharge a larger proportion of their emissions using eligible CFI credits than currently permitted during the fixed price years of the carbon price mechanism. The surrender limit will be raised by these amendments from 5 per cent to 100 per cent of an operator's liability if the majority of liability is attributable to landfill emissions. The amendments are restricted to emitters in the landfill sector because they are in the unusual position of being able to generate CFI credits by implementing projects to capture legacy emissions at the same time as they have to surrender uh, emissions units to discharge their liabilities. Uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, the added flexibility under these amendments will reduce the compliance burden on local councils and commercial landfill operators. Uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, I think if it uh, is convenient to the House, and I understand it may be so with the Leader of the Opposition, it may be convenient for me to move the remaining government amendments. Uh, is permission granted? Thank you. Um, Minister? Thank the uh, Leader of the Opposition for that courtesy. Uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, I present the uh, supplementary explanatory memorandum for the Clean Energy Consequential Amendments Bill 2011, the Clean Energy Regulator Bill 2011 and the Clean Energy Household Assistance Amendments Bill 2011. Thank you. Um, Mr Deputy Speaker, uh, Sheet 257 deals with amendments to the Clean Energy Consequential Amendments Bill uh, 2011. Items 1, 3 to 6, 9 and 10 of sheet 257 bring forward the deadline for nominating a person with operational control of a facility from the 31st of August to the 30th of April. The basic provisions deal with situations where no single person has operational control of a facility and a person must be nominated from those who have some operational control. The items correct an oversight, which meant that nominations would have been required after the provisional surrender obligation on the 15th of June. The amendment on moving will allow the person who is going to be liable for emissions from the facility to register by 1 May and meet their progressive surrender obligations on 15 June of each charge year. Um, item 2 of sheet 257 clarifies that uh, the measurement determination made under the National Greenhouse and Energy Reporting Act will be used to measure legacy emissions and exempt landfill emissions for the purposes of Clause 32 and 32A of the Clean Energy Bill. This is a technical amendment to ensure that all emissions from landfill facilities, including covered emissions, legacy emissions and exempt landfill emissions, are measured in accordance with a single consistent set of methods under the Enger Act. Items 7 and 8 of Sheet 257 correct an error in proposed Section 11B of the Enger Act. They ensure that liability applies to liable entities as defined in the Clean Energy Bill 2011 instead of controlling corporations as a result of a nomination. Items 11 and 12 of Sheet 257 clarify the new provisions for refusing or suspending registration under the Renewable Energy Target in light of issues raised by the Senate Scrutiny of Bills Committee. In its current form, the Clean Energy Consequential Amendments Bill includes an amendment that provides for the regulator to refuse or suspend the registration of persons under the Renewable Energy Target legislation, which enables them to create renewable energy certificates. This provision responded to stakeholder concerns around alleged unscrupulous conduct by agents selling certificates or on behalf of owners and installers of small-scale renewable energy systems. The government is moving a further amendment to clarify that the additional powers to refuse or suspend registration of an entity under the renewable energy legislation are to be constrained to situations where the regulator is satisfied that the entity is not a fit and proper person. Regulations will prescribe matters to be considered by the regulator in determining whether or not 
the applicant or registered entity is a fit and proper person. Item 13 of sheet 257 provides that a transmission of Kyoto units by force of law is of no force until the units are registered in the account of the transferee. This amendment makes it clear that changes in title over Kyoto units must be affected through the Australian National Registry of Emissions Units, so there is no ambiguity about legal ownership of units. There is similar provision uh, for the transmission of carbon units, Australian carbon credit units and prescribed international units. Uh, this amendment ensures the same situation applies to Kyoto units. Uh, sheet 269 amends the Clean Energy Regulator Bill 2011 to allow information to be shared with the Energy Security Council. Sheet 238 amends the Clean Energy Household Assistance Bill 2011 to clarify in legislation the government's policy in relation to residency for household assistance. Items 1 to 21 address inconsistencies in the drafting process. And with that, Mr Deputy Speaker, I formally move uh, the amendments I've referred to. Thank you, Minister. The question is that the amendments as circulated uh, be agreed to. Um, yep. All right. The Leader for the Opposition. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank, thanks, uh, thanks, Mr Deputy Speaker. Well, Mr Speaker, uh, I, I move the amendments uh, to the Clean Energy Bill 2011 as circulated in my name. And Mr Deputy Speaker, the purpose of my amendment uh, is to restore uh, a measure of integrity uh, to our tarnished democracy. Uh, it's to give uh, members opposite a chance to make honest politicians of themselves. Uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, uh, what my amendment does uh, is provide for this Act, uh, the Carbon Tax Package of Measures, uh, to commence after the elections have been held for the 44th Parliament. Yeah. So uh, what uh, my amendment does is say that it will be up to the new government after the next election to decide whether or not to proclaim the carbon tax, whether or not the carbon tax will come into force. In other words, it will be up to the people, the people of Australia, voting at an election to determine the fate of the carbon tax. And Mr Deputy Speaker, that is as it should be. This tax is the biggest carbon tax in the world. This change is the biggest tax change in our history, and it should not come into force without first going to the people, asking them and getting their consent. Now, a change as big as this should have a mandate and, as is absolutely clear to this parliament and to all the people of this country, there is no mandate for what this government seeks to do now. Uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, if this parliament has a mandate for anything, it has a mandate not to introduce this tax, uh, and that is why the amendment that I am moving is so necessary if democratic integrity is to be restored to our system. Um, Mr Deputy Speaker, uh, as the Prime Minister uh, is constantly reminded in this parliament, she said five days before the last election there will be no carbon tax under the government I lead. Uh, um, Mr Deputy Speaker, uh, let you. me repeat it for the benefit of the rather raucous member opposite. The Prime Minister said five days before the election there will be no carbon tax under the government I lead. That was the commitment that the Prime Minister made on behalf of every single Labor member of this House. She made that commitment on their behalf. And member, Mr Speaker, member. I am giving this parliament and those members, including the raucous member opposite, the chance to turn what would otherwise be a lie into a truth. I am giving members opposite the chance to turn a lie into a truth, to make honest politicians of the Prime Minister and to make honest politicians of themselves by deferring the actual proclamation of this carbon tax until after the next election. Uh, Mr Speaker, we had uh, uh, the member for Morton today uh, say uh, very publicly 
are that he was determined to keep faith with his public, to keep faith with the people of Morton uh, by ensuring that the person that they voted for as Prime Minister at the 2010 election stayed in that job. Well, this amendment that I am moving now gives every member of parliament a chance to keep faith with their electorates. Because, Mr Deputy Speaker, when the Prime Minister made that promise five days before the election, she wasn't doing it as a private person. She wasn't doing it uh, as just the member for Lawler. She was doing it as the leader of this Labor Party. She was doing, she was doing it uh, as the leader of every member opposite. So if they want to keep faith with their electors, they will support this amendment, because it is a contemptible thing for a government to say one thing before an election to win votes and do the opposite after the election to stay in power. Uh, and I say uh, to members opposite, if they want to stand up for truth in public life, if they want to stand up uh, for the jobs of their constituents, if they want to stand up for truth-telling, if they want to ensure that the Labor Party really is the party of truth-telling, they will back this, this amendment. In the end, Mr Deputy Speaker, my amendment uh, is not about whether or not you support a carbon tax. I don't, obviously. Some people in this parliament do. This is about whether you support democracy, whether you support integrity in public life, and that's why this amendment should be supported by this parliament. Time. Um, the question is that these bills Um, um, I was continuing with what I'm saying. Thank you. The question is that these bills be agreed to. Uh, the member for O'Connor. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. I move amendments one and two to the Clean Energy uh, Fuel Tax Legislation Amendment Bill 2011, as circulated in my name together. Thank you. My strong opposition to the carbon tax will not prevent me from representing my electorate to try and make improvements to this flawed tax. One of the most consistent and specific complaints I have heard in my electorate concerned the government's clean energy uh, fuel tax legislation amendment bill 2011. This bill seeks to place an effective carbon price on every business in an, a non-exempt industry that uses transport fuels on site. This usually involves the use of diesel fuel in combustion engines for on-site power generation. This bill is not just a tax on big polluters. On the contrary, it will affect thousands of small businesses many of whom are in regional Australia and have no alternative to using diesel fuel for power generation. I realise that my amendments were necessary following discussions with various constituents and industry representatives in my electorate. For example, one of my constituents, Helen, who owns the Widgie Road, Mortha Roadhouse. Helen relies on diesel for on-site power generation to run both the roadhouse and the attached accommodation facilities. Helen's small business will pay thousands of dollars for the effective carbon tax on fuel use. A small business such as Helen's is in no way a big polluter and should not be liable to pay the effective carbon price although reductions, through reductions in diesel fuel rebates. Other examples include many junior miners and mineral exploration companies in my electorate. These operators are junior miners. These explorers and junior miners rely on diesel fuel to operate. For many rural projects, there is simply no other viable alternative. These miners and explorers are in no way big polluters and should not be made to shoulder the effective carbon price. We should not be burdening our small businesses with further tax liabilities. Our small businesses should not be liable to pay a tax that was designed to be paid by big polluters. My amendments introduce a threshold under which low polluting companies will not pay the effective carbon price. Under my amendments, if, the business, if a business's tax fuel use in a year has a carbon dioxide equivalent of less than 25,000 tonnes, their fuel, tax their fuel tax credits will not be affected and they will not pay the effective carbon price. Carbon dioxide equivalents in relation to taxable fuel has the same meaning as the government's clean energy bill. In essence, this amendment ensures that only the big polluters will pay an effective carbon price on fuels. Under my amendment, small polluting juniors, junior miners, mineral explorers, roadhouses and accommodation facilities will not be liable to pay the effective carbon price. This amendment holds the government to the promise that this carbon tax is only a tax on big polluters. It will not be, I will not be supporting the carbon, this government's carbon tax, as it is one of the part of, 
as it is one part of the government's triple assault on regional Western Australia. Nonetheless, I commend this amendment to the House as a fair and reasonable amendment to the fuel rebate reforms and a necessary amendment to protect small businesses in Australia. Thank you. Good. Uh, I thank the member. The question is that the amendments be agreed to. The member for Isaacs. Uh, thank you very much, Acting Deputy Speaker. The government cannot support the amendment that has been moved uh, by the opposition. What needs to be understood is that this is the culmination of a debate that has been running for almost two decades. We have seen 35 parliamentary inquiries into climate change since 1994, and we have had a lot of discussion on these seat. topics in this House already. This year alone, there have been around 250 questions asked on carbon pricing and over 15 separate debates on the matter of public importance. The clean energy debate itself has taken 33 hours. It has featured 120 speakers, not, of course, including the member from Wentworth, who is the only front bencher on the other side who has not contributed to this debate. Significantly, this has been a longer debate than the former Howard government allowed for the GST, a longer debate than the former Howard government allowed for work choices, and a longer debate than the former Howard government allowed for the legislation dealing with the sale of Telstra. The time to act is now. That is absolutely clear to those of us on this side of the House and those on the crossbenchers who have voted already in support of these bills. We must begin the transformation to a clean energy economy, to a low carbon economy. This transformation will begin. Deputy Speaker, with the passage of the clean energy bills. We must put in place incentives for business to invest in the clean energy technologies that will allow Australia to maintain its economic growth while cutting pollution. The countries that pioneer the clean technologies that will allow the decoupling between economic growth and a growth of carbon pollution to occur will be the countries that see strong and consistent economic growth through the next century. These will be the countries that will be the most competitive, and the alternative is the Leader of the Opposition's prescription of do nothing. It's a prescription that pretends that climate change is not happening, and we heard that in many of the speeches that were given by those opposite. It's a prescription that in effect attacks the scientists who say that climate change is occurring. It attacks the economists who say that the carbon price is the most efficient way of tackling the problem. This, of course, is from the weather vane leader of the opposition, the weather vane leader of the opposition who once supported a price on carbon and not so long ago, the weather vane leader of the opposition who leads an opposition, about half of whom actually do support a price on carbon but have been prevented uh, from expressing that view. By refusing to grapple with the challenges and opportunities of a carbon-constrained world, the Leader of the Opposition would rather see our economy stagnate, would rather see our economy fall behind the economies of our competitors as long as his political interests are served. Indeed, he would rather anything as long as his political interests are served. He does not care about the inconsistency with his former positions. He does not care about the views expressed by economists. He does not care for the views expressed by scientists. He cares only for his own political interests. And now that the Leader of the Opposition has seen, now that it has been made clear to, le to the Leader of the Opposition and to those opposite that this important reform is not going to be able to be stopped, he seeks to delay it. And again, it betrays that the position of this Leader of the Opposition is to put his own political interests ahead of those of the nation. The fact is, we know that any delay to this important reform, any delay to pricing carbon, will not somehow, magically, make it less costly. It will not reduce the effort that Australia will need to put in to reduce our carbon emissions. It will not reduce the effort that the world needs to put in to reduce world carbon emissions. It will only increase the costs when we get around to taking on the task. Various studies, Deputy Speaker, have looked at the implications of delaying the introduction of a carbon price. All conclude 
that delay will be costly, costly not only in the terms of delaying the contribution that we can make to improving the world's environment, but costly in terms of how much it will cost additionally to take on the task of reducing Australia's emissions. Federal Treasury have consistently stated that delaying this crucial reform will only increase the costs of decoupling carbon pollution for an economic growth. This amendment is an attempt to sacrifice the national interest by delaying this crucial economic reform for purely partisan political Good. motives. Thank you for your contribution. The question is that the amendments be agreed to the member for Flinders. Thank you very much, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker. Mr Deputy Speaker, this debate will summed up in a simple sentence given to me by a senior within my own electorate of Flinders. That senior, a pensioner, said to me, if the people have to pay, surely the people should have a say. And right now, we are debating the Leader of the Opposition's attempt to give the people who will pay in higher electricity prices, higher gas prices, higher grocery prices, uh, higher prices across all goods made or manufactured in this country, uh, we are giving them a say. That is what is on the table at this moment in this place. And whether you support a carbon tax or oppose a carbon tax, you should support giving the people a say at the next election as to whether or not they face that carbon tax. It is a simple proposition that in a democratic society, a government has a duty to take a fundamental policy to the people, to win that mandate and then to implement it. This government unfortunately pledged that there would be no carbon tax under the government they, le uh, they lead. The Prime Minister in particular said on the day before the election, I rule out a carbon tax. It was so fundamental, so fundamental to her pitch to the Australian people that it was her closing pledge. And the, uh, on the Monday leading up to that election, she ruled out a carbon tax with the very famous words, there will be no carbon tax under the government I lead. In that context, let me say this. This amendment is about giving the people a say. It is about giving the people the right at the next election to determine whether or not they face a carbon tax. And there's no barrier to anyone in this House supporting the right of the people having a say. And if the Prime Minister believes all that she says, then take it to an election. Bring forward the election. Let the people vote and let them vote soon and that way they can determine whether or not Australia faces this tax. Because that is our goal, that is our objective, to give the people a say, to let them determine their future, and to do so because of the profound consequences of a system which is ineffective, uh, sends an extraordinary amount of money overseas and will not solve the problem. Because this does not solve the problem. Let me give three simple examples. Does it? decrease demand for electricity, as the Prime Minister has discussed on many occasions. The Parliamentary Secretary, in a debate last week, conceded this bill is not designed to decrease demand for electricity. That is a profound, extraordinary concession. Demand will not be decreased. What about supply? Will it change supply? Will this bill cause any coal-fired power stations to shut within the next decade? And the answer is the carbon tax side of it will not. What has this government had to do? They have had to go straight to the coalition's direct action plan uh, to create an emissions reduction fund to buy out coal-fired power stations. Now, we would clean them up. They want to close them down. But they have conceded that their bill will not cause one single coal-fired power station to close, but it will lead to, according to the National Generators Forum today, the best part of $40 billion in additional electricity costs between now and 2020 being passed on to consumers. The third thing it was meant to do was to bring on board new renewable energy. But the tax itself will not do that, because we have a 20 per cent renewable energy target. That will not be increased by one watt, not a megawatt, not even a watt. This bill will not decrease demand for electricity, according to the Parliamentary Secretary. It will not bring on. Uh, it will not uh, 
close down any coal-fired power stations, according to the government, which has had to rely on the, on the coalition's own mechanism to try to clean up the coal-fired power sector. And it's interesting that, having conceded their, their method will not deal with uh, cleaning up coal-fired power stations, of all of the possible systems in the world they could, look, they could use, they chose the coalitions. Of all of the systems in the world, they chose the coalitions. Great work, guys. Uh, your system won't work. You've had to turn to ours. The difference is we won't close down power stations. Uh, we'll clean them up. You'll close them down uh, and to no effect. And above all else, it sends $3.5 billion each year, every I year, going north from 2020, straight to foreign carbon traders. And that's why we don't oppose, uh, support thank this. Thank you. Thank you. The question is that the amendments be agreed to the member for McEwen. Mr Speaker, I rise to uh, oppose the amendments put forward by the opposition leader, and I just find the hypocrisy of his argument absolutely outstanding. This is a man who stood there today and said, well, you know, the, the, the Prime Minister was untruthful before the election. This comes from a man who himself said, you cannot believe anything he says unless he writes it down. Then when he does write it down, he goes against it again. It is just absolute hypocrisy to, to hear from the Leader of the Opposition on anything like that. And the member for Flinders uh, just before quoted the Australian article, uh, what he said about the Prime Minister. But, of course, in typical of the uh, fashion of the Opposition, don't let the truth get in the way of the full story. Let's only give half a quote. The Prime Minister was very clear, very concise in saying that she would not rule out a carbon pollution reduction scheme, a market mechanism. That's what we went to the election with. We said that before the election, and I know myself in the forums that I attended before the election, which I may add, the Liberal Party, their shadow minister and the local candidate were invited never turned up. They wouldn't even front up to it. And I strongly supported taking action against pollution. And I do that because I want to do the right thing by our kids. This is not about today, tomorrow or some uh, rubbishy amendment that's that says call an election on everything. Now, you'd have to sit there and say, well, what's it about? It's about our future. It's about making sure that the kids that we have today and our grandkids have a clean future, an opportunity to continue farming, an opportunity to continue manufacturing, and an opportunity to continue to have the life that we enjoy here in Australia and do it in a cleaner, greener future. These are the things that those opposite fail to understand. If you listen to the arguments put forward, the only thing they're saying is, oh, if we make a big policy, we should go to an election. Now, under that theory, you'd expect that an Abbott gov government would be in an election every single week. Every time they made a decision, they would have to go to an election. It's absolutely silly to sit there and say that this amendment put forward is genuinely about doing the right thing for this nation and doing the right thing for the people in this country. We, on the other hand, have been very clear we have supported putting a, a price on pollution. We've done that from day one and we continue to do it. And we do it in knowing that what we are doing is about, as I said, delivering better for the future uh, of this country. And we do it by supporting households. We support households in making sure that nine out of ten households will receive assistance for any price adjustments. We know some things will go up, some things will go down. We know that the cost of electricity over the last decade, in Victoria particularly, has gone up dramatically. Why has it gone up dramatically? Because those opposites sold off the SEC, took away all the, uh, the investment that was coming from there, the jobs. They, they left the uh, La Trobe Valley an absolute wreck. And they walked out, took the money and run and left no investment in electric, uh, electricity infrastructure. And what's happening is that infrastructure is failing, it's breaking down, and that's what's causing the rise in the price of electricity particularly. And that has continued to rise every year and will continue to do so uh, because of the failures of them opposite just selling everything off, selling off the farm, and then you sold it off. You went straight through and sold it off. Speak? And you know, you sit there and say, oh, hang on a minute. That, that SEC then Thank delivered you. $400 million net to the state uh, of Victoria every year. It also employed a lot of people and, and contained of a lot of apprenticeships. Because of the failures of Liberal governments uh, in, in stripping those away, we ended up with the skill shortage that we have today. 
because we don't have the apprentices trained in the trades that we need to keep these going. I support what we've done and I'm actually very proud to see that the vote went through today because I actually support jobs and I support the industry. Now, you might scoff over there, but I noticed that you backed away very quickly and you wouldn't support the steel industry. You don't support keeping jobs in this country. You actually go out there every day, put your hard hat on, get your silly little photo taken and say, look at me, I'm backing the workers. There's not a worker in this country that, that believes for one minute that Tony Abbott cares a damn about them. They know that as soon as he gets back in power, the first thing he'll do, along with his national mates, is rip the guts out of workers' uh, wages and conditions. You know it's true because your own backbenchers are saying it. The same backbenchers are saying, let's put GST on food. That's ex exactly what will happen. You will go out of your way to rip workers' rights and conditions away, and everyone knows that you don't give a damn about them. And that's why these Thank amendments you. should not be supported. Thank you for your contribution. The question is the amendments be agreed to the uh, Leader for the Nationals. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. The confidence in our democracy has been seriously damaged by the way in which this government has introduced its carbon tax legislation. The government promised faithfully before the last election there would be no carbon tax. The Prime Minister said it quite clearly. She could have withdrawn the statement. She could have corrected it if in any way she had been mis uh, misunderstood. The Deputy Prime Minister was even more vehement, ridiculing anybody that suggested that Labor might, at some stage during this next term of government, implement a carbon tax. But in fact, and so, so every Labor member sitting opposite today, every Labor member of Parliament was elected on a promise that there would be no carbon tax. And today they're giving the lie to that promise. They're not honouring the word they gave to the Australian people before the election. So all Labor candidates said there would be no carbon tax. All Liberal candidates said there would be no carbon tax. All National candidates said there would be no carbon tax. The only member of this House who supported a carbon tax and who was therefore being honest to his word in supporting this bill today is in fact the Green member. So this therefore is a crisis in confidence because the government failed to honour its promises. Now we, this is a major change. It's way ahead of anything anybody else in the world is doing. In fact most of the rest of the world is moving in different directions. There, there are no models to follow. There are no international agreements that we, the, to, to implement this kind of an arrangement. And so it's appropriate that the people have a say. Uh, we, we suggested there be a plebiscite. Labor rejected that. The Howard government gave an example by going to the Australian people and seeking a mandate before introducing the GST tax reform. And that was the model that this government should also follow. People have a right to a say. That's a fundamental part of our democracy. And therefore, the Leader of the Opposition's amendment that this bill should be tested by the, amongst the Australian people at, a, at, a, at a, an election is an appropriate way for a democracy to work. Can I refer briefly to some of the amendments that are actually before the, the other amendments before the Parliament? The member for O'Connor's amendment has considerable merit. It proposes to exempt uh, the, the relatively small emitters from having to pay the effects of the carbon tax. It also would have significant benefits for regional, for regional areas. It reduces some of the massive disadvantage that's built into this carbon tax by the, uh, in the way in which the government has proposed it. People in country areas will pay more carbon tax than those who live in the cities. Most of the jobs will be lost in regional areas. And so this is a, this is a tax that is a particular burden on people who live outside the capital cities. And so I welcome his proposal to actually look at ways to reduce that disadvantage. Now, I think we need to look at it in the context of the legislation as a whole, but by, re by taking some of the tax away from the small users, it would result in undoubtedly a fairer system. Now, this legislation is full of anomalies, full of anomalies. The government has never been prepared to address those in the debate. Whenever anybody raised some questions about to, to the Prime Minister and others about various issues, uh, she simply dismissed them and say, you're a climate change denier. And if you raise any areas of detail, you're immediately accused of being opposed to, to taking any kind of action to, to uh, protect our climate. Or she'd say, it's the right thing to do. It never justifying that it's correct, it's just some right thing to do. 
Well, it was never a right thing to do to, to include in the legislation many of the anomalies that are there. Now, the government has admitted today that the legislation has significant anomalies and they've come into the House with amendments. They gave the opposition these amendments only at the moment the minister spoke up. So there was no real chance for us to consider them in detail. I note the comments the changes in relation to landfill, an issue I had raised in this parliament on a number of occasions and had been ridiculed by the minister opposite for daring to so do. This proposal only seems to address the issue for three years and so local government would also be concerned. The changes in relation to aviation I have also raised on a number of occasions. But does this also deal with the smaller airlines like Rex or is it only something for the larger airlines? They have always refused to deal with the detail, even if the detail can be corrected. And there's lots more anomalies that I don't have the time at the moment, uh, but may later in the debate, raise that the government hasn't sought to address. But even if the anomalies were corrected, this is still an evil tax. This is still a tax that costs Australian jobs, and the only I, practical thing I to do thank is to vote the bill down. I thank the for his contribution. The question is that the amendments be agreed to the minister. Uh, thank you very much, Mr Deputy Speaker. I'd like just to refer to the amendment that's been moved by the member for O'Connor, and it was referred to briefly a moment ago uh, uh, by the uh, shadow minister. Um, I indicated in question time today that the government was giving this uh, proposal, moved by the member for O'Connor, some consideration. Uh, the government is in fact not inclined to agree with that amendment. And it's very important to go back to some of the basics of the policy in considering this issue because a broad-based carbon price will reduce our greenhouse gas emissions at the lowest overall cost of the economy. And the bills overall, of course, seek to apply an effective carbon price to off-road energy use outside of agriculture, uh, fisheries and forestry to provide an effective price signal relative to the carbon content of the fuel that is in fact used. And that, uh, in relation to off-road uh, fuel usage, of course, is a separate matter from the carbon pricing mechanism itself. It means the way in which the off-road fuel uh, use is dealt with, that whether it's an off-road energy that's met or need that's met by electricity from the grid, uh, from diesel on-site generation, from biofuels, from renewable energy generation, from LPG or from natural gas, uh, the relative carbon intensity of those fuels is taken into account in the way in which the government has formulated the approach in the bills. The different arrangements for natural gas, LPG and liquid fuels combine to ensure that the impact of carbon pricing or an effective carbon price flows through to end users in a manner that is competitively neutral for both energy suppliers and the industries which use that fuel as an input. And of course, the flow through of that has been an important factor in modelling household assistance, for example. Uh, that is that obviously the effective price is not retained by all businesses, it is passed through and ultimately uh, that's what leads to the CPI effect that has been modelled and the uh, way in which the household assistance has been designed. Now all of these arrangements, as I say, have been fully taken into account in the design of the household assistance package. They're a key part of establishing a carbon price in the Australian economy and rewarding low pollution choices of large and small businesses. And the point at which the carbon price applies has been designed to achieve broad coverage whilst minimising administrative costs. And the use of the fuel taxation system to apply an effective carbon price to fuels will achieve broad coverage of fuels emissions uh, while minimising compliance costs to business because it uses the existing uh, fuel taxation arrangements. Fuel using businesses will still claim fuel tax credits using existing administrative systems and will not be subject to additional regulation. Compliance burdens under the carbon pricing mechanism or the need to engage in carbon markets. So uh, businesses in those circumstances would not have to be concerned with any of those matters. The government also recognises the issues for small off-grid electricity generation, and this is one of the matters that I think the member for O'Connor has expressed concern about. But uh, support is provided for off-grid uh, generation through multiplier arrangements under the renewable energy target in particular, and the $40 million investment in, remote in the remote indigenous energy program, which I know is also a matter of interest and concern for the member for O'Connor. 
uh, if that amendment were to be passed, there would not be competitive neutrality between different fuel users and more emissions intensive liquid fuels would be advantaged relative to grid electricity, renewables, natural gas and LPG. And additionally, up to 200 liable entities under the carbon price mechanism whose emissions mainly relate to non-liquid fuels or other sources of emissions may also have no effective carbon price for their liquid fuel emissions should the amendment uh, be passed. And clearly that would not uh, be consistent with the intent of the legislation. It could also result in assistance being provided to industry or households for costs which they did not face. Uh, I can develop some of these arguments a bit further during the course of the evening's uh, debate, Mr Deputy Speaker, but uh, those are the broad reasons uh, uh, by which the, or for which the government uh, does not support the amendment moved by the member for O'Connor. Thank you, yeah. Minister. The question is that the amendments be agreed to. The member for Curtin. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Um, members of Parliament are um, often accused of not keeping their promises, and they are often accused of breaching faith with the public, and as a result, um, there's a level of cynicism within the Australian public about some parliamentarians. And in fact, there was a whole political movement that was based on keeping politicians to their promises. The Australian Democrats, you might recall, had a famous pledge to keep, and I quote, the bastards honest, end quote. Now we have a complete reversal of Don Chip's famous pledge. Um, the members of the government and the Greens and some of the independents have decided to keep the government dishonest, mm -hmm. complicit as they are in ensuring that the Prime Minister's clear breach of her commitment last election now becomes law. So instead of holding the Prime Minister to her promise that there will be no carbon tax under the government I lead, the members of the Labor Party and the Greens and some of the independents are holding the Prime Minister to a broken promise, to the breach of faith with the Australian people. And this was not some aside or some afterthought on the part of the Prime Minister. This wasn't just a throwaway line or an unscripted, unguarded moment. No, this was a carefully considered, deliberate statement made to mislead the Australian people into voting Labor. That's why the Prime Minister said in response to the Leader of the Opposition's constant refrain throughout the election campaign that, as night follows day, this government will introduce a carbon tax, the Prime Minister deliberately set about trying to convince the Australian people that she would not introduce a carbon tax. Now, rather than hold the Prime Minister to that promise, we've got members in this parliament who are trying to force through the parliament a policy unsupported by any electorate mandate at all. Now, major reforms are uh, challenging and they are difficult to implement. And it's vital to bring the Australian people into your confidence and to bring them with you as you seek to implement reforms that will transform the economy for good or for bad. Now, the Prime Minister did recognise this during the election campaign when she was talking about a price on carbon but promised that it would not be introduced until there had been consultation for a couple of years in order to build a lasting consensus. And yet when the Prime Minister realised that the government might well lose the election because of the threat of a carbon tax, she set about to deliberately mislead the Australian public into voting Labor on the basis they wouldn't introduce a carbon tax. Now, compare this, compare this with the history surrounding the introduction of the goods and services tax. During his first term as Prime Minister, John Howard became convinced of the need to replace the complex layers of wholesale sales tax with a flat rate GST. Now, Labor vowed to campaign against the GST, but their attack was blunted because Prime Minister Howard decided to take the proposed GST 
to an election and campaign on it and seek a mandate from the Australian people. Ask the Australian people whether they supported the introduction of this tax. He took a risk, but he had the courage and the respect of the Australian people. And he showed them respect in return and put that tax to the election. And I remember that 1998 election. <laughs> it was my first election. It was very hard fought. But we had the courage to take the Australian people into our confidence, tell them what we were proposing to do, and seek their support, and we got it. And that's why this legislation is being foisted upon the Australian people through this parliament without them having their say on this most fundamental transformation of our economy. I urge the members of the Labor Party to support this amendment. Show the Australian people some respect. Show them that you care about the promises you make at an election and that you are prepared to stick to your promises. And if you change your mind, then take it I to thank an election. The member for her contribution. The question is that the amendments be agreed to the member for Macon. Disappointing that what we all know to be such a serious issue, not just for Australia, but for the globe, is being used for political purposes by members opposite in the way it has been, not only for weeks now, but for months. And rather than come in here and debate the merits of the bills before the parliament, they continuously choose to play politics. And if I can just say something in response to the member for Curtin, I say this. I too recall the 1998 election, and if I'm correct, the outcome of that election was that the two-party preferred vote, that is, the majority of Australian people voted against the Howard government. Yet the Howard government still came into this chamber after knowing that a majority of Australians had voted against a proposition and still turned that proposition into law. The Howard government did that because at the time it believed it was doing the right thing. In the same way can I say that this government believes it is doing the right thing with respect to these bills. And I just want to quote something that was said in, on the 6th of November 1990. The threat to our world comes not only from tyrants and their tanks, it can be more insidious though less visible. The danger of global warming is as yet unseen but real enough for us to make changes and sacrifices so that we do not live at the expense of future generations. Mr Deputy Speaker, that was one of Margaret Thatcher's speeches in 1990. It was one of her speeches because Margaret Thatcher made a number of speeches in respect to this very issue 21 or 22 years ago. And 22 years later, we are still debating the merits of whether we should do anything or whether we should not. And it's interesting that 21 years ago, Margaret Thatcher touched on what I think are two of the critical issues here. Firstly, that global warming is hard to, to I guess, accept because you can't physically see much of the changes that are taking place. They occur relatively slowly, although quickly, in terms of the, to the total time that man has been on this planet. And secondly, she talks about making changes that cause sacrifices. The reality is that all people, if asked, would rather not have to make sacrifices. And it's clear that that is exactly what the opposition are playing to the mindset of the Australian people, pretending to them that you don't have to make a sacrifice, you don't have to do anything, because the issue will go away and it's not really there, because you can't really see it anyway. Nothing could be further from the truth, and that is what is so disappointing when it comes to this debate, because members opposite know that that is being dishonest with the Australian public, because I suspect that there are many members opposite who know that this situation, that is that global warming, is real, and that we, as a nation, have a responsibility not only to ourselves and to the globe, but we have a responsibility to future generations to act and to do so now because they also know that each year that we delay any action in respect to this issue means it becomes much more difficult and much more costly for those future generations 
if and when a decision is finally made. And can I say to those members opposite who constantly talk about the fact that this is not a good time for Australia to act, can you please tell us when you think it will be a good time? Because I think it would be fair to say that there will never be a good time to make tough decisions which in turn impact on the Australian people. But they are decisions that will have to be made because if we don't make them, the cost to the, the very same Australian people will continue to rise, as they are occurring right now. And in fact, if you look at what is happening because we failed to act 20 years ago and because we failed to act three or four years ago, we are already paying for those paying dearly because of that inaction. And can I say to those members opposite who also come into this place and keep criticising the fact that we are introducing legislation which puts a price on carbon after having gone into the last election. The fact of the matter is that the Australian Labor Party has supported a price on carbon for the last decade or so that I can recall. And I can recall this was an issue in 2004, it was an issue in 2007 and it was an issue in 2010. It's been debated and the Australian people supported a price of carbon in those elections, Mr Deputy Speaker. Order. The question is the amendment be agreed to. The honourable member for um, Isaac. Yep. Honourable member. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker. Mr Deputy Speaker, I'm certainly pleased to rise to put on the record um, my opposition to Labor's carbon tax that it's proposed in this House. Now, there can be no doubt, and considering my remarks ahead of this evening's debate, that the world does need to address the issue of climate change. There can be no doubt that globally mankind is having an impact. And as the father of a three-year-old son, as someone who looks at what is happening around the world, I cannot help but think to myself that not only is there a certain, and I don't want to overstate in any way, shape or form, but in no doubt is there a certain element of morality to this from one generation to the next. But there is also, I believe, something more fundamentally economically rational about tackling climate change, Mr Deputy Speaker. And that is the fact that for the last five, six, perhaps even ten decades, the world predominantly has relied on one source of fuel, on one source of driving electricity, of generating power to power industry. And this, at its core, Mr Deputy Speaker, has been crucial to the way in which, globally, we have helped to lift hundreds of millions of people out of poverty and into a better state of living. It has been at the core of the way in which societies have helped to raise standards of living, to lower infant mortality, to increase lifespans and to make a material difference into humanity's very survival on this planet. But I also think, though, now, Mr Deputy Speaker, we have reached a point where if we apply adequate resource, if we apply adequate ingenuity, we're able to develop and commercialise and harness other renewable forms of electricity in a way that is going to make a difference to our world, to our environment and to mankind going forward. And ultimately, it's in all of our collective interests globally to develop a a form of renewable energy that doesn't have a significant detrimental environmental impact. That is just plain good economics. That is just plain good common sense. And that is an approach to this issue, Mr Deputy Speaker, that I believe resonates with that element of well, as well of the moral obligation that we have as one generation to the next. Now, unfortunately, I would seek to make the bulk of my contribution to consideration and detail on the amendments Mr Deputy Speaker, because I was gagged from speaking in the main debate that Shine. took place earlier today by the government. But that notwithstanding, Shine. Mr Deputy Speaker, I feel very strongly about this issue. That's part of the reason why I said to the Leader of the Opposition that I was prepared to fly back from New York from my secondment to the United Nations, because I wanted to put on the record my opposition to Labor's approach. Now, there can be no doubt, Mr Deputy Speaker, as I said, that we as a nation do have an obligation to act on climate change. We do have an obligation to do that. But this is not the correct approach. Labor's approach to tackling climate change through the introduction of a carbon tax and in a more deceitful way, Mr Deputy Speaker, through the introduction of a carbon tax without a mandate, in fact quite the opposite, 
with a Prime Minister who vowed only days out from the last election that, if elected, they would not introduce a carbon tax, is not the approach. The key to ensuring a success in a reform like this is to ensure that the community has ownership of the reform. And Labor's approach provides no community ownership whatsoever. The fact is that this is a significant reform that absolutely must be done in lockstep with global action. Mm -hmm. To do so unilaterally, despite the pressing need for there to be action on climate change, Mr Deputy Speaker, despite the issues that I've raised about economic consequence and despite the fact that I do believe there is a moral obligation to deal with climate change, to do so effectively unilaterally to impose such a significant impost on the Australian economy when the rest of the world is not at that point is economic recklessness. And it's economic recklessness because it is blind ideology. Blind ideology that drives an agenda, Mr Deputy Speaker, that doesn't look to the stark reality that in order to perform meaningful change, in order to foster and to grow meaningful ownership throughout a community of a reform that takes place, you must ensure the community is going to be better off for it. And there are some elements of this debate, Mr Deputy Speaker, that can simply not be ignored. The principle among them, and I'm mindful of the time, Mr Deputy Speaker, so I'd seek the call again. Order. Um, I remember we'll resume his seat. Honourable Member for La Trobe. Thanks, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Uh, I'm very pleased uh, to participate again in this debate, uh, uh, and particularly following the member for Moncrief, who has so significantly acknowledged that action on climate change is such a moral imperative, and uh, and who has acknowledged that uh, that there is a need to take urgent action on climate change, because it's not often that you get those concessions consistently from members of the opposition, and certainly it's very unlikely that we are to get on any given day, and indeed consecutive days, those sorts of concessions from the Leader of the Opposition. This is certainly an historic occasion for those of us on this side of the House who have uh, assiduously uh, committed ourselves to uh, moving along a very significant policy uh, initiative for our environment, for business certainty, uh, to create the kind of long-term opportunity, long-term prosperity that we know is uh, nece necessary and we know is required uh, in relation to the development of clean energy industries in order to give Australians jobs into the future and in order to sustain the kind of uh, economic circumstances that we find ourselves in present presently. By contrast, we see those opposite, and certainly uh, in the most recent statements of the Leader of the Opposition in moving his amendment, uh, we see hysteria. We see continuing hysteria. We see a bid to delay significant action on climate change. We see a policy vacuum. We see a leadership vacuum. The Leader of the Opposition's amendments today seem to me to be more about distraction, and, uh, and you might ask distraction from what? And I think the most significant thing that the Leader of the Opposition wants to distract all of us from with his amendment is his uh, failure to support the steel industry in this country through the uh, steel transformation plan. And it's curious because not long ago the Leader of the Opposition visited uh, and spoke at the Australian Steel Convention and he said the steel industry is very important to Australia's economy. From smelting to fabricating, steel employs about 90,000 people, critical to so many other sections of our economy as well. He said, so steel is critical to our way of life. Steel is important in our economy. And I've been making the point uphill and down dale since the carbon tax was first announced. Well, he's been uphill, he's been down dale, and occasionally he's snuck off the edge of the dale and into the gutter. In fact, more often than not, he's found himself there. But unfortunately today, despite his several pages of oration to the Australian Steel Convention, he seems incapable of coming into this place and supporting and encouraging those who sit alongside him to practically give support to the steel industry. And instead, he comes up with another fig leaf, 
which is this uh, sad little amendment, which is a bid to delay one of the most significant reforms being made to our economy, one of the most significant environmental reforms being made in our country's history. And he will inevitably, and uh, his colleagues in the Senate most likely, will try to oppose significant um, endeavours to continue to support the steel industry. So despite all of the rhetoric, all of the visits to steel mills, all of the wearing of hard hats and uh, pretending to be out doing hard graft alongside Australian workers, once again, when it comes to actually making a decision and taking a vote, Mr Abbott is off having another siesta. This, uh, this uh, reform that we are pursuing today and have pursued long and hard for, for many months now, and indeed as one of the, the previous speakers uh, mentioned, our action on initiatives such as this and action on, on climate change has been uh, many years indeed in the making. Our efforts are about ensuring that uh, electorates such as mine benefit from the development of clean in energy industries, clean energy technologies. They are about ensuring that electorates such as mine, which have significant areas of environmental heritage, are duly protected and are not exposed to extreme weather events such as bushfire. Uh, my electorate covers an area including uh, much of the Dandenong Ranges, so I'm very familiar with the environmental impacts that are likely to flow from uh, inaction on climate change. So, contrary to the uh, reformist, uh, forward-thinking initiatives of this government, all that those opposite and the Leader of the Opposition can offer to the Australian people is delay, is a policy vacuum, is a leadership vacuum, and that's simply not good enough. Here, here. Order. The Honourable Member for Moncrief. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. As I was saying earlier, there are some facts about this debate that simply cannot be ignored. First among them, in my view, an order of significance, Mr Deputy Speaker, is the fact that at its core, Labor's policy, which would effectively penalise the Australian economy vis-a-vis -vis other industrialised economies, will see a 5 per cent reduction in emission levels when Australia currently contributes around 1.5 per cent of global emissions. So we are talking about imposing a multi-billion dollar tax on the Australian economy. We are talking about imposing a significant burden which must be shared by households, by small businesses, by large businesses across the Australian economy to make a 5 per cent reduction to global emissions of 1.5 per cent. And the lunacy of Labor's approach in this, Mr Deputy Speaker, and I heard it from the Speaker immediately prior to me, is that Labor makes out, and this is the great con job, this is the great con job that lies at the core of this debate. Labor makes out that it's a choice between positives under their approach or nothing. That it's in some way an approach that forces Australians to choose between policy benefits that might flow, I should say economic benefits that might flow from this policy or nothing. Now, can I put unequivocally on the record that I believe that there are benefits that flow from a shift to renewables? I've already indicated as such. But the key difference from my perspective and from Labor's approach, Mr Deputy Speaker, is that it must be done, you know, uh, it must be done in, in lockstep with other developed economies, because there are costs associated with this reform, costs which cannot be ignored. And whilst it might suit the arguments of Labor members to claim that it is only ever filled with positives, there are significant and real economic disadvantages that will directly flow from Labor's um, imposition of this tax. Now, I'm very willing to concede that there are benefits that will flow in time as well. And I say let's embrace these benefits. And we embrace these benefits, Mr Deputy Speaker, by doing so in lockstep with other developed economies because by doing that, Mr Deputy Speaker, we ensure that the disadvantages that are felt immediately, as opposed to the longer term benefits which will flow in due course, are not done in a unilateral way. And I must say, Mr Deputy Speaker, that if I talk about my own constituency of Moncrief on the Gold Coast, there can be perhaps no clearer example of the difference between long-term benefits and short-term costs than the tourism industry. Under Labor's proposal that we have before the House that's now been passed in terms of the second reading speech, Mr Deputy Speaker, we have a situation where international tourists coming to Australia will pay more 
because of the result of Labor's carbon tax with no compensation. There is no international compensation for tourists travelling to Australia. So for 70 or 80 per cent of the Australian economy, the services side of the economy, who will be facing increased costs, there will be no global compensation for them. They will pay more. And they will have to pay more to visit Australia vis-a-vis -vis other countries that aren't doing this. And what will their choice be, Mr Deputy Speaker? If you believe in the basic laws of supply and demand, when the price goes up, fewer people will demand the product. Point number one. Point number one. The second point, I hear the minister at the table asking, should we compensate them for the Australian dollar too? So the minister at the table concedes that the tourism industry is already being battered by an Australian dollar that is so sky high and says, oh, well, they've already got that problem, so why would we worry about this other problem? This is the lunacy of this government. This is the lunacy of an approach that says, well, you're already doing it tough because of this factor, so what's one more nail in the coffin as far as the government's concerned? So there's no compensation for international tourists. In addition to that, under Labor's policy, there'll be no carbon tax payable on a flight overseas for an Australian, but there will be a price payable in the carbon tax to holiday domestically. So in addition to there being a disadvantage of Australia vis-a-vis -vis other countries around the world, under Labor's policy, to holiday domestically will cost you more, but to holiday internationally won't cost you more. And that in some way makes sense to the Labor Party as well. So right there, just using that one industry as an example, Mr Deputy Speaker, we can already see the immediate upfront economic disadvantage that flows to the Australian economy versus long-term, perhaps even unquantifiable, largely qualitative benefits that will flow to the Australian economy as a result of, these, as a result of uh, Labor's changes. The simple issue is, Mr Deputy Speaker, these reforms must be done in lockstep with the rest of the economy. No, with the rest of the world. For Frosby. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. In this chamber today, we saw one of the greatest acts of political hypocrisy and um, political doublespeak uh, that we have witnessed in this country in a very long time. And we saw it from those opposite, and particularly the member for Indi and uh, the leader of the opposition, who has spent the last nine months travelling the length and breadth of this country, knocking people out of the way to get into workshops and don silly hard hats and fluoro vests so they could pose for cameras in front of real workers and try and send the message around the country that they cared for workers. And they had an opportunity. They had an opportunity in this place today to put those slogans, that cheap rhetoric, into practice, into action, and put their, their votes where their mouth was, and they squibbed it. They had an opportunity to stand up for Australian workers. They had an opportunity to stand up for the sort of people who live in my electorate of Throsby and do something valuable for them, but they went missing. They had the opportunity, Mr Deputy Speaker, to vote for the steel industry transformation plan. This is the transformation plan that is providing $300 million worth of much needed assistance to a vital industry, to my region and to the national economy, the steel industry which, as the member for La Trobe has uh, previously identified, uh, provides jobs to thousands of Australians, provides an incredibly important product to Australian and international markets, and is finding it very difficult to trade in an international environment with very high input costs, the flip side of the high value that we are getting for our commodities like iron ore and coal, and the very high uh, Australian dollar. So they had the opportunity today to say, we are going to do something. Uh, to assist the workers in, those, in the steel industry and those companies, and they went missing. And I know that many of those opposite might say, well, the reason that we voted against this is because we're opposed to what the government is doing to put a price on carbon and put real action in place to deal with climate change. Well, the simple fact of the matter, Mr Deputy Speaker, is that they could have held that objection, they could have maintained that objection and still voted in favour of steel industry workers and the steel industry and manufacturing workers, because not one cent, not one cent uh, of the revenue that is raised from the carbon price is going into the steel industry transformation plan. They are seat completely separate revenue streams. It would have been possible for the member for Indi to try and convince all of those economic rationalists on her front bench and uh, those on her back bench to do something in support of manufacturing workers, but they went missing. They went missing because what they have been engaged in over the last nine months is nothing more than a sideshow 
designed for the media crew, but it has absolutely no substance. Absolutely no substance. Mr Deputy Speaker, we have a plan and we have a bundle of legislation which will enable us to deal with, uh, putting up, to deal with the, uh, the generational challenge of climate change and do it in the cheapest and most efficient and most effective way possible. It's a way that will enable business to transform at the lowest cost by putting a price on carbon, uh, providing incentives to invest in energy efficiency. It acknowledges that there are some industries which need additional assistance and shielding from the carbon price because of the nature of their business, because of the nature of their, uh, their manufacturing process or their production process. And we have put in place a well calibrated package which deals with the economic circumstances of these businesses. We are met today by a proposition that we should uh, delay the introduction of this legislation and the carbon price. And this comes over th after 35 parliamentary inquiries into climate change since 1994. There have been about 250 questions asked in this place on carbon pricing and over 15 separate MPI debates. Uh, we've had around 35, 33 hours of speaking on this uh, legislation alone, featuring around or in addition to uh, 120 speakers on this. And, uh, I don't think anybody who has been witnessing this debate for over 10 years can say that we haven't had a full and proper debate, that the science isn't known and everything isn't clear. So when you analyse what the real reason is, what the real reason behind this uh, motion to uh, delay the introduction of this legislation, there's one thing and one thing alone. Because we know, Mr Deputy Speaker, that delay will prevent the thing that they fear the most. And the thing that those opposite fear the most is the lived experience of this legislation. Because they know from 1 July next year, the sky isn't going to fall in. The sky isn't going to fall in. And all of those consumers around the country will be measuring the increase in their cost in brown copper coins and not the orange and yellow notes that they've been uh, led by those opposite to believe is going to be the consequence. So that's what the real reason that lies behind their motion to delay. Order. And we've had enough delay already. Order. The Honourable Member for Moncrief. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Mr Deputy Speaker, the point I go on about with respect to Labor's uh, approach in this particular debate and the reason why this is not the correct approach and why the Coalition's way is a better way is perhaps best summed up by some of the media commentary. Because Labor's approach to this is to, one, not tell the truth prior to the last federal election about their intentions, to then introduce something that they said, in fact the Prime Minister said, she would not introduce. It's also to only speak about the positives and to completely ignore the negatives that flow from their policy. But the fact is, Mr Deputy Speaker, that the old adage is you can only fool some of the people some of the time and you can't fool all of the people all of the time. And it's best perhaps summed up by a variety of front pages from the Gold Coast Bulletin, which summarise the impact of Labor's approach. This one, Julia's fun tax. Carbon scheme to bring more pain to the coast. And I'll read very briefly the first couple of paragraphs from this story. Take a good look at this scene. You might not see it so often once the fun police in Canberra hit us between the eyes with a carbon tax. <laughs> Tourists like Perth couple Stuart Jarvis and Kate Walker won't be able to afford the inflated airfares, the hiked up hotel rates, or the markup in our theme parks as companies scramble to pass on the additional costs. Chief Killjoy Julia Gillard's attempt to sell the tax to the nation yesterday only reaffirmed fears here on the coast that our number one industry, tourism, will be hit and hit hard. Plus, Mr Deputy Speaker, this page, Rescue Me, Carbon Tax Punishes Helicopter Heroes. This story about how charitable operations like RACQ Care Flight will have to pay more under Labor's carbon tax without any offsetting compensation. The fact that there's this front page, a mission impossible. Carbon tax could bring battling city to its knees. Flights and accommodation up. Rates up, theme park tickets up, hospital fees up, construction costs up. Or this one, Mr Deputy Speaker, about Bond University on the Gold Coast. Bond University, perhaps mistakenly by most, including myself, Mr Deputy Speaker, would have thought that an educational institution would not be liable for Labor's carbon tax. The reality is quite different, though. Bond University, and I quote from the paper, Bond University expects to pay an additional $2 million a year under the federal government's carbon tax and says it will have to cut more than 100 jobs or raise tuition fees to compensate. Mr Deputy Speaker, these are facts about what is going to happen under Labor's carbon tax in a unilateral sense. 
This front page of the Gold Coast Bulletin. Power cost surge to hurt ratepayers, warns Mayor. City's $112 million carbon bill. These are the things that are the negatives from Labor's carbon tax, which members opposite don't ever want to talk about. Now, Mr Deputy Speaker, you could understand logically, you could understand logically if these negative consequences were occurring in our economy at the same time as they were occurring in other economies. But for the Labor Party to pretend that the negative consequences simply don't exist, well, I guess the next election will probably sort out what the Australian people think about that. Because the Australian people know there are very real and significant negative consequences from Labor's carbon tax. Job losses, increased rates, increased power bills, more expensive aircraft flights, more expensive fuel, household costs to go up. You name it, Mr Deputy Speaker, there will be a massive price impact, but it won't be happening around the rest of the world. It will only be happening in this country. Because it's not a choice between a carbon tax or nothing. The reality is that countries can still invest in renewables, countries can still commercialise new R&D, countries can still explore new alternatives without, an Im without the impost of a carbon tax. And perhaps a good example, Mr Deputy Speaker, is what the UAE is doing with their Mazda project. The Crown Prince's approach there is to say they are one of the ruling, they are one of the leaders of energy needs currently, and he wants to ensure that the UAE is one of the leaders in the world of renewable energy in the future. And guess what, Mr Deputy Speaker? They're doing it without a carbon tax. The reality is, Mr Deputy Speaker, that Labor's plan is not the correct approach. But most fundamentally, it is not the correct approach because it is an approach that is based on deceit. It's an approach without a mandate. It's an approach without any bona fide support of the Australian people and Labor simply burying their head in the sand and shrieking that there are only benefits and no negatives when the evidence is crystal clear that the costs are significant only reinforces how out of touch this government has become. Okay. The question is that the amendments be agreed to. The Honourable Member for Parramatta.